Hey everyone. Welcome back for the third part of What If Naruto Was Raised by Kakuzu. As always, huge thanks to all of my Patreons, making these videos would be impossible without you guys' support, especially with all the restrictions YouTube places on my type of content. As always, the full story is already out over there for you guys along with about 30 other different stories you can enjoy. Also feel free to send me any messages over there if you have any questions or even if you just want to chat. Link to all of that will be in the description. Anyways, everyone, enjoy the video. Chapter 13, Initiation Kakuzu couldn't say for sure where the motley crew of Nuknin was heading. The land of fire, for all intents and purposes, was an endless barrage of greenery. His sense of direction told him they were heading north-northeast, back towards the valley of the end, but there was no telling what the group's purpose in venturing that way was. Not for the first time, the mercenary dug into the inside of the Akatsuki cloak he now wore and pulled out the ring pain had given him. He had thus far neglected to put it on, unsure of any ceremony involved or what purpose the item even served, barring the fact that it allowed for acceptance into Akatsuki. Still, there had to be something more, why else would each ring have different colors and symbols? You should put that on. Kakuzu's attention was drawn to the masked figure of Tobi, bounding alongside him. Across the other male's back was the unconscious form of Haro, which Tobi had, rather cheerfully, offered to carry. The other Akatsuki nin had thus far proven to be obnoxiously happy, and with pain leading the procession, Daedara and his slouched companion flying above the treetops, Zetsu already gone, and Naruto lagging behind with Fu, Kakuzu seemed to be his default conversation partner. It was not a role the former Taki nin enjoyed being cast in. I am well aware of the general procedure regarding materialistic possessions, he ground out. Ah ha ha, Kakuzu-san, you talk funny. From ahead of them, pain intoned warningly, Toby. Ah ah, sorry, leader-sama, Kakuzu-san. The masked shinobi fell silent for a moment, as if repenting for his actions, before stage whispering to Kakuzu, Zetsu-san told me that anyone who wears a ring is an official member. Each of the rings goes on a different finger, to show that only ten people can be part of Akatsuki at one time. He brought up his left hand to admire the slate blue ring with the character Ku placed on his pinky. Um, if I remember what Zetsu-san told me, your ring is supposed to go on your left middle finger. Give it a try, Kakuzu-san. Kakuzu ignored the peppiness of the other shinobi, choosing instead to look back at his protege. Naruto was struggling under the burden of carrying Fu's body while moving through the land of fire. Still, the blonde was bearing his load in silence, his face a stony mask of seriousness. He must have learned something from his experiences fighting in Kanahagakur. Green eyes shifted to stare at the new suture that decorated the blonde's chest. The price for power. Kakuzu was almost, proud, of Naruto's achievements and growth, not that he would tell his student that. Truly the boy was growing up for Kakuzu's intentions. The mercenary returned his gaze to the ring in his hand. If he wanted to stand a chance at postponing and or preventing Naruto's, and Fu's, deaths, he would need to do so from within the organization. Without a second thought, he slipped the band on his third finger. The dark green gem that composed the core of the ring emitted a similarly colored light, making the word Hoku stand out starkly in comparison. Ahead of him, Pain seemed to tilt his head in acknowledgement of the act. Apparently, Kakuzu had successfully passed some sort of test. It took another couple hours for the group to reach its destination, a small grove of trees at the delta of a river. A tag marked with the character for Forbidden was stuck on one of the trunks, but Payne merely lifted up his right thumb, where his ring was placed, and the ground began to rumble. In short order, a staircase that wound out of sight appeared. Toby set Harrow against a nearby tree and practically skipped into the tunnel, followed by Dater a slouched partner, Zetsu had mentioned Sasori when giving a rundown of Orochimaru's abilities, perhaps this was the Hidden Sands legendary Akasuna no Sasori? And then the former Iwa Nin himself. Payne turned his full attention to Kakuzu before the taller shinobi could move towards the opening. This is for members only. The children stay here. For what duration? It will take three days to seal the Aichibi. Kakuzu nodded in understanding. You heard the man, brat. Naruto opened his mouth as if to protest, but then closed it. Kakuzu was not a man to be trifled with, and it seemed as if Payne was even less of one. The blonde nodded reluctantly figuring he could take the time to rest and wait for Fu and Haro to awaken. His teacher gave him a curt head bob before disappearing into the darkness. Payne fixed the Jinchuriki with an intent stare before following behind, the second the orange-haired man was out of sight, the ground shifted back to cover up the hole. There was barely enough light to see by when the stairs opened into an expansive, but surprisingly empty, cavern. Comparatively, 
The base Zetsu had led him to before the Chunin exams to cement his team's cover was tiny. In the middle of the cavern stood Datara, his partner, and Toby in a loose circle around the prone form of the Aichibi Jinchuriki, Datara Clay Owl was nowhere to be seen. Payne moved past him and performed a sequence of familiar seals. Kushios no Jutsu, he intoned. A massive rumbling shook the cavern as a gigantic statue rose from the ground. Judging by appearances, it was probably demonic in origin, with shackles cuffing its wrists and a scroll clenched between its teeth. That would explain the enormity of this hideout, Kakuzu observed silently. Assemble, Payne ordered. Immediately, multicolored holographic images of four figures, one the telltale appearance of Zetsu, the others Konan, Itachi, and Kisame by process of elimination, phased into existence upon the outstretched, cuffed hands of the statue, taking up the spaces on the left ring and right pinky, middle, and ring fingers. The people physically present leapt to their own digits, leaving only the left middle and pointer fingers empty. Kakuzu was a second behind in taking his place upon the middle one, based simply on the position of his ring. He watched as Payne continued to form seals, the scroll falling from the statue's mouth as green lights appeared on the statue's fingers, illuminated with the symbols upon Akatsuki's rings. A giant ball of blue chakra gathered in the statue's mouth, and Kakuzu began to concentrate his own chakra in mimicry of the other members. Fuinjutsu, Janryu Kyufujin. Nine blue dragons, composed, Kakuzu assumed, of the chakra of all the S-class missing nin, roared from the statue's mouth, descending upon the unconscious vessel of the Aichibi Jinchuriki. Red matter, demonic chakra, perhaps, began to leak from the San Janan's mouth and eyes. A sealing technique which seems to separate the mixed chakra of a bijou from its container, most impressive. Highly complex. Three days here. Green eyes focused intently on the spiky-haired form of Akatsuki's leader. And then what, I wonder? LLL. Naruto sat against one of the trees which hid the secret entrance to one of Akatsuki's lairs, expression pensive. Fu's and Haro's prone forms lay against separate trunks, cuts and bruises scattered liberally across their bodies. They could probably use a med nin. He stared at his own hands. Pity I know nothing about the medical arts. The blonde wondered idly if Kakuzu knew any, but quickly dismissed the thought. Surely Jung could take care of any injuries the older male suffered, limited though they were sure to be. I wonder. He brought his arm up perpendicular to his body, examining the black tattoo and sutures of Jung scattered along the limb. Can you heal? He asked aloud. There was a collection of images and thoughts that passed through his mind, the Kinjutsu's strange method of communication giving him pause. No, the threads could really only heal their host's body, but if manipulated properly they could be used for certain other applications. All right, he said, let's experiment. With that, he got to his feet and walked over to Haro. The cobalt-haired boy had definitely seen better days. Naruto divested the Ame Nin of his shirt, which was smeared with dirt and blood, to better access and assess the boy's wounds. Large bruises decorated Haro's torso, blotching the pale skin with bluish-purple splotches. The blonde placed one hand upon his teammate's torso and pressed gently. There was a somewhat crunchy feeling at the spot, and Naruto barely withheld a wince that contained a glimmer of his teacher's sadistic grin. Ooh, that sounds nasty. Probably a couple of broken ribs, maybe some fractures, handful of punctured organs? Not that I have any idea what I'm talking about, he admitted aloud. Well, let's see what you can do. A handful of thread slithered forth from his tattoo and wormed their way into Haro's body. Naruto observed the proceedings with mild curiosity, noting how the Kinjutsu was merging with the Ame Nin's body in a more cautious manner than he'd seen it do with others in the past. Through his connection with the tendrils, the blonde could somewhat sense the layout of Haro's body, as well as achieve a better understanding of the boy's injuries. Black threads wrapped tightly around a number of Harrow's broken ribs, detaching from the main mass to bind and set the fragmented pieces to ensure a proper and quicker healing. They wormed their way throughout the Ame Nin's body, stitching a small puncture in one lung and a number of perforations in the kidneys. Man, Naruto observed, trying to take note of what the threads were doing and only half understanding the images he was seeing, did you get a number done on you? Must have pissed off that fat guy something fierce. The tendrils withdrew from Harrow's skin, leaving no trace of their entry. Naruto moved over to Fu, intent on giving her the same treatment, but paused. Somewhere in the back of his mind, the blonde recognized that what he was about to do was wrong. Not in the sense of being bad, he was trying to help a friend, after all, but that the situation he was about to enter was, inappropriate. Fu was not Haro, the idea of removing her clothing invoked a strange feeling of impropriety. Of course, the difference was obvious, Fu was a girl. Females, he knew from lessons and lectures with both Ryo and Kakuzu, did
didn't possess the same physiology as males. Naruto's hesitance in his present situation was understandable given that, barring the limited time he had spent with his fellow Jinchuriki, his experience with women was non-existent. Kakuzu made a point to avoid interacting with people as much as possible, and aside from the basic biological differences taught to him for the simple sake of being educated, elaboration upon the topic of the opposite sex had been and still was completely unnecessary. After all, he was still only 12, though close to his 13th birthday. Dash and thus not driven by hormones. That wasn't even considering that Kakuzu absolutely seemed like the type to advocate his pupil's disinterest in engaging in relationships with the opposite sex. None of those thoughts really registered in the QB Jinchuriki's brain. All he could say for sure was that some deeper instinct felt that there was some line he was about to cross that he should know about, and yet didn't. Social protocols hardly existed in the world of a rogue shinobi. Carefully, Naruto removed the girl's top layers of clothing and placed them upon the strange red cylinder she always carried around with her. The tan smoothness of Fu's flat abdomen greeted his vision, a sight he remembered from her usual attire. Thankfully, a series of bandages was wrapped around her chest in a display of modesty he was intuitively grateful for. He released a sigh of relief he didn't know he'd been holding, the niggling feeling of awkwardness dispersed from his system. The facts that Fu was only 13, owed Naruto her life, and was as flat as a board never even crossed the blonde's mind. He went through the same process he had with Haro, allowing Jiang to burrow into her system and fix any irregularities it could. The threads bound a couple of ribs and repaired a small problem with the liver before leaving her body. Apparently Fu had suffered similar injuries to Haro, though with a smaller degree of damage. Her shoulder looked offset, but with no real medical knowledge, Naruto wasn't about to try to correct the injury. He reclothed his companion and then settled back into his original spot against the tree, pensive again. The question of where to go from here burned in his mind. Kakuzu, his mentor, was now a member of an elite organization focused on capturing the bijou, which he and Fu, his only real friend, contained. Even assuming that Kakuzu didn't actively pursue and or betray them, Akatsuki still had plenty of other members who could easily find and restrain the two Jinchuriki. They could possibly escape for a little bit, maybe build up their strength and hope to take on Akatsuki, but every road he could imagine eventually ended in them getting caught. So where did that leave them? Their other option, Naruto supposed, was one of those insane, albeit crazy enough to work ideas. Basically, he and Fu could work alongside Akatsuki, potentially even aiding the syndicate in achieving its goal, and simultaneously use the closeness to exploit any weaknesses within the organization. By gathering information on what each of the members could do in terms of skill, as well as their personalities, idiosyncrasies, and other details, evading them and prolonging his and Fu's capture became easier. Naturally, all that was theoretical, but it wasn't like he had much in the way of options. Stay, and either buy time and gain valuable intelligence and resources, or get captured, and most likely killed, immediately, leave, get no resources, and be captured at some indeterminable future point in time. The decision seemed relatively simple, even considering the risk. Naruto maneuvered his body to better watch Fu, studying the rise and fall of her chest with strange intensity. For some reason, the idea that some random ninja had been able to do so much damage to her didn't sit well with him. Fu was strong and capable, and beyond that, someone who knew what it was like to walk in every aspect of Naruto's shoes. To lose her was unacceptable. With that, the blonde's decision was made for him. He would have to play his cards right, hope that Kakuzu, in his strange helping and roundabout manners methodology, would stick by his pupils, and pray that he was lucky enough that Akatsuki would rather make use of two wayward Jinchuriki who could do them a fair amount of good in the short term rather than kill them, but he would do everything in his power to protect Fu and simply survive. In the meantime, he still had the better part of three days before he could even put his plan into action, so he settled back and allowed his eyes to close as a wave of tiredness washed over him. LLL. The prone form of the red-headed Aichibi Jinchuriki fell to the cavern floor, breaking the silence of the ritual. A pupil appeared in one of the statue's eyes, and the mercenary could only extrapolate that the bijou had been extracted to the statue, leaving its host dead. The other members released their seals, prompting Kakuzu to do the same, and he resisted the urge to stretch his stiff muscles after three days of non-movement. That was when Pain began speaking. We have annexed the land of sound from Orochimaru, and the treacherous snake has been disposed of, he announced in a grand monotone. As such, our base of operations will be moved to Odogakur, and all our future movements shall be coordinated from there. I will be there shortly to oversee the transition, he directed to Conan. He looked around at the rest of the organization. In the meantime, the rest of you will continue with your assignments. 
there is still much to be done before our ultimate goal is achieved. Ring gray eyes turn to focus on the tall Nuknan. Kakuzu, stay. The four holographic projections fizzled and disappeared. Datara leapt from his perch and threw out his miniaturized clay owl, which promptly multiplied in size. Better get a move on, Sasori no Dana. He crowed. You haven't fulfilled your quota yet, hmm. Impudent brat, intoned Sasori, jumping to the floor and landing with a heavy clunk. The best masterpieces take time, he stated warningly, shuffling towards the exit. The pair's bickering voices could be heard echoing around the space as they departed. Kakuzu's green eyes watched them go, flickering briefly over to catch Toby wave a farewell and disappear as silence engulfed the remaining two. He descended to the level of the orange-haired man. You wish to speak with me? He prompted. The shorter man studied him carefully while Kakuzu did the same. For both, it was a measure of the other's character, a test of their mettle in the face of another powerful presence. Kakuzu was sure that the younger male had some knowledge of what he could do, and while Payne's abilities were still an unknown, the fact that he led an organization composed of other S-class criminals spoke highly of the strength and respect he commanded. Still, Kakuzu was not one to be subordinated so easily, and he refused to succumb to Payne's scrutinizing gaze. After a long moment, Payne blinked, breaking the spell cast between the two. You know of Akatsuki's goals? I know enough, Kakuzu replied easily. He couldn't say with certainty that he knew every aspect of the organization's plans, but he could piece together what he did know and draw conclusions from there. The mercenary would not seat any weakness, whether physical or mental, in front of this man, the more it appeared he knew without being told, the more respect he could garner from pain because of his knowledge. Even if some of said knowledge was a bluff. The orange-haired man nodded. Your assignment is the Rakubi no name Kuji. Last we heard, it was within the possession of Kirigakur, but that was years ago and the bloodline purges may have resulted in the Jinchuriki's demise. According to what limited records we have found, the Rakubi is rather intelligent and reclusive. This is why I have assigned it to you. That made sense to Kakuzu, send a bounty hunter to find someone who was good at hiding. He inclined his head and turned to leave, but Payne's voice cut him off. Akatsuki members work in pairs. I work alone. You have been in the company of another for many years now. Extenuating circumstances. He is, valuable. I am well aware of the Kyubi Jinchuriki's value, as you put it. Kakuzu turned around slowly to face pain, face betraying nothing. Uzumaki Naruto, container of the Kyubi no Yoko, sealed within him by his own father, the Yondaime Hokage, Namikaze Minato. I also know that you have more recently taken the Jinchuriki of the Nanabi under your wing. He is well informed. Of course, Kakuzu had already been threatened with the loss of Fu before by Konan, but the fact that Pain knew of Naruto, while not completely surprising, was still bad. It was like an intricate dance where both people were trying to lead, and Kakuzu was quickly losing ground. If you know so much, then you must know of my, tendencies. If you're referring to your sadism and temper, then yes, Zetsu has informed me of such. I have found you the ideal partner, though attempts to recruit him have been unsuccessful thus far. Kakuzu arched an eyebrow skeptically. To have planned so far ahead as to find me a partner before I even joined, he has impressive foresight. Then how exactly is this person going to become my partner? You have a quality I believe he will find, tempting. Here, he stated, throwing a slim folder at the newest member, information for you. Finding this man is your first priority. I will contact you when he has joined our ranks. And you will know of this how? Payne tossed a small object at him, which Kakuzu caught easily. He turned it over in his hand, studying the ring with the character San inscribed on an orange gemstone. That will be enough, Payne said. Kakuzu nodded and turned to leave, but apparently the orange-haired man wasn't done. The Jinchuriki, what are your feelings towards them? When the mercenary didn't immediately respond, Payne continued, you know that this process kills the Jinchuriki. Kakuzu's green eyes flickered over to Gara's corpse. They will eventually be sacrificed for Akatsuki's goals. They are outside, weakened and outnumbered. Why not just capture them now? The time is not right. Hmm. Perhaps there is an order to the ceiling that prevents the higher bijou from being extracted too early. The children are of little consequence to me, he responded flippantly. However, I believe it would be prudent to speak to them before committing to any decisions. They have a propensity for being, profitable. Kakuzu took Payne's lack of response as his cue to leave, headed for the stairs. Before he moved completely out of earshot, Kakuzu stated smoothly, I will be taking the children with me on this mission. The experience will be useful, should you decide to implement their talents into your plans. 
Kakuzu's footsteps seemed unnaturally loud in the quiet of the stairwell as he ascended. The monotonic sound offered him little reprieve from the many thoughts bouncing around his mind. There was little doubt that he was walking a thin line between trying to keep the Jinchuriki alive and abiding by Akatsuki's wishes. At some point in the future, Naruto and Fu would have had to survive on their own merit anyway, but Kakuzu had hoped to ingrain more survival instincts in them before that day came. Now, his time to do so seemed to be severely constricted. Even more frustrating was the lack of an exact time frame he had to impart such wisdom to them. Kakuzu's process was slow and methodical, training while seeming to not really train at all. Time constraints hindered that process. While he could stall on the capture of his bijou, that would draw suspicion towards him, and as the newest member and the one most connected to Naruto and Fu, he was probably already under scrutiny. He would have to make his moves carefully. The bounty hunter emerged into muted sunlight, the canopy providing a shield to the harsh mid-afternoon sun. Green eyes blinked slowly in the limited light before Kakuzu turned to look for his pupils. Naruto was standing next to and slightly in front of a sitting Fu, whose back was against a tree, bandages wrapped around her torso. Opposite them was Zetsu, in the process of melding out of a tree. Both Tobi and Haro stood between the two parties, an innocently curious tilt to the former's head. The former Taki Nin cleared his throat. Naruto's head swiveled towards the noise, his expression lighting up as he exclaimed, Kakuzu. Said mercenary ignored the rather exuberant greeting and turned to face Zetsu. Zetsu, he greeted in a monotone, to what do we owe this, pleasure? Ah, Kakuzu-san, don't be like that. White Zetsu offered cheerfully. We have only come to return your belongings from the other base. The plant man held out a bundle of clothes, and Kakuzu took the proffered head and mouth covering and slashed through hideate. He put them on with disguised haste, more comfortable in his usual garb with the facial stitches and hair hidden beneath cloth. Fully garbed, he watched as Naruto hesitantly grabbed his and Fu's clothing, the blonde's blue eyes never losing their cautious skepticism. Zetsu stared back unblinkingly. Kakuzu cleared his throat again. Anything else? No, Zetsu replied, shifting his normal eye to look at Kakuzu. We're going to take Hero with us. Good luck with your mission. Come, Toby. The plant man remerged with the tree as Toby grabbed Hero and waved a cheery farewell before disappearing into a vortex of swirling energy not even giving the cobalt-haired boy a chance to say goodbye. Naruto and Fu watched in mute shock. They're fucking weird, commented the blonde at length. I might miss Hero, though. Kakuzu mentally agreed that the blonde's first statement was accurate. Come, he motioned, moving north, we have work to do. The QB Jinchuriki helped Fu to her feet. He slid on the shirt and vest Kakuzu had given him long ago, relaxing into the fit of familiar clothes. We? He asked, curiosity peaked. Yes. When the mercenary didn't elaborate, Fu piped up. What are we doing? Searching for someone. Naruto scowled in frustration. Could you possibly be any more vague? Kakuzu lowered his voice, though it retained his gruff register. Here is not the proper setting with which to discuss such information. Naruto glanced behind him, spying Payne standing at the entrance to the hideout, watching them depart. He opted to stay quiet after that, Fu walking beside him as they followed their teacher. They plodded along at a rather sedate pace for a number of hours, despite the urgency Naruto felt Kakuzu should have had to get away from pain. As evening fell, the ex-waterfall shinobi had them stop to set up a small camp in the middle of the forest. When dawn broke the next day, Kakuzu kicked them awake and set off without another word, forcing his students to follow behind. The blonde remained in a dour mood the whole trip, irked at Kakuzu's easy dismissal of his previous questions and refusal to elaborate. The fact that the older ninja would merely get some sort of sick satisfaction from denying him access to information he wanted, their destination and goal, helped prevent him from asking again. Only Fu's warm hand in his own kept him from actually lashing out at his teacher. Again, he was struck with a strange sense of awkward foreboding at the gesture. It was nice to have someone around who could placate his temper, especially since getting into anything with Kakuzu was bound to have disastrous, and painful, results for him but he felt that there was some significance to the hand-holding that he was missing. What did it mean, the simple clasping of hands? Was he really okay with Fu being able to read him so easily? Yes, he allowed after a moment of thought, perhaps having his fellow Jinchuriki know him so well was a good thing. It certainly prevented him from raising Kakuzu's ire unnecessarily and taking a beating. Still, was there something more he wasn't able to read into? Over the past three days, he had noticed a trend in his pattern of thinking related to the green-haired girl. When Haro had, surprisingly, regained consciousness first, Naruto had immediately pressured the boy into assessing Fu's condition. 
The grey-eyed male had done so with tired reluctance, only Naruto's wordless guarantee of pain if he refused rousing Haro to action. After wrapping her torso in bandages to set her ribs, a precaution, Haro had stated after Naruto had explained what he had done with the threads, he had reset her shoulder, forcing Fu to emit a low moan of pain. Naruto had tensed at the sound, but then relaxed when the other boy had turned back to him with a weak grin. The blonde had offered his temporary teammate a brief word of gratitude before letting the Ame Nin settle into a peaceful slumber. Somehow, even knowing that Haro wouldn't hurt Fu intentionally, the idea that he could have didn't sit well with the blonde. When the Nanabi Jinchuriki had awoken some hours later, she had graced Naruto with a tentative smile that had both soothed his mind and sent him off in search of something for all of them to eat. The fact that he was worried about such trivialities related to Fu, especially when he knew that she could take of herself, made this vein of thinking even more frustrating to consider and not fully comprehend. His roundabout musings were cut short when Kakuzu stopped abruptly and turned to face his two disciples. They were standing on the edge of the forest, a landscape of steep mesas and sparsely foliaged flatland paving the way ahead. Naruto quickly disentangled his hand from Fu's, settling his face into a picture of annoyance. Now what? If Kakuzu had noticed the physical contact between the two Jinchuriki, he said nothing of it. Here is where you will begin to lead. Eh? Lead where? Fu asked. Kakuzu threw the folder Payne had given him at the green-haired girl, who snatched it out of the air. Orange eyes skimmed the contents before she passed the file to Naruto. He flipped through the first couple of pages, analyzing all the details he could from the photos within. The man depicted looked short for an adult, with slicked back silver hair and an ungainly large, triple-bladed scythe slung across his back. Naruto briefly wondered why someone would use such a ridiculous weapon, let alone how he carried it around while shirtless with no harness, but decided not to ask. There were several large coils of thick cable wrapped around spools attached to the man's pants, which perhaps explained how he lugged the scythe around, and what looked to be some sort of necklace hung low on his chest, dangling below his hideate. Lead to whom, Kakuzu corrected smoothly, jarring the blonde from his scrutiny. His name's Hidan, Naruto noted, perusing through some of the handwritten notes. Kakuzu nodded. Yes. It is our goal to find him. He is to become. Here, Kakuzu scowled in distaste, as if he had smelled something particularly malodorous, my partner. Naruto hit a snort of amusement with a choked cough, exchanging wry glances with Fu. They'd been partners with Kakuzu for years, and the mercenary barely seemed to be able to tolerate them. How was this man supposed to manage, even if he was an S-class Nukunin? So why are we looking for him? Seems like something you should be doing, observed the blonde. Fu slipped the folder from his grasp, scanning the information with renewed curiosity. The tall shinobi shot Naruto an irritated look. You are doing this to gain experience in tracking, a skill highly important to a bounty hunter. One which you are lacking in, he threw in snidely. And who's to blame for that, I wonder, Naruto remarked quietly to Fu. A moment later, his head was against the ground in a mock bow of deference, Kakuzu's hand gripping his shirt collar. I am old, not deaf, brat, growled the former Takinin. He released his pupil, allowing the boy to stand up and rub the dirt off his forehead, muttering quiet obscenities. Kakuzu smirked behind his mask. This, he proclaimed suddenly, is your final test. Both of you are capable shinobi hardened by experience and tutoring, albeit prone to lapses in judgment and competence. You have been trained to be apathetic killers, desensitized to the pain and death of others. Though you are young, you have potential. He paused to look into the distance of the landscape. Naruto would have thought he was getting emotional, if the idea wasn't so ludicrous. Kakuzu turned back, green eyes intense. Do not squander your gifts. In the real world, there will be no one to watch your backs, to protect you. You will be forced to make your own way, survive on the fruits of your labors. After this, there will be no more guidance. There was silence among the trio as the two Jinchuriki allowed their mentor's words to wash over them. What Kakuzu had said wasn't exactly new, but it seemed very profound despite that. It almost sounded like he was warning them of what was to come, that they needed to grow up and survive, but to also exercise caution. They were the parting words of a teacher to his students, because after this, Kakuzu belonged to Akatsuki. Naruto lifted his head to meet Kakuzu's hard gaze. They know, don't they? About me? Yes. There was another long moment of silence, Naruto lost in thought and Kakuzu waiting for some other query or outburst. Fu was the one to break it. This says that Hidan originated from Yugakur, she pointed out, referencing the folder in her hands. I've never heard of it before. Kakuzu snorted in disdain, though the Jinchuriki felt that it wasn't aimed at her. 
That is to be expected. Yugakur is a minor village, even among other minor hidden villages like Kusagakur and Amigakur. It disbanded its shinobi program in recent years. Apparently he was quite unhappy about it, he stated, nodding towards the file, which is unsurprising. Shinobi do not take kindly to being snubbed by their village. No one pointed out that Kakuzu was a prime example of that particular ideology. Went on a rampage, killed his neighbors, left the village, Fu summarized. That was less than two years ago, but I guess we should check it out, see if there are any clues to his whereabouts. These notes say that every time Akatsuki made contact, they were close to Yugakur. Deft analysis, Kakuzu granted. He spread an arm before him, indicating the vast expanse. Welcome to the land of hot water, home to Yugakur, he continued dryly. Let's go then, prompted Naruto, striding past the other two. He paused a handful of paces ahead of Kakuzu's position and looked behind him, a sheepish grin in place. Ah, uh, where exactly is this village? Kakuzu resisted the urge to facepalm, instead moving past Naruto with a sweep of his cloak. This way. Once we reach the village, you two will take over. There will be no more hand-holding. Neither Jinchuriki asked for clarification on whether he was referring to their previous physical contact or him leading them through their quest, though Naruto had to bite his tongue to not make a snarky comment about how Kakuzu had never used hand-holding as a teaching tool. His piece said, the mercenary took off, both Jinchuriki following close behind. The journey was quiet for a long while, everyone lost in their own thoughts. After a couple of hours, Naruto decided to act on them. Hey, Kakuzu, what, um... He scratched his head nervously, what do you know about Akatsuki? When the mercenary didn't reply, he continued, you know, like, who are the members and what are they capable of? I figure we should know what we're up against when. He trailed off uncomfortably. Kakuzu didn't say anything for a time. Naruto almost lost hope in trying to get any inside information when his teacher spoke up. There are supposedly only 10 official members of Akatsuki at any one point. You are well acquainted with several of them. He reached into one sleeve of his long cloak, pulling out the thick bingo book Naruto was accustomed to seeing his mentor peruse. Where he kept it, Naruto could only guess, probably safeguarded within his body by the black threads. The mercenary flipped through the pages, then stretched his arm behind him with Jiung so that Naruto and Fu could view the entry while they walked. Hoshigaki Kisame, he intoned, more for Fu's benefit than Naruto's, a member of Kirigakura's seven shinobi swordsmen, extraordinarily proficient in Kenjutsu and Suten Ninjutsu. It is said that he killed his former master, Suikazan Fuki, part of the strongest generation of the seven shinobi swordsmen, to earn his rank among them. Fu's eyes roved over the picture of Kisame depicted in the book. Creepy looking, she commented. Kakuzu grunted noncommittally, unwilling to offer an opinion on the aesthetics of another given his own appearance. He's strong, Naruto added. Most of his techniques seem to revolve around sharks, and he likes using a lot of water to overwhelm the opponent. The blonde shuddered in remembrance of his own spars against the blue-skinned individual. I'm sure I only saw part of what he was capable of. Most likely, agreed Kakuzu, retracting his hand and flipping pages again. When he showed the book this time, the picture on the page was of a black-haired, crimson-eyed individual with prominent facial lines under his eyes. From Naruto's stint with Kisame, we know that this is his partner, Uchiha Itachi. Graduated from the Shinobi Academy at age 7, Chunin at age 10, Anbu captain at age 13, he possesses the Sharingan, which is capable of copying all jutsu it views. A short time after that, he killed his entire clan, an impressive feat for one so young, he admitted. It can be presumed that, like his brethren, he is extremely talented in genjutsu and katan ninjutsu, though his abilities are probably far more varied and cannot be accurately summarized so succinctly. I think he's stronger than Kisame is, Naruto stated slowly. Kisame seemed to take instructions from Itachi. This would not surprise me, Kakuzu acknowledged. Separately, both are powerful shinobi. Together, they are beyond dangerous. Unspoken went the words, you should avoid them at all costs. Fwip 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 went the pages again. This time, the image the Jinchuriki were presented with was of a child Naruto guessed to be their age, blonde hair and a high ponytail with a long fringe covering one eye. Datara, prodigy of Iwagakura's Hapa clan and the youngest member of the Explosion Corps in decades. The Hapa clan is known for its Keke Genkai, the Bakuten Chakra nature. It is highly destructive, he deadpanned. Naruto rolled his eyes. Gee, really? I wouldn't have guessed. The older shinobi disregarded his pupil's sarcasm. Daidoro was taught by the Sandaimate Tsuchikage, and can be assumed to be quite competent with Doden Ninjutsu. 
It is rumored that he stole a kinjutsu from Iwagakura which allows him to infuse his explosive chakra into clay creations. Judging by the size of the bird he arrived on, these rumors have merit. After he left the village, he became a terrorist bomber for hire, though his activities lessened in frequency a couple of years ago. I can only surmise that he was recruited to Akatsuki around that time. You seem to know a lot about him, Fu commented. Kakuzu grunted. He piqued my interest some years ago. Unfortunately, I was rather preoccupied with keeping tabs on the brat. Oi! protested Naruto. What do you mean keeping tabs? You went off gallivanting around the world and left me alone too. Did you ever wonder, Kakuzu interjected icily, how you went so long without ever being discovered by any shinobi? Did your feeble mind ever consider how we stayed in one location, under the noses of the foolish Konoha nin you escaped from, without ever running into a single one of them? I, I, Fu shot him a curious glance when he couldn't formulate a cohesive response. The blonde swallowed, thinking over this new information. It was true that while living in Onanji, Naruto had never run across any other shinobi, despite the fact that, with the hindsight that he was a Jinchuriki, they would certainly be looking for him. And Kakuzu, while neglectful with his training, had also never put him in a dangerous situation without considering him ready to handle it. Plus, the mercenary had been gone an awful lot during his younger years. Naruto had originally written it off as bounty hunting expeditions, but. Could he have? Did, did you, were you protecting me? The slow turning of pages was his only answer. Naruto resisted the urge to rip the book from his teacher's hands and demand an answer. That had bad idea written all over it. Another short interlude of quiet confirmed that Kakuzu would never actually admit to looking after or caring for the blonde. Lost in the circular debate of whether the older shinobi was bluffing or not, Naruto was practically slapped in the face by the bingo book. He recovered in time to hear Kakuzu begin talking. Although unconfirmed, I believe that this is Datara partner, Akasuna no Sasori. Unruly red hair framed a face with oddly pale skin for someone who grew up in the desert. Laconic brown eyes stared out of the page, appearing completely disenchanted. He looks so young, Fu wondered. I mean, I know that we're young for Nuknan, and Datara only a teenager, but still. HN. Well, he should. This picture is almost 20 years old. Both Jinchuriki stared at the back of the former Taki Nin's head. If Kakuzu noticed, he let it go. Sasori defected from Sunagakur a little more than 17 years ago, in the middle of the Third Shinobi World War. He was hailed as a genius puppeteer, the greatest master of Kugutsu no Jutsu since its creator, Chikamatsu Manzimon. However, after he became a Nuknin, Sasori became untraceable. His physical characteristics, abilities, strength, jutsu arsenal, they are all unknowns. While Akatsuki's Sasori shares none of the traits depicted here, the real Sasori is a puppeteer. Meaning that the body he's using could be a puppet, Naruto finished. It is likely. The bingo book snapped shut with a resounding clap. Zetsu, Tobi, Konan, none of them are listed as Nuknin from any village. Based on observation, Zetsu has the ability to phase through and merge with solid matter, though I am unsure of his limitations. Tobi can disappear into thin air with an ability similar to a shunshine, and Konan has some sort of control over paper. Their leader, Pain, an alias, I am sure, is also an unknown, though the strange pattern of his eyes would seem to imply some sort of dojutsu, albeit one I am not knowledgeable of. Well, Naruto stated after allowing the information to sink in, that's more than we knew before. Now we have a bit more a fighting chance. That was rather gratuitous of you, Kakuzu, Fu pointed out. I don't suppose you plan on helping us. Whatever scheme you have planned will have to be executed by your own hand, Kakuzu interjected. Information is an open source for those who know where to look. I merely provided you with data any good bounty hunter should know. Fu opened her mouth to say something else, but a restraining hand on her shoulder stopped her. The green-haired girl looked to her left. Naruto shook his head, his hand returning to idle by his side. He recognized the note of finality in his teacher's tone. Kakuzu was not going to give out any more information than what he had already offered. Truthfully, it was a boon they had gotten that much from the former Takinin. When dusk fell upon them, the trio made camp at a location Kakuzu estimated to be a couple of hours away from Yugakur. Lacking any camping equipment, Fu erected simple earthen constructs for each of the renegades to take shelter in. Their teacher absentmindedly lit a small fire and retired shortly thereafter, leaving the two Jinchuriki sitting across from each other on sturdy stone seats Fu had created. For a time, the only sounds were the crackling of the fire between them and the calls of the nocturnal animals. Naruto tapped a finger against his cheek rhythmically, 
Chin resting in the palm of his hand, elbow propped on his knee. Prodigies, he murmured at last. Prodigies and masters and geniuses. Fu nodded sullenly. Things don't look too good, do they? Naruto made a noncommittal noise. Are we gonna die? She whispered, as if afraid someone would overhear her trepidation. Naruto offered her a sad quirk of his lips. Not without a fight, we're not. And, he continued, pausing to collect his thoughts, I think we still have time. At his companion's questioning head tilt, he elaborated, think about it. They had us right where they wanted us, outnumbered, outclassed, and tired. But instead of taking us then, we were allowed to leave with Kakuzu. What does that tell you? The Nanabi Jinchuriki thought about it for a moment. They either want to make use of us, she replied slowly, or, they can't take the bijou from us yet. Naruto nodded. Which do you think it is? He shrugged. Dunno. We don't know enough about their operations or their plans to make an accurate prediction. For now, we play by their rules. We find out exactly what each of the members can do, get stronger, and stay on their good side. If we get really lucky, we won't have to fight for our lives. Silence reigned after that, the two bijou containers allowing Naruto's last statement to echo in their minds. When the fire died out some time later, the two young ninja went to their respective shelters with quiet bids of good night. Naruto woke up earliest the next morning, moving on a mixture of restlessness and nervous energy. Hungry, and looking for something to do, he scoured the vicinity for something edible, eventually coming up with a couple of groundhogs. Kakuzu was awake when he returned, and the older ninja rekindled the fire from the previous night without a word between them. Today we reach Yugakur, Naruto thought between bites of roasted animal. At that point, Kakuzu would turn the reins over to him and Fu to find Hidan, no matter where the man currently was. It was almost as if Kakuzu was passing the baton to the two of them, and the success of their future lifestyles depended on the outcome of the search for Akatsuki's newest member. Blue eyes narrowed with steely resolve. I won't let you down. Fu woke shortly thereafter, and after eating the remaining meat, she demolished the earthen shelters and the trio took off again. They arrived at the entrance to Yugakur after a couple of hours. As they stepped through, Kakuzu scoffed, not even a guard. Pathetic. Naruto and Fu exchanged looks, the former rolling his eyes. What a shock, Naruto muttered. Kakuzu holds disdain for something. Fu let out a short giggle, prompting a small grin from the blonde. Make yourself useful, brat, interrupted Kakuzu, and tell me where our target is. Otherwise this poor excuse for a hidden village will not be the only thing I regard with disdain. Yeah, yeah, Naruto dismissed, walking ahead of his teacher with Fu slightly behind him. Like I'm not already on that list. Maybe we should do something productive, Fu suggested. She walked up to the nearest villager, an elderly woman, and asked politely, Excuse me, oh Bachan, I was wondering what you knew about a man named Hidan? The woman's face immediately crumpled into a terrified expression. Ooh, she moaned, he's a terrible man. Coming here and slaughtering our citizens, with no reason other than the fact that he likes it. He comes by every couple of months to destroy another section of our beautiful village, ranting and raving about some person. Joshin, I think? We've tried hiring shinobi to protect us, but none of them have ever returned to the village. And just last week, my daughter-in-law was, was. The woman burst into tears, overcome by sorrow. Fu patted her back gently, if a bit awkwardly. We, uh, offer our condolences, Naruto tried, fumbling over the awkwardness of being kind to a stranger, but could you perhaps tell us where the incident last week took place? Sniffling, the old woman pointed down the road, further into the hidden hot springs. It's not too far down the road from here. Construction's already being done on it, you can't miss it. Naruto offered her a slight incline of his head before motioning to Fu to follow the instructions. As the green-haired girl withdrew her hand and began to tread after the blonde, the elderly woman looked up and asked, Who are you? Fu offered her a tentative smile. We're here to, rectify your village's crisis. Thank you for your help. Clearly neither of you has issue with human contact, Kakuzu deadpan once they were out of earshot. The manner with which you interacted with that woman was nothing short of embarrassing. Naruto shrugged his teacher's sarcasm off. As Jinchuriki, both he and Fu had not been privy to the kinder side of humanity, and thus had none to few experiences with personal interaction. Living with Kakuzu's influence for so long had nullified whatever need there was to actually try and be polite, the bounty hunter was nothing if not blunt. Almost disappointed with his student's lack of a reaction, Kakuzu goaded, subtlety is an important aspect of the hunt. Yeah, cause a six-foot man covered head to toe and wearing a black cloak with red clouds is the definition of subtlety, retorted the blonde. 
Kakuzu smirked behind his mask, glad to see his students' vim and peppiness intact. Naruto would make a fine legacy someday. Assuming he survived whatever Akatsuki had planned for him, of course. The sound of a deep-voiced man yelling caused Naruto and Fu to run ahead, banking right at the next path. Kakuzu reached the intersection at a more sedate pace, opting to remain behind and study his students' methods. Analytical green eyes took in every detail of the surrounding area. Huge stacks of lumber were piled everywhere, in close proximity to a series of buildings which were all in various states of disrepair. Villagers donned in hard hats milled about the area, carrying wood, tools, bricks, and a variety of other infrastructure materials from one location to another. Ants, Kakuzu thought with scorn. All of them scurrying around like tiny insects. Pathetic. Some of the buildings held scorch marks, the residue from some explosion or cat and ninjutsu, he deduced. Rust-colored splotches along the walls and on the ground provided evidence as to a large amount of bloodshed. Hmm. Naruto and Fu came jogging back shortly thereafter. The foreman confirmed what we already knew about Hidan, Fu stated. He was a loyal ninja of Yugakur until the village disbanded its program and became a tourist destination. Then he went batshit crazy, Naruto jumped in. Slaughtered his neighbors and left the village. Apparently he's been returning every so often since he left. Kills some people, raises some buildings, he likes to cause destruction. But his visits are sporadic, they range anywhere from three weeks to three months. Trying to prove a point, Kakuzu muttered, or acts of retribution? Hmm, how curious. Anything else? Bloodstains, Fu replied, all over the place. We can only assume Hedon's the cause. There's a trail that goes out from behind that building and leads deeper into the land of hot water, Naruto gestured. Just judging by the size of some of the bloodstains, I'd guess that he's wounded. Hard to tell exactly how old they are, but Hedon doesn't exactly strike me as the type to care about being subtle enough to cover his trail. Lacking subtlety and brains, Kakuzu mauled. Sounds like an older, more dangerous version of you. At Naruto's affronted glare, the mercenary smirked to himself, then continued musing, though the fact that he is injured is, intriguing, considering that there are no Yugakura shinobi in existence anymore, let alone ones who could harm a supposed S-class Nuknin. Yeah, well, now what? griped Naruto. That should be obvious. We follow the trail, Fu supplied. Kakuzu nodded. Clearly the brains of the pair, he muttered, drawing another scowl from his blonde protege. Yes, as any good bounty hunter would, we follow the trail. Now, lead. Growling obscenities under his breath, Naruto stalked off in the direction of the construction, leaving Fu and Kakuzu to follow him. Unable to resist a parting shot, Kakuzu added, not that a good bounty hunter would ask for information, anyway, shinobi procure their knowledge by merit of their stealth and espionage abilities. The blonde's ravings about sadistic, temperamental, child-hating bastards could be heard clearly as the trio trekked out of the village. LLL. A month and a half in the wilderness with only Kakuzu and Fu for company was a long time. Granted, Naruto had spent longer periods of time with only Kakuzu or Kisame, and Itachi, for company, but after having to be around people for the Chunin exams, the isolation of the outdoors was a strange contrast. He had never really considered the difference between living with and without the assets of the city life. Toilets, for instance. The good news, he supposed, was that Fu was around. Without her, and with Kakuzu's reawakened sadism, Naruto was sure he would have gone crazy trying to survive with only the older shinobi to interact with. That said, the former Taki Nin had also mellowed somewhat, at least, compared to what Naruto had expected from his teacher's behavior. Aside from that fact that the blonde thought Kakuzu would have flipped his lid at the amount of time tracking Hidan had taken, and he thus far hadn't, the missing Nin had also proven to be quite helpful, even more so than during the Chunin exams. During the month and a half of movement, Kakuzu had proven himself adept as a tutor, if not a snarky and sarcastic one. In between trying to retrace Hidan's movements through the land of hot water, Kakuzu had imparted the wisdom of some of his techniques upon the two Jinchuriki, though true to his word, he had revealed nothing of the intricacies associated with mastering Jung. Naruto had all but mastered Doden, Domu with Kakuzu's, Snide, assistance, in addition to weaseling Sutan, because we show Ha and Sutan, swore you Dan no Jutsu out of the original surging wave. Fu had been granted a series of increasingly powerful earth release techniques, as well as inspiration for new dust release ninjutsu. The newfound attention to the training regimes of the two Jinchuriki was unusual, though not unwanted by any means. Kakuzu, in his strange, detached way, was practically parenting them, preparing the duo for life outside his realm of influence. 
At least, that was the explanation Naruto preferred. It was sentimental in a way, though the blonde had no intention of voicing that opinion aloud. It had probably also helped Kakuzu's mood that they had run into a renegade Kumo Nin who had resupplied the thread user with a Raten heart during their journey. Now, six weeks after initially setting out to find Kakuzu's new partner, six weeks of grueling walking, tracking, inspecting every tree, branch, and bush for a new clue whenever the trail went cold, they had arrived at the end. They had traversed the land of hot water's western border, cautiously, since the land of fire was its neighbor, down to the tip of the country, and then up the eastern coast. Kakuzu had grudgingly admitted that Hidan was perhaps smarter than he had initially thought after the trio had followed two different old trails to dead ends and then been forced to double back. Then, on the second turnabout, they had come across a freshly ravaged village which had been in perfect condition when they had passed it the first time. Following the day-old trail had been stupidly easy, even for a rookie hunter like Naruto, whom Kakuzu had taken to describing as so inept at tracking that he could not find water if he fell out of a boat. It was at those times when Naruto wished he had a different role model. Still, they had done it. The trio was currently standing in front of a very large rock bearing no significant features. Naruto would have likely passed it over as another formless boulder in the sea of the land of hot water's dull landscape if Kakuzu hadn't called a halt, claiming he sensed a chakra signature somewhere below them. So, Naruto began, staring at the rock blankly, suggestions? Humph. Useless, Kakuzu intoned. We knock. He rolled up the sleeve of his right arm, revealing the telltale darkening of the earth spear technique. With minimal effort, the mercenary punched the rock, breaking it into a plethora of smaller pieces and revealing a hole in the ground which the stone had been covering, a winding series of earthen steps leading into the abyss. A back draft of foul chakra washed over them, causing the two Jinchuriki to shudder and Kakuzu to peer into the darkness with hidden curiosity. The feel of the chakra was ancient, centuries old at least, and the ex-waterfall shinobi was intrigued as to its source. Naruto broke the silence that had overtaken the trio in the wake of the chakra. So who wants to go down the dark, creepy hole first? There is no need, Kakuzu informed him. Our host is coming out to greet his guests. He leapt backwards, putting some distance between himself and the hole. Fu and Naruto scrambled to follow as an obnoxiously loud voice started to become audible. Who the hell dares to intrude upon the entrance to Jashin Sama's temp, you again? I already told that plant fucker that I'm not interested in joining your shitty organization. Crass, Fu observed. Naruto nodded in agreement, analyzing Hidan's full profile while he stood in front of them instead of from the file's pictures. Silver hair was unchanged from the photos, looking too bright against pale skin. Wearing only a pair of maroon-colored pants and with bandages wrapped around his abdomen, his physique was well-defined, pointing towards a ninja more adept at taijutsu, though he seemed shorter than Naruto would have expected, especially with the size of the scythe clinging to his back. It was a dangerous-looking weapon, red with three wickedly curved blades, each of them decreasing in size and topped in a streak of silver, bandages were wrapped around the handle, which ended in the thick coil of cable Naruto recognized from the pictures, carried in spools attached to Hidan's hip. Around the man's neck was a slashed hitty eight, the symbol of three diagonal lines, and a necklace, the pendant bearing a circumscribed triangle. Kakuzu also remained silent, though for a different reason. The source of the chakra was not Hidan, although there was a taint of it emanating from the silver-haired man. Just like with the Uzumaki clan, he found himself busy racking his brain for the inkling of familiarity Hidan's words had triggered. Jashin, Jashin. The name sounded much more familiar than when the old woman in Yugakur had blundered it, though not enough to recall anything substantial. Shaking it off as something that would come to him in time, Kakuzu stated, Our leader asks that you reconsider. He believes that your views coincide with Akatsuki's and that you will be a great asset to the organization. Hell no, was the immediate response. Purple eyes narrowed in gleeful delirium. And since you heathens can't seem to understand that, it looks like I'll have to teach you a lesson. He grasped the handle of the scythe and brought it forward, twirling it experimentally with surprising deftness. Behind Kakuzu, Fu tensed. The mercenary immediately hardened his skin in preparation for Hidan's assault, but Naruto stepped forward and cracked his knuckles. Don't bother, Kakuzu, he advised, unusually serious. I want him. You stupid brat, Kakuzu groused. He is an S-class level shinobi. Your skills are nowhere near his. Naruto rushed forward to meet the charging Hidan, completely ignoring his teacher. Fine. Let the consequences of your foolhardiness rest on your shoulders alone. Kakuzu rubbed his forehead in a vain attempt to dispel the headache his blonde student tended to cause. This will be, tedious. Naruto didn't respond, 
The whether that was because he chose not to or he couldn't hear his mentor was up for debate. He fired a quick sutin, Mijarapa at his advancing opponent, but Hidan used his scythe as a shield to block most of the stream. Despite the slight loss in momentum, the former Yunin was on top of Naruto in a manner of seconds, swinging his scythe with reckless abandon. Naruto ducked the weapon and tried a sweep kick, but the silver-haired man jumped back and brought the scythe down again, laughing all the while. In an unfavorable position, Naruto was forced to activate the earth spear technique, batting the large weapon skyward with an earth-reinforced arm. He dropped the defensive ninjutsu and began signing for the whirlwind fist, the downside to using Doden, Domu was that he couldn't use other ninjutsu while it was active. He was taken by surprise when Hidan yanked on the weapon's thick metal coil, bringing the triple-bladed scythe plummeting down towards him. The blonde immediately cut off his offensive and dove to the side. A low hiss escaped his mouth as the longest blade made contact, tearing open his sleeve and leaving a long gash along his upper arm. Son of A. He 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 ha ha ha. Hidan cackled, his pitch rising with unbridled glee. He reached behind him and withdrew a small black object from his waistband, which telescoped into a lengthy pike. Without flinching, he stabbed himself in the stomach, allowing his blood to spill freely and soaking the bandages there. His feet moved to draw a replica of his rosary symbol on the ground in stark red. Prepare to have judgment passed on you. Jashin Sama, please accept this sacrifice in your great name. Then he licked the tip of the scythe. Hidan's skin darkened to the deepest pitch, leaving a pattern of white that gave him the appearance of a skeleton. Fu, in a moment of surprise and terror, latched onto the nearest thing to her, Kakuzu's arm. Kakuzu, she whispered, attempting to keep the tremor from her voice, W what is he doing? The bounty hunter glared at her until she released him, then turned back to the, rather one-sided, fight without responding. He was on the verge of solving the mystery that was Hidan, the answer sitting on the tip of his tongue. Screw you, Naruto shouted, getting to his feet. You and your lord can suck it. Futan, Kazikiri. The blade of air soared across the distance between the two and broke diagonally across the laughing Nuknan, cutting deep into his flesh. Naruto relished in the satisfaction of landing a blow on the S-class shinobi for only a moment before he let out a loud gasp and sank to his knees. Blood began to soak into his shirt from a cut on his chest identical to the one Hidan had just received. W what? He gasped as Jiang began stitching close the wound. Cha ha ha! Shrieked Hidan, purple eyes bloodshot, pupils dilated with madness. You've been cursed, and Jashin Sama has deemed you unworthy. Prepare to die. The retractable pike seemed to move with startling slowness towards Hidan's heart. Fu shouted something. Naruto launched his fists in an attempt to stop Hidan. The silver-haired man's eyes widened further in anticipation. Kakuzu drowned out all of that, focusing all of his thoughts inward. Jashin, Jashin, a triangle within a circle, sacrifice. Green eyes snapped open as the pike dug through flesh and Naruto clutched his chest, gaping like a landed fish. The god of destruction, he muttered, the name finally striking a familiar chord. Kakuzu, do something. Fu shrieked. The mercenary paid her no mind, choosing instead to focus upon Hidan. Jashinism was an ancient religion, something he had once read about long ago from a scroll crinkled with age. Even then, Jashinists were a secretive lot, practically a cult, and the information he had obtained was minimal. Jashin was the god of destruction, and as such, the religion's followers were expected to rain death and carnage upon all who crossed their path anything less was considered blasphemy. Of course, none of that explained either the curse or the ritual that Hidan seemed so very proud of, but then again, Kakuzu was half impressed that he had remembered that much about the religion. Jashinism had been considered an extinct religion even during the mercenary's heyday. The stupid brat brought this upon himself, he said at last. The pain, is amazing. Hidan practically purred. Who's next, Jashin Sama? The masked asshole, or the little girl? And neither. Naruto. Fu cried. D damn, muttered the blonde, there goes my safety net. He scratched his chest, mildly unnerved that he had just lost his Doden heart so quickly. Just gotta be more careful then. Let's go, round two, he directed at Hidan. Hidan was, for the first time, absolutely speechless. He managed to find his tongue after a moment, wondering, another immortal who can spread Jashin Sama's will for all eternity? Another immortal. Pain's words suddenly floated to Kakuzu's mind, you have a quality I believe he will find, tempting. Quick as lightning, Kakuzu's hand shot out and closed around Naruto's mouth before the blonde could say anything stupid. The child's, immortality, the word was still rather bitter on his tongue, is an inheritance I granted him. 
he waited a moment for the meaning of his words to sink into Hidan's head. Despite the fact that Kakuzu didn't consider himself immortal, if such a trait attracted the shorter man to Akatsuki and ended their farce of a mission, he would play the part of the undying. You serve a deity who teaches you to embrace destruction, Kakuzu continued. Akatsuki's end game is world domination, entire villages and countries wreathed in flames and ravaged in blood. Allying yourself with us would go a long way towards upholding your god's dogma, would it not? Hidan seemed to consider the taller ninja's words, the black and white pattern fading from his skin. All right, he agreed, I'll join your shitty organization. Working with another immortal should be interesting. Kakuzu allowed the reference to being immortal slide with growing ease. He retracted his hand from Naruto's mouth, and the blonde remained blissfully and surprisingly silent, and dug into the pocket of his cloak, coming out with the ring pain had given him. Recalling the ceiling positions in the cavernous hideout, he tossed it to Hidan and said, place that upon your left index finger. Almost immediately after the ring was put on, Pain's commanding monotone echoed in Kakuzu's mind. I see you were successful in your mission. The Fu. Yes, Kakuzu replied smoothly, cutting across Hidan's half-confused, half-angry curse. Our leader, he assuaged the Jashinist. Hidan, your assignment is the Nibi no Nekamata. The what? Report back when you have a lead. We shall. Oi, what the fuck does a cat have to do with world domination? Both Kakuzu and Pain opted to tune out Hidan's ranting. One more thing. Send the Jinchuriki to Odo Gakur. I wish to have words with them. The bounty hunter glanced at his two pupils, watching as Fu fretted over Naruto and the blonde merely waved her off with a laugh and a healthy dose of bravado. Understood. The presence in his mind disappeared just as suddenly as it had arrived. Brats, he stated in a voice that brooked no argument, come here. When they were standing in front of him, the tall shinobi continued, you have been summoned to Odo Gakur to meet with pain. Naruto and Fu exchanged quick glances before the blonde nodded. All right. I guess we better go then. There was a long moment where the trio did nothing but stare at each other, kids against adult, as if trying to decipher something in the other's posture that belied what they wouldn't say. Finally, the two Jinchuriki turned around and began to head northwest to the hidden sound. Just before they reached the tree line, Kakuzu called out, Naruto. Both children immediately about faced. The mercenary stared at them both a moment longer before reaching into his cloak and withdrawing his bingo book. He threw it at the blonde, who caught it with both hands, and then offered the duo a slight incline of his head. Naruto turned around and smiled so Kakuzu wouldn't see. It was as close to a nod of respect as he thought he would ever get from the detached Nuknin, the bequeathal of his bingo book spoke volumes as it was. With nothing left to say, the pair took off, neither they nor their temperamental teacher knowing when, or if, they would cross paths again. Chapter 14. Assault. It took a couple days of travel for Naruto and Fu to reach Odo Gakur. The lengthy trip could be attributed mainly to the lack of direction the two Jinchuriki had with regard to the Hidden Sound Village's precise location. As it was a newer establishment, and placed in a land that neither had previously had any reason to voyage through, it had taken the pair much longer to find the main village than it really should have. In the end, Oto Gakur's main base ended up being located in the dead center of the country. A simple archway proclaimed the entrance to Otto, and as the Jinchuriki approached it, they were halted by a pair of guards demanding to know their business. We're here to see, ah. Uh. Naruto paused, wondering if Pain actually went by that name inside the village, the leader of Akatsuki? One of the men peered down at him suspiciously. No strangers are permitted to see Kamisama. State your names and affiliations, immediately. Kamisama? Naruto mouthed to Fu. She shrugged, but before either could respond, a blue-haired woman appeared in a flurry of paper. The two guards bowed hastily at her appearance, reverently murmuring, Angel Sama. Follow me, Konan intoned. Pain has been expecting you. Naruto and Fu exchanged glances, but followed the paper user through Hidden Sound's entrance and into the village proper. The village itself was relatively unimpressive. Plain brick buildings lined the dirt roads, housing families with no other country to go to. Children frolicked in the streets, overseen by their parents, grime and dust smudged on their faces and clothes. All fell silent as Conan swept across their path, black cloak ruffling in the breeze. So. Began Naruto, Pain's a god, huh? Pain is viewed as the savior of this land, Conan stated blandly. Orochimaru was a tyrant, only interested in serving his own agenda, which focused little on helping the actual citizens of this country. Pain has no such compunctions with regards to helping those who are unable to help themselves. 
if there are those who choose to view his actions as those of a benevolent deity, then we shall only embrace such accolades. That's interesting, Naruto mused. Generally, individuals bent on world domination didn't focus on the issues of the little people, often dismissing them as inconsequential. Power was their only aim, in every different facet of its many types, wealth and strength, among others, and it didn't matter who they stepped on to amass it. Orochimaru was a good example of such an archetype. But this. Helping the civilians of a nation who had, until recently, only been used to further the twisted desires of a madman? Payne's plans didn't fit the stereotypical model of a power-hungry individual set on conquering the known world. Harrow's words about how Payne would end the rule of the tyrannical Hanzo and Amiga Corps floated to Naruto's memory. Perhaps there was a more hidden agenda behind Akatsuki's leader's goals? If so, it certainly boded well for the plan that Naruto and Fu were hoping would work. Otherwise their lives were about to be cut dramatically short. Konan led the two Jinchuriki to a tall building which towered over the rest of Odogakur. It was easily several hundred feet high, and looked strangely out of place in the midst of the village's otherwise level, urban environment. Pain is waiting for you inside, Konan informed them. Then, without another word, she separated into a storm of paper sheets. Here we go, Naruto sighed, pushing the door open and leading Fu into the building. It was rather plain inside, with a series of stairs ringing the interior of the construct and spiraling up beyond the pair's field of vision. That seems unnecessary, Fu commented, gazing at the stairs. Probably to discourage civilians from reaching their god, presumed the blonde, his tone carrying a tinge of sarcasm. Very tedious, though. He turned to his fellow Jinchuriki. Wall hopping? After you. Naruto pumped Chakra to his legs and leapt upon the wall. He rebounded in a backflip and hit the opposite side of the building, Fu following close behind. The pair jumped from wall to wall, performing a variety of acrobatics until they reached the top. Standing with his back to them, overlooking the hidden sound from a large opening, was the orange-haired form of pain. He turned at the sound of his guests' feet hitting the steel of the top floor. Silence reigned as each party observed the other. Otto looks nice, Naruto offered finally. It has made progress, Pain noted, but there are still things which require improvement. He stared at the two for a long moment. I must admit, I'm mildly surprised that you came here. Naruto quirked an eyebrow in what he considered to be a fair imitation of Kakuzu. Oh? Yes. Two Jinchuriki coming willingly to the headquarters of an organization they know to be hunting them for their bijou seems incredibly foolish. Fu tensed, and Naruto moved in front of her slightly, bringing his hands together to more easily form seals. Such an action speaks volumes of either your stupidity or your arrogance. Pain turned around and crossed his hands behind his back, returning his gaze to the village below. However, given that Kakuzu does not seem like the type to tolerate a low intelligence quotient, and it is unlikely that you actually believe yourself capable of claiming victory over an opponent immeasurably more skilled than yourself, I can only deduce that neither of those assumptions is correct. He turned to face his visitors. So why did you come here? Kakuzu said you wanted to speak to us, Naruto replied, mustering up more bravado than he felt. Though it was hard to tell from Payne's words, it was entirely possible he had just led himself and Fu to their deaths. Um, that is true. You must have a great deal of faith in your mentor's guidance to come to a place so fraught with danger. Naruto shot a quick glance at Fu, as if trying to corroborate what they could say about Kakuzu. I wouldn't quite phrase it like that. Kakuzu believed it was important that I speak to you before committing to action, Payne stated smoothly. You see, it is my desire to utilize the combined power of the Nine Bijou to create a monopoly on war, and eventually dominate the world through the continued blood and strife. Your sacrifice would not be in vain. If that's the case, don't you think you should take advantage of us before extracting the bijou? Payne stared at the blonde, prompting him to continue. I know that your organization requires a large amount of funds in order to enact your plan, and you should know that Kakuzu raised us to be bounty hunters. You propose to work towards Akatsuki's goals, Payne extrapolated. However, even assisting in our plans does not preclude you from the inevitable. Both the QB and the Nanabi are required for my intentions. One orange eyebrow rose minutely. What sort of reciprocity do you expect to exist from this partnership? Naruto shrugged. Just to live a little longer before our supposedly inevitable sacrifice. A pause, then, you've recently acquired a bishop and a rook, he pitched, referencing, cleverly, in his own mind, Kakuzu and Hidan, which means that your main force is complete. Now, in your quest to capture the bijou, we can either be your greatest opposition. He let that thought linger, or two of your pawns. I'm no genius, but even I can see which option serves you better. 
you do offer an intriguing proposition, pain aloud, taking a measured step forward. But tell me, he continued, slowly raising his hand, palm facing the two Jinchuriki, and using his power over attractive forces to pull the children towards him. Naruto and Fu struggled against his power, bending their bodies to resist the intentionally diluted strength of the Banshu Tenon, but slid forward regardless. What is stopping me from capturing you here and now? Naruto grunted as the force of pain's technique increased, pulling him closer to the man. Instinctively, he activated the futon, repushu, but the violent wind palm did nothing to halt his movement. Okay, he shouted. The tug on his body faded after a couple of seconds, and he placed a hand over his heart in an attempt to slow its violent pounding. Behind him, Fu was also breathing heavily, and Naruto spared her a look that indicated Pain's abilities were far beyond anything he had imagined. Absolutely nothing, he deigned to reply, solemn. Only the fact that you didn't kill us when you had the chance before we left to find Hidan made me think that you couldn't, or maybe didn't want to. Pain continued to eye Naruto with an expressionless facade. If you so desire, he said at length, then I have no issue with utilizing your talents for Akatsuki's resources. In return for allowing you to maintain your freedom, and your lives when unspoken, half of all proceeds you collect will go to Akatsuki. After a moment's hesitation minus 50% of all profits was a fairly hefty sum, especially considering the quality of targets he and Fu could actually kill at their current skill level, Naruto nodded. You won't be disappointed. I certainly hope not. LLL. He ran. Really, there was no other viable option considering what he had just gone through. The somewhat ramshackle building he had taken refuge in was apparently haunted, if the hoarse voice from nowhere and random whip-like things were any indication. Such a combination had driven him to a sort of nervous breakdown, and he had quickly abandoned his shelter for the night in favor of camping outdoors. Far, far away from the spooky building. A block of earth zoomed past his shoulder, and he turned to unleash a blast of wind at his presumed pursuer. Gazing at the path he had traversed, the light of the moon only revealed a smoky trail of dust swirling in the breeze. Paranoia's grip tightening around him even more, he dashed further into the thicket of the land of grass, using wind to boost his speed until he was panting laboriously. So caught up in running, he was unaware of the low-hanging vine which blended perfectly into the darkness. It looped around his neck, snapping it almost effortlessly before he could even question its existence. His body crumpled to the ground. Uzumaki Naruto jumped from the tree he had been perched in, a long thread of jung unwrapping from around his target's neck and disappearing back under his skin. Fu appeared in short order, crouching next to their victim and poking him with a finger. That was surprisingly effective, she commented. I can't believe this guy fell for such an obvious ruse. Her blonde companion merely shrugged. It was rather shocking just how many nuknin were labeled as such for the most minor infractions. Naruto had expected the majority of them to be powerful shinobi with the capacity to handle themselves in most situations. This one, like several of the others he and Fu had tracked down and killed over the past several months, was merely a Chunin whom his home village had discovered trading intelligence to foreign entities, and had escaped before being jailed. Information was powerful, but it also lent credence to the idea that most spies were not ideally suited for combat scenarios. We definitely got the right guy, he assured, pulling out a flyer he had nabbed on their recent trip to the hidden sand. Ishikawa Hiro, formerly of Sunagakur. How he rose to Chunin, I'll never know. The better question is how he escaped from Suna in the first place. Ever since the failed invasion of Konoha, Suna's been struggling to recuperate from their losses. With the Kaze Kage and his family dead, plus the loss of the Aichibi, Suna's been so embroiled in inner turmoil that it would be simple for any level of shinobi to leave the village. The blonde pulled a scroll from his pocket as Fu lifted the body, allowing him to unravel the scroll on the ground. A series of circles was inked into the parchment, several of them inscribed with names. Fu laid Hiro's body over the next empty circle, and Naruto performed a few quick hand signs before placing one palm upon the corpse. It disappeared in a cloud of smoke. How's Kamegenso? He asked, referring to the chameleon, one of Shiramari's sons, who had posed as the secluded building. He's fine. Disappeared as soon as the target was out of sight. Good. He wrapped up the scroll and placed it back into his pocket. The scripture was a remarkable example of Orochimaru's genius. Pain had given it to them before they had departed Otogakur, claiming that it was something he had found in one of the Sanin's labs and that it would be useful for their undertaking. It was a sealing scroll designed specifically to hold corpses, inscribed with extra seals to prevent decay of the contents sealed within. We should visit an exchange point soon. I want to see how much profit we've turned. Sounds good. 
They took to the trees, heading for one of the small tree forts they had created throughout the elemental nations for the purpose of having bases of operations. Both were caught unaware by the attack. A block of wood shot out from the trunk of the tree Fu was jumping from, catching her in the side and punting her deep into the forest. Naruto turned at her yelp, but the branch he was on wound around him and threw him violently to the ground. He landed with a muffled oof but only managed to lift his head before wooden pillars sprouted from the earth and encaged him. What the hell? He muttered. Fu. Your companion is preoccupied, spoke a voice from the shadows. You're the only one I'm interested in, Kyubi Jinchuriki. Naruto blanched at that. Few people should know that contained the nine-tailed demon fox, let alone want to target him for it. He briefly toyed with the idea that Payne had reneged on their arrangement and sent one of his flunkies after him and Fu, but then discarded it. Only Payne, Toby and Zetsu had abilities that Naruto was unaware of, and even though manipulating trees could be something the plant like Zetsu might be able to do, the voice which had spoken didn't sound like either half of the plant man, nor did it sound like either of the other two. Besides that, if it was Akatsuki, they certainly would have been interested in restraining Fu as well, which this person apparently had no intention of doing. That meant there was a new player in the game. Great, Naruto huffed mentally, just what I need. Someone else interested in me. Like a group of S-class Nukunin wasn't enough. Kami clearly hates me. He wrapped his knuckles against one of the pillars of his prison and started in surprise. No way. It can't be. Who are you? He demanded. A figure stepped forward from the shadows. He wore grey chest armor over a sleeveless black bodysuit, complete with arm guards and black gloves which went past his elbows. Across his back was strapped a sword, and a white porcelain mask, with a vaguely cat-like design, with red and green markings covered his face, leaving tufts of brown hair sticking up above the mask as his only visible, physical characteristic. He was gripping his right wrist with his left hand, the right one held palm out to Naruto with the character for Sid inscribed on it. You may call me Tenzo if you so desire. Naruto's eyes narrowed. Anbu, Konoha Anbu. Tenzo said nothing. Even so, this should be impossible. With the exception of Tsunade of the Sanin, the Senju line is extinct, and she doesn't even have the Keke Genkai of the Shodai Hokage. Makuten shouldn't exist. The brunette remained silent, and the Jinchuriki mentally cursed the mask the man wore. It was frustrating to never see Kakuzu's facial expressions, not being able to see this man's was even worse. I'm right, aren't I? There's no other ability in the world that can manipulate trees and produce wood from nothing. You're quite astute, was all the Anbu said. Shit. Naruto was well and truly screwed. If Kakuzu, who was who knew how much stronger than him, hadn't been able to defeat the might of the Shodai Hokaiyes would release bloodline limit, what chance did he have? That wasn't to say that this Tenzo fellow was as strong as Senju Hashirama, that was highly doubtful, but he was still in possession of an otherwise extinct Keke Genkai, and was good enough to be an Anbu. The odds really didn't look to be in his favor. Experimentally, he formed a blade of wind along his arm, the tip extending a couple inches past his fingertips, he had thus far neglected replacing his wakazashi, though he had recovered his futon and suit and hearts, and slashed it across one of the wooden bars. A mere splinter was carved from the prison. Naruto released a strangled gurgle at the lack of damage the sharpest of the elements did to the legendary Makuten ninjutsu. You won't be able to free yourself from my Shishiro no Jutsu through conventional means, Tenzo informed him. It's now time to return to Konoha. Not until I'm ready to destroy it, snarled the blonde, opting for a different method of escape. By some stroke of luck, Tenzo had neglected to create a floor of wood. If they ever met again, he would certainly not forget to do so. With a quick application of chakra, Naruto slipped underground via Doden, Mogaregakura no Jutsu and began to tunnel a path away from the Anbu member. Sucker! Doten, Doryukatsu. The ground around the blonde immediately began to quake before splitting apart to create a series of chasms and fissures. Naruto was hit by the cool night air as his hiding spot was revealed. Holy shit, he managed, wide-eyed. You're resourceful, but you're not going to escape from me, Tenzo stated. Mukuten, Mokusatsu Shibari no Jutsu. His arm transformed into a wooden block and promptly split into a series of malleable wooden tendrils which diverged to surround Naruto. Well, you're certainly not making it easy to do so, he conceded. The wooden tendrils reminded the Jinchuriki of his own flexible kinjutsu, and he quickly called to the threads within his body. Forming the signs of the dragon and then the boar, more out of habit than actual necessity, he hissed, Jiung, Shiruto Fomu, Jiung, Sodo Fomu. 
threads burst forth from stitches on both arms, the ones on his left interlacing to form a small shield over his wrist while the ones on his right wound together to create a sharp blade which protruded a solid two feet past his hand. It was hardly a sword in a practical sense, but it worked for Naruto's intentions. He began to fend off the animated wood with the threads, barely managing to escape their grasp. This is really getting on my nerves, he griped. Get him. More threads sprouted from the sutures on his arms and zipped towards the Anbu agent. Several of the tendrils were blocked by their wooden counterparts, but those that weren't were immediately halted by a half-shell wood wall that formed in front of Tenzo with a series of interlocking clicks. Naruto scowled, he hadn't exactly expected that to work, and that wooden wall was probably twice as solid as the blocks Tenzo used for attacking, meaning his odds of penetrating it were unlikely. This guy's gonna be a pain in the ass. Churijikura no Jutsu. Fu. A thick cloud of dust rose into the air, covering the wide area that encompassed Naruto and his aggressor. Several threads slithered out of the tattoo on his forearm when a gentle hand came to rest on his bicep, working their way up to twine around the new appendage. We need to go, Fu whispered, now. Naruto let her lead him through the hiding in dust technique, opting not to drop Jung's shield and sword forms until they were safe, though the threads wound around his partner receded. What happened to you? He asked. Got attacked by a Konoha Anbu wearing a cat mask, she replied. He could turn his limbs into wood. Yeah, he must be some sort of lost descendant of the Shodai Hokage. Quickly, the blonde gave his companion a rundown of what he had gone through. Since he was after me, you must have been fighting some sort of clone. How'd you get away? Same way I got you away, Churijikura no Jutsu. Good thing I've practiced how to move through it, huh? She glanced behind them. If he's on Boo, we're not gonna be able to outrun him. Naruto nodded. Right. He bit his thumb and performed seals. Kushios no Jutsu. A large chameleon, the same type as Shiramari, if a fair size smaller than the chameleon boss, appeared in front of them. We need to hide, Genso. No problem, Naruto, rumbled the reptile. He opened his mouth and allowed both Jinchuriki to climb in. When they were inside, he shut his maw and his form rippled. Seconds later, Kamegenso was disguised as a copse of trees in the middle of the forest. Five minutes later, Tenzo passed through the area without any notion that his quarry was nearby. LLL. Naruto, you can't do this. Sure I can. Alright, you shouldn't do this. You know how dangerous he is. Even Kakuzu. Kakuzu's not here. We haven't heard from him in six months. He took a deep breath at Fu's mildly hurt expression, trying to rein in the bite in his tone. Sorry. I know what we were told, but don't you see that that's why I have to do this? He's my best chance at fixing this problem. It's not that big a problem. Naruto gave her an are you kidding me? Look. That last Nukunin killed me. He rubbed his chest uncomfortably at the reminder, adding get a suit and heart to his mental to-do list. When we were chasing Orochimaru, that stupid bitch from Otto got me, too. If it wasn't for either you or Jiang, I'd be screwed. And now with Tenzo out there. He let the thought hang, even though they hadn't run into the Makutan user since their initial encounter, the blonde knew the Anbu member wouldn't give up on finding him. I swore to fix this problem, and I will, no matter who I have to go to. I've been putting it off long enough. But. No, he asserted, I'm doing this. Fu was silent for a long moment. Fine, she sighed. Naruto offered his fellow Jinchuriki a wan smile. Don't worry, I'll be fine. In the meantime, he pulled out the scroll they used to seal bodies, here. You should keep up with our assignment while I get this whole thing worked out. She took the proffered item and dropped it into the cylinder on her back. You'll be careful, right? Of course. Naruto grunted as Fu threw her arms around his neck and captured him in a hug. He patted her back awkwardly, unsure of what to do in such a situation. Hey, it'll be alright, he assured her quietly, as if trying to convince himself of the same. Take care of yourself, he added when she pulled away. I'll meet up with you once I'm done with my training. I'll hold you to that. With one last look at him, Fu turned and disappeared into the trees. Naruto watched her go before making his way into the nearby cave. LLL. Uchiha Itachi was many things to many people. The terms prodigy and genius had been used by both his family and the higher-ups in the Hidden Leaf during his youth. After the massacre of his entire clan, barring his younger brother, he had acquired the titles S-Class Nukunin and member of Akatsuki. He was often described as being intelligent, emotionless, and dedicated. But one thing Itachi was not was easily surprised. Which was why, 
When Uzumaki Naruto entered the cave he had been using as a hideout while Kisame was out performing his own mission and asked for the Uchiha's assistance with breaking Genjutsu, the former Leaf Shinobi was caught flat-footed. That wasn't to say that he showed such a reaction, years of acting like he had no personality had taught him to temper any impulse to react outwardly, but the mere fact that he was surprised was an impressive feat in and of itself. And he wasn't quite sure how to respond to such a request. Itachi had plans. Or, perhaps more accurately, he had had plans. Not one of which involved training a recently turned teenage boy in the illusionary arts, even if it was how to dispel rather than cast them. But then, things hadn't quite turned out as well as the stoic man would have liked. The destruction of his flesh and blood had certainly not been an assignment he had ever thought he would receive upon joining Anbu. It wasn't something he regretted, he had had quite enough of what war he had seen in his short life, and his family's planned coup was sure to start another, but it also wasn't something he had enjoyed carrying out. Even then, he had had one stipulation to the heinous act of massacring the Uchiha clan, that his little brother Sasuke would be kept safe. That, he could admit, was a somewhat selfish request on his part, given that he had planned on having the younger Uchiha kill him somewhere down the line. Given the habit Itachi had gotten into after becoming a renegade with referring to his younger sibling as foolish, he was almost embarrassed at how easily his agenda had been derailed. Hindsight was always 2020. Such a phrase was especially ironic when the referred to party possessed the Sharingan. Itachi had accounted for any internal conflicts he had thought would have cost his brother. The Sandaime Hokage had given him his word that Sasuke would remain safe. Danzo had been threatened and blackmailed to leave Sasuke alone. The villagers' adulation of the Uchiha clan would ensure that Sasuke wanted for nothing while within Konoha's walls. And despite all that, Uchiha Sasuke, last of the loyal Uchiha, had been killed by external forces. By a Jinchuriki no less, one of the targets Itachi's organization was hunting. Irony struck again. Itachi wasn't entirely sure how to respond to the news. When it had been reported during the Aichibi ceiling, all heads had turned to him in expectation of a reaction. True to form, Itachi had given them nothing, but that wasn't to say he was unaffected. All of his plans for his younger brother, for his family's retribution, were for naught. Everything he had done thus far, massacring his family, protecting Sasuke, planning his own death, had been derailed. The only thing that was going right was his protection of Konoha from Akatsuki, more specifically, from Madara. And now, such a goal was meaningless. Konoha had not upheld its end of the bargain and protected Sasuke, what reason did Itachi have to continue actively defending Konoha? Itachi gazed at the blonde in front of him with an outwardly disinterested gaze. Sasuke was dead. There was nothing he could do for his beloved younger brother except hope that he was at peace. The way that Naruto had asked for training reminded Itachi of the days when Sasuke had done the same thing. Perhaps he couldn't help his brother, but this boy was different. From what he had observed during the blonde's training with Kisame, he had great potential. Naruto was also the QB Jinchuriki, which was, ironically, Itachi's target. Training him to be stronger meant that he had a greater ability to defend himself, which meant that Madara would have more difficulty getting his hands on all the bijou. While supporting the Hidden Leaf was no longer a priority on Itachi's personal agenda, anything that inhibited his ancestors' plans, which were sure to have negative repercussions the world over, could be considered a correct course of action. Cause and effect, Itachi thought. The situation looked to be win-win. Uchiha Itachi had failed to protect his family, failed to save Sasuke, failed to give his flesh and blood the retribution they so deserved. He would not fail Uzumaki Naruto. Let us begin. LLL. Naruto brought his hands together into the ram seal as a gigantic ball of fire descended upon him from the sky. Kai. The conflagration vanished as his chakra interrupted Itachi's own. Good, stated the Uchiha, inflection its usual monotone. Megan, Jigoku Koka no Jutsu is a good example of a destructive, if obvious, be rank Genjutsu. However, you would do well to remember that some of the more dangerous illusions are far more subtle. The blonde nodded, trying not to let Itachi's words go to his head. Kakuzu had never really given him blatant praise, and even though Itachi's voice never wavered from its flat delivery, Naruto took the man's simple statements as pride in his improvements. Idly, he wondered how weird it was that he could somewhat understand the subtle idiosyncrasies of emotionally stunted individuals. Are you ready to continue? Yeah. Very well. Nehan Shoja no Jutsu. White feathers drifted across Naruto's vision, causing the blonde to start suddenly. Even as he recognized the technique as the one used during the tuning exams, his limbs began to feel heavy and leaden. He fought the drowsiness that overcame his body, telling himself that it was just the pull of the illusion, 
that the sluggishness wasn't real. Forcing his arms to move, Naruto brought his hands into the ram seal. Kai, he muttered. Nothing happened, and he forced himself to tighten his focus. Kai. Still nothing. His chakra flared wildly as he struggled to break free of the genjutsu. Kai. The feathers disappeared, the lethargy left his body, and Naruto became aware of the fact that he was sitting on the floor. Itachi looked down on him impassively. Not the most judicious application of chakra I've ever seen, but it will suffice, Itachi said. Congratulations. You now have the capacity to dispel genjutsu. That's it? Naruto asked, moving to stand. He could hardly believe that the past two and a half months of struggling through one illusion after another had finally reached a conclusion. His major weakness was no longer a liability. For the most part, affirmed the raven-haired shinobi. That was an A-rank genjutsu. Despite your initial struggle, you managed to break it. The next step would be S-rank genjutsu and Keke Genkai induced illusions, neither of which you are likely to run across. Except for you. There was a pregnant silence as Naruto's words were digested. The fact that Itachi was designated the one to track and capture Naruto had been an understood wait between the two of them, though neither had brought up the topic until now. Yes, Itachi granted at length, except for me. I will warn you, he continued, much to his companion's surprise, that the genjutsu abilities of the Sharingan are unsurpassed. Should you find yourself in confrontation with any S-rank genjutsu users or Keke Genkai similar to the Sharingan, I would suggest fleeing. Such ninja have ways of making you question the very fabric of your reality. Also, be aware that you broke these illusions with the knowledge that they were placed upon you, in the heat of battle, you will not be so lucky. The opponent will not allow you to have foreknowledge of the fact that you are ensnared in an illusion, or several. Naruto nodded in understanding. He bowed slightly to Itachi before turning to leave the cave, but then twisted his head to glance at his temporary tutor. Tell me, he prompted, do you actually use any of the genjutsu you used against me? No. Those are all more commonplace illusions that you might come across in your travels. There was the most minuscule upturn of his lips that Naruto thought might be Itachi smirking. My personal collection of genjutsu has a, certain flair to it. Before the Jinchuriki could ask what that meant, the Uchiha separated into a murder of cawing crows. The blonde watched the birds fly away. He whispered a grateful, thanks, Itachi, to the cave, and then walked out. From the darkness of the cave's corner, Itachi watched his temporary pupil leave. Naruto had come a long way in his training, going from a highly illusion-susceptible ninja to an adept dispeller. That he had been willing to approach a known adversary to correct his most glaring weakness spoke volumes of his desire for personal growth, to prove himself. Naruto was no substitute for the Sasuke that Itachi had grown up with and loved, the Sasuke he had forced to hate him, to come kill him, who had died, but perhaps that was okay. Itachi was now a different person from the one his brother knew, and Naruto was another person unto himself, incomparable to Sasuke. He had been given a second chance to oversee the growth of another young mind, to make up for what he couldn't be to Sasuke. Sasuke shouldn't have died. Naruto didn't deserve to die. Itachi would do everything in his power to prevent that from happening. LLL. It didn't take long for the blonde Jinchuriki to find his female counterpart. Fu had apparently taken a more relaxed approach to bounty hunting during his training period, staying in the nearby vicinity and capturing whoever crossed her path rather than actively seeking out targets. Naruto wasn't sure Kakuzu would approve of such a methodology, but perhaps that was okay. Kakuzu had more than one screw loose, and any differences that he and Fu had contrary to their wayward mentor was probably more of a boon than a loss in the long run. He wasn't sure how to react to this new hugging phase Fu had apparently entered, though. Physical contact was not something he was very used to. Um. The green-haired girl released him and took a step back. Sorry, she offered sheepishly. I just. I was worried that you might not come back. You should have more faith in me, Naruto exclaimed. The extra dose of bravado wasn't necessary, but truth be told, the blonde was slightly surprised that he had left the Uchiha with all his faculties intact. Still, there was no point in worrying Fu needlessly with that tidbit of information. So where to now? I figured you should choose, since you've been cooped up for so long. Naruto mused that offer over with a quiet hum. He was still missing his suit and heart, which was a bit of a hindrance in the grand scheme of things, considering how adept he was getting with the liquid element. How about we find someone so that I can restock? Sounds good. Water again? Yep. Fu began flipping through the bingo book. How come you never want a cat or rate and heart? If it were me, I'd definitely want to have one of the more destructive elements. It's not that I don't want them, 
Naruto admitted, but our situation means that we've got to survive with what we know. I don't really have the means or time to learn to use either of those elements right now. Even Naruto wasn't so blind as to dismiss the fact that, while Kakuzu hadn't done a very good job of training him outright, the former Taki Nin had at least set the groundwork for Naruto's nature manipulation abilities. Maybe in the future I'll be able to master them, but for now we should stick with perfecting our current bags of tricks. His companion nodded her understanding. A devious grin worked its way onto her face, Naruto briefly entertained the idea that Kakuzu often wore the same expression underneath his mask when he was being particularly sadistic. Wanna go to Taki and wreak some havoc? Someone wants to take a chance. Fu shrugged. Might as well live a little, right? And they've got plenty of suit and hearts to take. We can consider it an early birthday gift in Kakuzu's honor. Really early, since his birthday will still be two months away by the time we get to the land of waterfalls. We'll make a party of it. There was a brief pause, followed by the quiet admittance, I miss him. So do I. Let's go then. We've got some traveling to do. LLL. Kakuzu now knew, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that when he eventually died, and it was when, not if, given that Kakuzu didn't believe he was immortal, he was going to hell. And not for any of the obvious reasons, either. It wasn't because he enjoyed inflicting pain upon others, or that he hunted and killed people for both sport and lifestyle choices. Nor was it due to his complete lack of regard for human life, going so far as to take a young child and guide him along a path to become his carbon copy, tainting his innocence in the process, though those were all good reasons. No. Kakuzu was going to hell because to have been paired with Hidan on a permanent basis, all other karmic deities had to have abandoned him. It was as simple as that. Pain had a rather sick sense of humor if he considered Hidan his ideal partner. During the 14 months of travel with the silver-haired man, Kakuzu had been driven to the brink of insanity and back. Multiple times. Objectively, a view Kakuzu was finding harder and harder to maintain, the Jashinist was a good complement to him, tactically speaking. Hidan was quite obviously a masochist, which matched well with his own sadism, though the fact that the younger male also took pleasure in his own pain somewhat dampened the joy Kakuzu took from it. Unfortunately, that was about the extent of what Kakuzu could tolerate about the man. Hidan was annoyingly talkative, dissolving into zealous rants about Jashin, angry tirades about Akatsuki's slow progress, and heated condemnations regarding Kakuzu's obsession with money with little to no prompting. The former Taki Nin had used the man's inability to be quiet to his advantage, learning about the origins of Hidan's technique throughout their long journey, in spite of the fact that he found his partner's lengthy diatribes rather annoying. Apparently, Hidan's ability stemmed from a successful experiment archived in some ancient Jashinism scrolls. As long as he had a sample of his target's blood, the pain and damage from any wound Hidan was inflicted with was shared with his opponent. It went well with the man's masochism and made dodging attacks less of a necessity, but otherwise the practicality of it had struck Kakuzu as somewhat lacking. When, in the middle of a battle, would Hidan have time to form the Jashinist symbol on the ground with blood and then get more blood from the opponent to pull off the cursed ritual? Kakuzu chose to pointedly ignore the fact that his partner had already pulled off the technique against his pupil. The ex-waterfall shinobi was secretly shocked at how often Hidan successfully trapped someone in his curse. Then his surprise always changed to annoyance at the length of the man's post-mortem rituals. Kakuzu viewed those as nothing more than a huge waste of time. Even worse was the Yugakur Nuknin's continued touting of his immortality, as loath as Kakuzu was to use the word. Unfortunately for his personal philosophy, as it stood, the old shinobi had no other explanation for Hidan's extraordinary resilience. Even discounting the evidence that Hidan repeatedly killed himself when in the midst of his curse or rituals, Kakuzu's own attempts to permanently silence the man had proved fruitless. They were accidents, of course, most of the time, anyway, after all, how was he to be blamed when Hidan's eccentricities pushed him into a blind rage? Dash but the thread user had tried everything. Burning, drowning, decapitation, he had even yanked his partner's still beating heart from his chest. Nothing worked. Pain was truly a twisted man. Kakuzu was tempted to take a crack at the man just to enact some form of vengeance for the hardship of putting up with Hidan, but being on Akatsuki's leader's shitlist was counterproductive to his own position, not to mention Naruto's and Fu's. Naruto. Kakuzu hadn't given his student much thought in recent months. For all he knew, both Jinchuriki were dead, and had been for a long time. Kakuzu's life for the past 14 months had been a repetitive cycle of bounty hunting, turning in corpses, and traversing the elemental nations looking for hints as to the whereabouts of either the Nibi or the Rakubi. Hidan's caterwauling, as Kakuzu had taken to thinking of it, 
while lacking the distinctive finesse and wit of Naruto's, had nonetheless filled in some of the space the blonde would have if they were still traveling together. All told, the silver-haired man was, personality-wise, a decent stand-in for the QB Jinchuriki, if a more obnoxious one. Though the fact that Kakuzu could use all of his powerful ninjutsu without having heat on die or bitch about watching his aim, as Naruto would have been wont to do, was an upside. The oxymoron that was the mercenary series of traveling companions was truly baffling. Oi, Kakuzu, are we there yet? Speak of the devil. The former Taki Nin looked up from his map. He and Hidan had been wandering the countryside of some of the lesser countries in the hope that they would come across the rogue Rakubi Jinchuriki, assuming that he was still alive, while also searching for the Nibi Jinchuriki. The lands of sound, Orochimaru had apparently gotten the daimyo to rename the country, the damned egoist, hot water, and frost had all been thoroughly scoured for any clues as to the whereabouts of the two Jinchuriki, though Kakuzu had been forced on at least a half dozen different occasions to stop Hidan from rampaging throughout his former home citing the lack of any worthwhile bounties as a waste of time. The bounty hunter thought that if the Rakubi vessel was in hiding, a lesser country would have been the most logical place to look. Any Jinchuriki still alive and loyal to their village was more likely to belong to one of the hidden villages of the five great shinobi nations than to one of the smaller ones, Fu being the exception rather than the rule. Which had led the pair north into the land of lightning. Kakuzu had been somewhat reluctant to enter the major nation, knowing that remaining inconspicuous, especially with Hidan as a companion, was far less likely the closer they got to Kumagakur. He wasn't afraid, the idea was rather laughable, especially after surviving Orochimaru, but information gathering required a far more subtle touch than the come, seek, kill, leave stratagem that was bounty hunting. After weighing the pros and cons and deciding that traversing the land of lightning at some point was inevitable, the pair had entered the nation's western border with the land of frost. It hadn't been long before they had come across an outpost village, which Hidan had quickly proceeded to ravage. At the mercenary's behest, Hidan had stopped short of massacring the enter village, leaving a single Kumo Chunin alive to interrogate. The Jashinist's curse ritual had come in handy then, with Hidan torturing the man with his masochism until the cloud shinobi had cracked. Kakuzu had considered it a stroke of luck that the Nibi Jinchuriki was actually a Kumo Nin, with a personal sanctuary located not comparably far from their location. The man's cooperation had been rewarded with a swift death. Apparently, Hidan found the five day trek unbearably lengthy. His whining made Kakuzu actually miss the companionship of his blonde student, I must be getting senile, to wish for that brat's company, he realized early. He crested another of the land of lightning's innumerable mountains and looked at the landscape below, Hidan lagging behind him. Yes, Hidan, he stated, we have arrived. Nestled among the feet of several tall peaks was what Kakuzu presumed to be some sort of shrine. From their distance, it was hard to make out any details, but atop the building was the rough design of a blue cat head. We should exercise caution, Kakuzu warned. We are unaware of how well the Jinchuriki is guarded, and it would be unwise too. Yahoo! Kakuzu could only stare as Hidan slid down the mountain, scythe dragging behind him and dislodging rocks and debris. Dust was kicked into the air as the silver-haired man descended upon the shrine. Incur unnecessary trouble, finish the former Taki Nin needlessly. Hidan cannot die, you have tried before with no success, he cannot die, he chanted mentally, trying to quell his temper. I am going to kill him. He leapt after his partner, long arms trailing behind him. As he got closer to the ground, he could already see Hidan preparing to engage a couple of Kumo Nin in battle. Kakuzu performed three quick hand signs. Katan, Zukoku. The cloud shinobi immediately scattered to avoid the scorching blaze, but Hidan, with his back to his partner, was quickly engulfed in flames. His angry screeching could be heard from even where Kakuzu was, causing the tall Nuknin to chuckle darkly. Whoever said revenge was a dish best served cold clearly had no affinity for Katan ninjutsu. By the time he reached the shrine, Hidan had already returned to swinging his scythe aimlessly, screaming expletives while doing so. Kakuzu shot his arm out at a shinobi sneaking up on the silver-haired man, grabbing him by the throat and reeling him in. Is the Jinchuriki inside? He intoned coldly. I'll tell you nothing. Kakuzu snapped his neck with barely a thought. Shinobi with principles, he remarked, disdain dripping from his voice. I applaud your dedication, but your lives are forfeit. Hidan was standing in one spot, preparing his ritual. Kakuzu rolled his eyes. Such a waste of time. Katan, Hibashri. Streams of fire raced along the ground, encircling the cloud shinobi and rising to prevent them from escaping. Kakuzu, you asshole, these heathens were going to be sacrificed to Jashin-sama. 
I could care less. Your target is most likely inside. Futon, Kamikaze. A massive gust of wind blew through the area, catching the flames and swirling them into a fiery vortex. The running fire slash divine wind combination was a watered down version of his Jigoku Arashi, usable when Kakuzu was too lazy or felt it unnecessary to drag out the wind and fire hearts from within his body. The sooner we capture the Jinchuriki, the sooner we can move on to other goals. You mean collecting money? His partner accused. All I want to do is spread the tenets of Jashin Sama. How long till this fucking plan of Akatsuki's takes effect, anyway? Kakuzu didn't respond. Instead, he watched the blazing whirlwind he had created die down, leaving the charbroiled corpses of the Kumo Nin visible on the ground. In all honesty, he was still unsure as to the time frame of Akatsuki's plans, let alone what the organization's actual endgame was or how it would take place. Still, he was supposed to be the smarter, senior half of this pairing. He wouldn't be able to live with himself if Hedon figured out that his partner knew only marginally more than him. Come, he ordered instead, moving towards the shrine's entrance, I have other things on my agenda. You just want to go on one of your godless money hunts. Without dogma, existence is meaningless. Kakuzu sighed silently. This was one of the repetitive, cyclic arguments he and Hedon frequently engaged in. It was mind-numbing and aggravating, nothing like the stimulating, and dare he say, amusing, banter Naruto and he exchanged. Once again he was struck with the thought that he missed his blonde disciple. Pushing that introspection to the back of his mind, he opened the shrine sliding doors forcefully just as a set of doors opposite him did the same. The kunoichi standing across from them possessed dirty blonde hair held in a ponytail of bandages. She wore a black and lavender top with a cloud design on the right breast, and deep blue, borderline black pants with the same cloud design on each leg. A red sash adorned her waist, and bandages were wound around her arms from bicep to wrist, ending in black, fingerless gloves. Who are you? She demanded, posture defensive. This her, Kakuzu? The Nibi bitch? The Kunoichi across from them tensed at the title of the bijou. Kakuzu's eyes narrowed at the motion. It would seem so he affirmed in a bored voice. Let us see your dogma reward you when you are not allowed to kill your target. Aw, come on Kakuzu, why did you have to go and say that for? Jashin-sama doesn't appreciate blasphemy. He requires death and destruction. You know that telling me I can't do something just makes me want to cast aside our instructions and go on a fucking rampage. Our objectives are everything, Hedon, and they are clear. The Jinchuriki must be captured alive. I don't know who you guys are, interrupted the Kunoichi, but I swear on my name, Ni Yugito of Kamagakur, that you will die here today for your transgressions. Fei, she clearly doesn't know the tenets of Jashinism. The only sin I must repent for is not killing her. If she came along willingly, then. Hidan, shut up and look. Yugito was crouched on the ground, blue and black flame like chakra spewing forth from her body. It settled into the form of a giant cat with two tails, eyes, one green, one yellow, staring at the pair over a mouth of razor-sharp teeth. I guess that's a no on the negotiations, then. Do you even have brain cells? Kakuzu deadpan testily. Hey! I thought we were supposed to be fighting the Jinchuriki, not this thing. What gives? Apparently she has the ability to transform into the Nibi. The former waterfall shinobi stared a moment longer before turning to his partner. Have at it. Boy, you're not gonna help me? The Nibi no Nekamata is your assignment. Besides, you frequently whine about my interference in your ritual. I am only heeding your desires. That's not IT and you know it, asshole. The Nibi's giant flaming paw came down on Kakuzu, crushing him and shattering the wooden floor. You deserve that, you money-grubbing bastard. Uh Uh-oh, Hedon uttered as the two tails turned its attention to him and exhaled a massive fireball. He skipped back through the door and shut it behind him, setting the scythe defensively in front of him. The shrine exploded, sending Hedon skidding a fair distance backwards, his weapon's blood-red tip scoring the ground. Hey, I might be in some trouble here. Oi, Kakuzu. Get up. You couldn't have died that easily. Sutan, Bakasuishoha. A wave of water taller than the Nibi crashed into the bijou from the direction of the temple. Amidst the evaporating hisses of the ninjutsu against the cat's flaming chakra, the sound of the bijou yowling in surprise could be heard. I was going to leave the challenge of subduing the Jinchuriki in your less than capable hands and enjoy observing the outcome, Kakuzu intoned, irritation clear in his voice, but this situation calls for a more refined hand than you are capable of. Although the mercenary's cloak was rumpled and possessed several rips and scorch marks courtesy of the Nibi, a quick activation of the earth spear technique had saved him from any real harm. 
I could take this thing, boasted he don, but you're just gonna fight it cause it stomped all over your ass. Your mindless posturing is aggravating me. Shut up before I kill you. TCH, like you could. He don ducked to avoid a swing from the Nibi's paw which would have decapitated him. Whatever, let's just get this over with already. Says the one who requires assistance. Kakuzu raised a wall of water to intercept a series of flaming, rat-shaped projectiles. He immediately turned the liquid into an offensive form, activating another sudan, Bukaswi Shoha to draw the Nibi's attention to himself. Hurry up and make yourself useful. Hidan finished disconnecting the lower two blades of his scythe and overlaid them upon the largest one. Now the blood-red curves were stacked from largest to smallest at the end of his weapon, creating a thicker, single blade. He twirled the scythe experimentally as large earthen walls rose up to box in the Nibi. There were very few situations where this form of his patented weapon was useful, but it would come in handy here. Now that I'm prepared, I'll show your wrinkly ass the power Jashin Sama grants to his most faithful. Your god should give you powers that take less preparation time. The Nibi broke free of its confines, sending masses of earth flying in all directions. Kakuzu, expecting something like that to happen, was ready with his arms crossed in front of his face and the earth spear technique active. He grunted as two flaming paws crushed him in their grasp. Hidan laughed. Maybe you should have powers that don't suck. Kakuzu spat a sutin, Mijarapa into the giant cat's face, causing it to screech in anger and release him. Maybe you should do something to prove you have some worth, he growled at his partner. Fine, fine, I'll save your worthless ass. The silver-haired man jumped into the air and swiped at one of the bijou's writhing tails with his scythe. A yowl split the air as the single blade of Hedon's weapon sliced through the appendage. In its triple-bladed form, the Jashinus scythe was designed for drawing blood from a human opponent. However, the scythe had been crafted with a number of tricks for a handful of more unusual situations. By combining the blades into a single, stacked form, the weapon was capable of cutting through chakra as easily as it normally cut through flesh. Indeed, a small piece of fiery, blue and black chakra flickered on the tip of the curved blade. Hidan landed on the ground and brought the scythe to his mouth, swallowing the Nibi's chakra. The skeletal outline of his cursed form appeared as his skin turned pitch black. This was too easy, he cried gleefully. Jashi Nasama, accept this sacrifice in. Hidan, Kakuzu snapped, hands flying through seals. The bijou had turned its attention to the Jashinist, but Kakuzu's chakra forced the water from his previous attacks to rise up in a geyser and douse the fiery feline before it could maul his partner. You talk far too much. Quit wasting time and use your damn ritual before I leave you to fend for yourself. Words I never thought I would speak. As Hidan withdrew his retractable pike and stabbed himself to get the blood required for his ritual, Kakuzu unbuttoned his cloak and threw it far to the side. He would need to run interference to keep his partner from becoming the Bijou's target, a position he could fulfill much easier with more adversaries for the Nibi to fight. With a thought, the Futon and Raten hearts were extruded from his back and went to work firing their respective elements at the cat. While Kakuzu kept the feline distracted, Hidan was busy forming the Jashinus symbol on the ground. Against his normal opponents, the silver-haired man would target bodily locales that would hinder movement, cause copious amounts of pain, or were immediately fatal. With chakra serving as a stand-in for blood, the cursed ritual didn't cause pain, but instead released the opponent's chakra from whatever point Hidan hit. It was a rather useful ability against a creature made up entirely of chakra. The ritual complete, Hidan spun his pike between his fingers and then stabbed into his thigh, avoiding the bone. In front of him, the Nibi screeched as the chakra composing its hind leg dispersed into the air temporarily, causing it to collapse. Hidan laughed maniacally as his partner took advantage of the Bijou's weakness and fired a water-slash-lightning combination attack at the cat. He stabbed into the other leg as the Nibi climbed to its feet. It took several minutes of constant self-mutilation for the Bijou's form to shrink as its chakra was siphoned away, leaving only the panting Yugido in its place. Despite her exhaustion, her nails sharpened into Long's claws and she turned to stalk towards Hidan. Kakuzu's body flickered behind her and caught her in the water prison technique. Unable to face her captor, she glowered hatefully at Hidan. I would prefer to not hold this jutsu for an extended period of time, Kakuzu stated dryly as his wind and lightning hearts returned to his body. Ah, quit your bitchin', Kakuzu. Hidan plunged the pike through his stomach until it poked through his back. Inside the sphere of water, Yugito collapsed as the rest of her chakra reserves left her body. It is done, Kakuzu observed, releasing the ninjutsu and allowing the girl's body to hit the ground. Now we can move on to more important, what are you doing? Hidan twisted his head to glare at his partner from his flat position on the ground. 
I must beg for Jashin Sama's forgiveness for leaving the bitch alive. You should consider repenting for all of your godless money hunts. Kakuzu stared at Hidan as if he had gone insane, which, for Hidan, probably wasn't too far off the truth. I will do no such thing. Hidan, engaged in his prayers, didn't respond. The former Taki Nin released a long-suffering sigh and sat down on a nearby rock. He would contact Pain through the rings and report their successful capture of the Nibijin Churiki, and then he would plan their next course of action. Hidan released a long moan of what Kakuzu presumed to be pleasure. Maybe he should attack a temple next, to vent his frustration with religion? The fire temple was said to be run by a monk formerly of the Twelve Ninja Guardians. He would be worth a hefty fare, and would hopefully provide an interesting challenge in combat. Decision made, he prepared to send a mental missive to Akatsuki's leader, but then paused. He was going to attack a temple and kill a monk. A ninja monk, but a monk nonetheless. There was no question about it. He was definitely going to hell. Chapter 15, Loss How Long Does It Take To Get To This Fucking Place Anyway? You'd think it wouldn't take so long to get there. Hidan, Kakuzu ground out through gritted teeth, shut up. A, hey, bite me, you old bastard. One would think you would be more grateful for this opportunity to, spread your religion, to a sect of non-believers. Why do you continue to whine? They will learn of Jashin Sama's greatness through the pleasure that will be our shared pain. Annoying zealot, Kakuzu muttered as Hidan continued to blather on about heathens and repentance. We've been walking for three weeks. Are you sure we're going the right way? Your senile mind probably forgot which way we're supposed to be go, hey? Faster than Hidan could react, Kakuzu had spun around and launched a blade of wind at the silver-haired man. His left arm now lay on the ground, blood dripping from the gaping wound in his shoulder. That hurt, asshole. Kakuzu looked away and continued walking through the land of fire's woods, ignoring the plethora of epithets Hidan screamed at him. While the other man's voice was grating to listen to even in the best of moods, the mercenary always felt a little better by venting his temper on a shorter partner. Besides, it wasn't like the Jashinist didn't deserve whatever Kakuzu did to him. After figuring out how to mentally contact Pain and inform him of their successful capture of the Nibi Jinchuriki, Kakuzu had queried into their next set of instructions. He had been told that Zetsu would be along shortly to retrieve the girl, but that the ceiling would have to wait until Sasori and Datara finished investigating a lead into a sea monster in the land of the sea. Kakuzu had then notified Pain of his plans regarding the high bounty at the Fire Temple, and after Zetsu had appeared to take away the Jinchuriki, he had lured Hidan on the quest with the promise of a religious massacre. Put this damn thing back on, and, Kakuzu, are you listening to me? That was assuming, of course, that Kakuzu didn't magically find a way to just kill Hidan before they got to their destination. Your pathetic bitching is so loud that I would not be surprised to find a group of Kirigakuras Oinen listening to you, Kakuzu retorted. If you would just be quiet for the first time in your life, I will reattach your arm. Hidan grumbled a low string of curses directed at his partner, but Kakuzu found them easy to tune out. Getting out of the land of lightning and into the land of fire had taken a little over two weeks, during which Hidan had, quite predictably, complained virtually the entire time, and traversing the forest to where the fire temple was located had filled the rest of the time. Kakuzu released a quiet sigh. He missed the days of traveling to kill people all by himself. After a short time, the pair walked through a break in the trees to find a winding trail leading up a mountain. The dirt path turned into a wide staircase that begged entrance to an impressive set of metal double doors, statues of demonic figures guarding the temple. Kakuzu gazed up at the structure before them, analyzing it, before turning to Hidan and holding out his hand. Your arm, he intoned, a tinge of regret in his voice, that had been the most peaceful journey he'd had with Hidan since the beginning of their partnership. Ha, I knew you'd see things my way. Kakuzu held the severed limb up to Hidan's shoulder and allowed a tendril of Jung to stitch the body part back in place. Do not get the wrong idea. I could quite easily leave you behind in this venture, but perhaps appeasing your insufferable habits will stave off the rather aggravating sound of your whining for a time, he stated pointedly. Hidan rotated the newly reattached arm in its socket. TCH, you just don't want to admit that you need me. Hardly, Kakuzu deadpanned. They walked up the stairs, Hidan boasting of his skills while Kakuzu ignored him. When the duo reached the top, the mercenary said, before you start your bloodbath, remember that the head monk should remain recognizable. I want to collect the price on his head. Hidan stared at the giant double doors. Yeah, yeah, whatever. So how do we get in so I can begin offering my prayers to Jashin Sama? I don't think they're just gonna open these giant-ass doors. Kakuzu's fist darkened and hardened as he activated Doden, Domo. 
we create our own opening. With a single punch, the fire temple's renowned sealed iron wall dented and broke, blasting off its hinges. Then hell rained upon the monks of the fire temple. LLL. Donzo was not pleased. Considering how well his tenure as the god I'm Hokage had gone thus far, he was probably overdue for something to go wrong, that didn't mean he had to sit back and accept it though. Things following the invasion of the sand and sound had fallen into place surprisingly smoothly. Donzo had tightened a noose around Sunagakur as punishment for their part in the invasion, forcing them to make reparations for any damages incurred despite their decreased economy. The discoveries of the Yondaime Kazekage's death and the Aichibi Jinchuriki's disappearance had further weakened the hidden sand's stability and strength. There had been some political backlash when the bodies of the Kazekage's children, Tamari and Konkuro, had been found in the forest just outside Konoha's walls, but as there was no proof that the hidden leaf had had anything to do with them, and in fact, had had no part in it, the matter had eventually passed over. Sunagakur was now reliant upon Kanahagakur for its continued survival. The wind daimyo's outsourcing of missions combined with the sand's lack of leadership had placed them on the brink of civil war. While the hidden sand retained its title as one of the five great shinobi nations, it was really more a subsidiary of the hidden leaf, one which Donzo kept a wary eye on. Even if Suno was weakened, such a situation only made its shinobi more desperate, and desperate people did desperate things. Donzo wouldn't put it past some of the more ambitious ones to try something against Konoha in retaliation. Granted, given that the invasion of Konoha had been the Hidden Sound's idea, something that had been revealed after much interrogation, and therefore Rochimaru's, Donzo highly doubted Suna would try anything, but it was better to be prepared for the unlikely than to be caught by surprise. Donzo's goal of uniting the world under Konoha's banner seemed one step closer to reality with Suna under his thumb. Information on Otto had been rather scarce for over a year. Orochimaru had been a nonentity for close to 15 months, ever since the invasion had ended, and given his close dealings with the snake Sanin in the past, Donzo was used to knowing the man's movements. He was tempted to deduce that the renegade Sanin was dead, but knowledge of the man's resilience tempered the impulse to declare it definite. Still, lack of contact with the hidden sound, as well as the disappearance of several of his liaisons sent there, pointed to the fact that Orochimaru was not the one running the, main, village. That was worrisome, but Donzo was unwilling to spend the resources to conduct a raid of the place at the time. Especially with the situation now presenting itself. The fire temple has been attacked? He affirmed. Yes, conceded the monk kneeling before him. I had just returned from guard duty when two men wearing black cloaks with red clouds departed with Kairiku-sama in hand. The temple was in ruins. Akatsuki. Given that the land of fire had no Jinchuriki, Tenzo's monthly reports were less than fruitful on that front. Donzo could only assume that the criminal organization was collecting bounties, information he had gleaned from Orochimaru during his tenure as a member. Kairiku was a former member of the Twelve Guardian Ninja and was likely worth a fair amount. Fetch me Sarutobi Asuma, he commanded to the Anbu hidden in the room. Fifteen minutes later found the bearded Jonin standing in front of the Hokage, his usual cigarette absent. You wish to see me, Hokage-sama? Yes. What is the price on Kairiku of the Fire Temple's head? Asuma looked taken aback, but he rallied himself and replied, 30 million Rio. His eyes narrowed in suspicion. Why? Donzo stared the man down, trying to decide the benefit to telling him, if one existed. Finally, he said, the fire temple was attacked by a group known as Akatsuki. Kairiku has been taken, intelligence would suggest that it is because of the price on his head. The Hokage turned his attention to the monk still kneeling on the floor. I will send out a team to assist at the temple, as well as one to track the attackers. The monk bowed his head. Thank you. Then he left. Asuma immediately leveled the Hokage with a serious look. Hokage-sama, I would like to take my team to follow the trail this Akatsuki left. Your team, Sarutobi, does not have the necessary mission experience to take on this assignment, Donzo informed him. In addition, there are Jonin better equipped to track than you. Your request is denied. Asuma's fist slammed down on the Hokage's desk. If what you said is true, then we know exactly where they're headed, he stated angrily. There's an exchange point close to the fire temple. If they're after high bounties, I'll be good bait, my head is worth 35 million Rio. Donzo kept his expression carefully blank as his clever mind finalized the manipulations it had started by telling the man about his friend. Asuma was clearly emotional, which was a dangerous mindset for any shinobi. However, he was also a very talented jonin, not to mention the last surviving member of the former Twelve Guardian Ninja, and sadly enough, expendable if things went wrong. You understand the danger you are putting yourself in. 
Asuma nodded, and Donzo continued, very well. You will follow Akatsuki and gather intelligence, but Team 10 will not accompany you. Do not engage unless you have a clear opportunity to incapacitate them. I would like to request that Nara Shikamaru accompany me on this mission as part of my team. His abilities are well suited to analyzing a situation and collecting data based on even minute details. The older man considered his underling's request. Shikamaru had proven himself a genius tactician, and had frustratingly remained out of Danzo's reach for recruitment into Root. In tandem with Asuma, the Nara would prove to be a powerful asset in the field, and perhaps an opportunity would present itself to finally make him join Root. I will allow this. However, your remaining two teammates will be my choice. They will meet you at the gates in an hour. Asuma bowed and departed, leaving Donzo alone with his machinations. He didn't trust Asuma to not overstep the bounds of the mission parameters, but with any luck, the outcome would work to his advantage. If things went south, his two operatives would keep to the mission parameters. Sai and Shino possess skills that would be beneficial for the assigned tasks of tracking and intelligence gathering. The artist's skill was only a couple steps below Asuma's, and the Abarame had proven himself adept in field assignments after taking well to Root's program. Plus, since both had graduated with Shikamaru, even if Sai had been undercover, they would act as effective double agents to keep the mission on track and to report the slightest mishap back their leader, him. Yes, Donzo would get what he wanted from this mission, one way or the other. LLL. Fwa. Kakuzu glanced behind to find Hidan holding his nose and gagging. He shifted the corpse of the head monk that was slung lazily over his right shoulder. Problem? This place fucking reeks. It is a bathroom, Kakuzu informed him in a tone that implied his explanation was unnecessary. He knocked on the wall between two urinals as Hidan continued to choke on the stench in an exaggerated fashion. You must be too damn old to smell anything anymore. I'll wait outside while you commit your blasphemous acts. Kakuzu watched him leave the exchange point, grateful for the brief reprieve from his partner. Ah, Kakuzu, spoke the voice of Zanjiai, sounding mildly surprised. The mercenary turned his green eyes to the bounty exchange master. This is quite a surprise. It's been some time. I have been preoccupied with other responsibilities. Zanjiai nodded and opened the door to allow the taller man access. Then this is a strange coincidence. The bounty exchange master stepped aside, allowing Kakuzu full scope of the dark room. Standing by an open cabinet for holding corpses were two figures, one with spiky blonde hair, the other with short mint green. Kakuzu smirked. Well, well, greetings, brats. The pair of Jinchuriki looked up at the sound of Kakuzu's voice. Even in the dim light of the exchange station, the mercenary could see the widening of his blonde pupil's blue eyes. His mouth gaped like a fish's before he found himself able to exclaim, Holy shit! Kakuzu, you're alive! You sound surprised, returned the former Taki Nin dryly. Rather, I believe I should be the one reflecting such sentiment. And yet, you're not, Fu said. No. Same old Kakuzu, Naruto muttered. Hey, where's Hidan? Killed him already? Kakuzu snorted. If only it was so easy. No, he decided to remain outside. His god approves of killing but not reaping the benefits of doing so. He rolled his eyes. The stupidity of such a dogma is truly astounding. Green eyes narrowed at the two Jinchuriki as Kakuzu placed Kairiku's body in a drawer Zanjiai opened. I must admit, I am curious as to what the two of you have been up to. Naruto shrugged as Zanjiai flipped through a bingo book to check the identity of Kairiku. We made a deal with Payne to do some bounty hunting for him. In return, we get to stay alive. For now. For now, Naruto echoed. So, we've been going around the world and capturing bounties to fund Akatsuki. Kakuzu turned his gaze to the body his two disciples stood around. Weaklings, by the look of it, he observed, scorn coloring his voice. That man is a chunin from Sunagakur, hardly a worthwhile target. Maybe someone should have trained us to be able to take on people with more skill. We get by with what we can, Fu interjected, placing a placating hand upon Naruto's arm. For now, it's enough. Humph. Your standards are lower than they should be. Before Naruto could retort, Zanjiai stepped forward with a briefcase and said, it's definitely Kairiku of the Fire Temple. An impressive catch, Kakuzu. Here's your payment. Kakuzu thumbed through the money with the ease of practice. With any luck, I will return within a shorter time frame than this last excursion, he informed Zanjiai, closing the briefcase. He swung the case over his shoulder and began to head for the exit. It should not be too hard to trick Hidan into killing a handful of high-level targets. 
his religion might finally be useful for something. Kakuzu. The bounty hunter stopped at Naruto's voice, but remained turned away. It was good to see you again, admitted the blonde. Stay alive, brats, he intoned, walking out of the exchange point. LLL. Stupid Kakuzu and his damn money obsession, Hidan grumbled. The silver-haired man was currently seated on the steps in front of the bounty exchange station, waiting for his partner to leave what he considered to be a stink hole. We never take side missions to just kill people for Jashin Sama, no. They have to be worth something. Money is what makes the world work, he said, pitching his voice deeper to mimic his partner. Bah, the fuck does he know? The former Yunin made to stand, but found himself unable to move. Hey! What gives? A long blade of chakra came level with his chest. You're going to tell me everything I want to know about Akatsuki, demanded a bearded man whose height topped Kakuzu's, starting with where your partner is. Hidan's purple eyes focused on the sash around the man's waist, the same sash the monk he had killed had worn. Damn, he swore, completely ignoring the man's question, now Kakuzu's gonna want to stay to hand in your ass, too. The chakra blade thrummed violently and extended, piercing the Nukunin's skin. Two? Where's Kairiku? The bald monk? He was a sacrifice to Jashin Sama's great will. Just like you'll be. The blade doubled in length and pierced Hidan's heart. I don't think so. Letting Hidan collapse on the stairs, the chakra faded from around the man's trench knives as he turned and walked away. We'll wait for the second one to come out and capture him. From his supine position, Hidan noticed a thick rope of shadow disconnect from his own, the ability to move returning to him. His hand grasped the handle of his scythe and flung it at the bearded man, a mad cackle escaping his lips. There was a shout of Asuma Sensei. And the man spun around, deflecting the scythe with his trench knives. How are you still alive? Asuma demanded. Jashin Sama rewards those who are faithful to him with great gifts, shouted Hidan, yanking on his weapon's metal coil and bringing it within his grasp once again. He moved to attack, but his periphery caught the movement of a shadow, and he dodged left to avoid it. Then a horde of insects descended upon him, and Hidan swung at them uselessly with his scythe. Gah! Where the fuck did all these bugs come from? That was when Kakuzu stepped out from within the bathroom's shadows. He took in the sight of Hidan flailing around like an idiot, a strip of shadow angling towards him from the roof, and the tall form of a Konoha Jonin before sighing. I see your propensity for attracting trouble has struck again, Hidan. Shut up, asshole. Although, Kakuzu continued, green eyes focusing on the sash around the Jonin's waist, it seems you lured in quite a big fish. Your religion will finally serve some usefulness. Sarutobi Asuma, one of Kanahagakura's elite Jonin and a former member of the Twelve Guardian Ninja. How fortuitous, to come across a second member so soon after delivering the first. I will enjoy cashing in your head for the 35 million it is worth. Asuma readied his trench knives, the blue chakra of his flying swallow fighting style forming along the blades. Hidan, rather predictably, thought Kakuzu, decided to interrupt the moment. Kakuzu, this is my fight. Stay out of it, you bastard. The bounty hunter stared at the scene before him. Sarutobi Asuma, an Abarame, a Nara. Intelligent green eyes flickered over the tree line, where he could detect a fourth, muted chakra signature. Try not to lose your head, he acquiesced, bored. Oh, he continued, almost as an afterthought, and you should be aware of. A trio of ink beasts, vaguely lion-like in appearance, Kakuzu noticed, erupted from the foliage and assaulted Hidan while he was distracted by the insect swarm. The fourth shinobi, he finished idly. Kakuzu, you unhelpful bastard. The former Taki Nin paid only half a mind to his partner screaming and flailing. It had actually been quite, gratifying, to see his two wayward pupils. Both had grown in the more than a year that they had been apart, filling out as their bodies transitioned from prepubescence to teenaged. They were still young, and the effects were gradual, but Kakuzu figured that given some more years, Naruto at least would strike an imposing and powerful figure similar to his father. Fu would probably always remain slight physically, but there were advantages for a Kunoichi to be built as such. Emotionally, Kakuzu couldn't decipher from their brief contact if anything had changed. Naruto still seemed brash, but given how, intentionally, antagonistic their relationship was, such a reaction was probably more of a reflection of Kakuzu's presence than the boy's mental state. Fu, at least, appeared to have retained a level head, not to mention a rather simplistic method for calming her fellow Jinchuriki. The Nukunin wasn't sure how to feel about such a relationship between the two, if Naruto was even aware of it, but their performance seemed unaffected, so he let the thought slide for the time being. 
there wasn't anything he could really do about it, anyway. Their interaction had done nothing to show Kakuzu what sort of skills the two Jinchuriki had picked up during their separation, though the fact that they were bounty hunting, no matter the skill level of their opponents, boded well for what they had learned on the job. The fact that neither was dead, well, considering how badly a vast majority of shinobi outclassed them, Jinchuriki status or not, it was definitely an impressive feat. Perhaps just as impressive was the knowledge that Payne had listened to his suggestion, and then agreed to it. Granted, there was sure to come a time when Naruto and Fu would be more useful as sacrifices than bounty hunters, but until then, the two Jinchuriki could hone their abilities. There was a minuscule part of him that almost regretted not properly overseeing their training up until their separation, at least, not in the capacity that a normal tutor would have, anyways. Not that he was the epitome of a normal tutor in any sense, but he certainly could have done more than he did. The fend-for-yourself ideology worked to a point, he was a good example, but he had also escaped his village at the age of 20, giving him plenty of time to work on his abilities in a somewhat safe environment beforehand. Naruto had not had such a luxury, given that there was no one but Kakuzu to practice with and he had tried to distance himself from the blonde's training as much as possible. Of course, Kakuzu had also thought he had plenty of time to sadistically train-slash-guide-slash-torture the blonde into a fighting fit shinobi. Being blackmailed by and joining Akatsuki so unexpectedly had essentially foiled those ideas, resulting in Naruto's training being cut short. It would be such a waste to put so much effort into that brat, only to have him die. The former Takinin wondered if there was a way to guide the boy without being particularly obvious about it. Kakuzu, bring me my body. The ex-waterfall shinobi's musings were cut short by Hidan, of course. I told you not to lose your head. Very funny, asshole. Are you gonna help me or not? Hmm, I suppose. Perhaps I should start charging you for my services. Asuma, badly burnt and kneeling on the ground, groaned. Shino, Sai, Shikamaru, keep your distance, but try to restrain the tall guy. Kakuzu watched blankly as a swarm of insects emerged from the Abarame's coat and a pride of lions leapt from the artist's scroll. He casually exhaled a fireball at the bugs, incinerating them on contact, then commanded Jung's threads to shoot out from his forearms and rend the ink creations to splotches. Jumping around the shadow streaking towards him on the ground, the S-class shinobi extended his arm to pick up his partner's head and landed next to his body. Without any effort, he lifted Hidan's form and held the man's severed head up to his neck. Suddenly, he felt his own body stiffen, and he glanced over to find the Nara on one knee, hands together in the rat seal and panting hard. The fact that you think you can hold me in your current state is laughable, he commented. He flared his chakra, sending the Nara reeling and forcibly breaking the shadow bind technique. One of his threads slithered out and reattached Tidon's head. You can finish off the cash cow while I take care of the others. Ha ha, fine by me. Hedon split from his partner, hurling his scythe at Asuma and surreptitiously positioning himself in his curse symbol. Kakuzu watched his two opponents, the Nara appeared to be incapacitated by chakra exhaustion, with a bored expression. Feeling something wrap around his legs and crawling up his torso, he looked down to find ink snakes slithering around his body. He hardened his skin, boosting his strength, and flexed, splattering the reptilian constructs. Your antics are no longer amusing. Kakuzu pushed a solid wall of air at the two boys, one collapsing into ink, the other dispersing into the Abarame's kikaiku. Clever, but it will not be enough. His arm extended into the bushes and grabbed the Abarame by the throat. As the bounty hunter reeled in his capture, his green eyes scanned the area. Should you not rescue your associate? He goaded blandly, waiting for the artist to show himself. Hidan's insane laughter split the air, followed by the Nara scream of Asuma. Kakuzu looked over to find the Jonin face down in the dirt, blood seeping into the earth. HN, he did something right, for once. Hey, Kakuzu, aren't you done yet? Can I kill the rest? Do what you will, he snapped the boy's neck, but he just dissolved into bugs again and swarmed Kakuzu from head to foot, trying to suck out his chakra. Annoying gnats. Katan. Hidan, Kakuzu, it is time. Son of a bitch. We were just getting to the good part. Hidan, shut up. It is imperative that we follow our orders. Sasori and Data Adventure to find the Sanbi was unsuccessful. We will seal the Nibi now. Find some place to hold up for the three days it will take. We will be there shortly, Kakuzu affirmed, threads creeping out from his skin to disperse the Kikaiku. Green eyes shifted to spy Naruto and Fu exiting the bounty exchange station. Brat, pick up the prize, he ordered. Naruto appeared startled at being addressed, let alone finding Kakuzu still in the vicinity, blue eyes taking in the scenario spread out before him. 
Come, Hedon, let us depart. Fine, but we're coming back to continue the sacrifice. Then both were gone in a sunshine. Naruto quickly assimilated the lay of the land. That's Sarutobi Asuma from Konoha, he pointed out, and I recognize those guys from the Chunin exams. Sai, Shino, come on, shouted the boy with a pineapple style hairdo. We've got to get Asuma sensei back to Konoha. Naruto and Fu leapt to surround the down Jonin. Oh, I'm afraid I can't let you do that, announced the blonde. See, he's worth a fair amount to us, he continued genially, before his eyes hardened like diamonds, and we would be remiss to let him just, escape. A flock of ink birds erupted from the forest as a stream of bugs buzzed towards the pair. Fu spat globs of mud at the incoming insects, catching them and weighing them down. Naruto performed hand signs and expelled a volley of condensed wind chakra bursts. Futan, Shinkigyoku, he stated, the spray of air bullets piercing through the ink flock. While Sai bombarded the duo with ink creatures, Shino came to kneel beside Shikamaru. While tragic, Asuma Teiko's death should not result in the rest of ours. Our chakra is low and these adversaries are fresh. It would not be advisable to attempt recovery of the body considering our present circumstances. Shikamaru gave Shino an angry glare. I'm not going to just leave him here too, un. Sai looked at his fellow root member, hand reaching for his ink brush after knocking out the Nara. He created a large ink bird and helped Shino lift Shikamaru onto it. Danzo Sama has plans for the Nara. It is important that we bring him back alive. Shino nodded and Sai instructed the creature to take off. Naruto and Fu watched them go. Should we? Fu tried. Go after them? No. They're not worth anything right now. Naruto's gaze went to the body of the bearded Jonin they had protected. A shiver went through him, an ominous feeling of unease racking his body. Ignoring it, he looked at Fu. Let's turn this one in and get back on the road. LLL. Danzo sat behind his desk, hands folded on top of it. Sai, Shino, and Shikamaru knelt before him, having just finished relaying the outcome of their mission to him. The latter looked emotionally disturbed, unsurprising considering the news Danzo had just been delivered. Konoha will mourn the loss of one of its most talented and loyal shinobi, he stated. Sarutobi Asuma's name will be inscribed upon the memorial stone for his service to the village. You are all dismissed. Sai and Shino left with respectful inclines of their heads, but Shikamaru remained behind, rising to his feet and staring with intense ferocity at Danzo. The Hokage met his expression with a flat, emotionless look. Something you require, Nara? I want to know what you plan to do about this threat, Shikamaru demanded, voice even but laced with frigid politeness. These two Akatsuki assaulted and killed a Konoha shinobi within the Land of Fire's borders. You can't simply let this action slide. Nor do I plan to. However, I fail to see what my retaliatory plans have to do with you. I want to be included in them. Danzo leveled the Chunin with a predatory look. Your teacher said the same thing before he left on the mission which killed him. I have long held the belief that emotions only lead to bad decisions and sloppy results. What makes you think that I'll permit you, a mere Chunin, to allow your desire for vengeance to get you killed? Shikamaru placed his hands on the edge of the Hokaye's desk and leaned forward so he could look the elderly man directed in his eye because I know how to neutralize Hedon. You need me. Shino and Sai are good observers, but they can only tell you what they saw. But defeating an enemy requires keen analysis of their speech patterns, movements, tactics, and so on. Danzo passed the boy over with a shrewd eye. And you did that? Shikamaru said nothing. The Hokage leaned back in his chair, lacing his fingers together. Shikamaru was smart and stubborn, and far more useful to him as an ally rather than an enemy. Even if was emotionally compromised, he had a much better idea of what he would be up against than Asuma had. In all honesty, the elderly man had foreseen this outcome as a possibility, even likely. The loss of Asuma was tragic, but the man was also one of Shikamaru's closest associates, not to mention his teacher. In order to bait the Nara, something truly terrible would have had to happen to make him blind to the Hokaye's machinations. This has played almost perfectly into my hand. Just one more step. When you return from this mission, he began slowly, you will become a member of my Anbu. The Chunin didn't even hesitate. Fine. Danzo allowed a crooked smirk to cross his lips for the barest of seconds. And so the last fly comes into my web. Before you dissect every facet of the target's abilities, I would like to bring someone in to hear what you have to say. Tarai, he barked, and a cloaked Anbu dropped from the ceiling, find me Inu. Ten minutes later, an Anbu in standard uniform, silver hair defying gravity over a dog mask, 
appeared in the room. After the death of Uchiha Sasuke, the promotion of Sai to Chunin, and Haruno Sakura's return to civilian status, normal people really weren't cut to become the ideal shinobi, Hatake Kakashi had rejoined Anbu and almost immediately had been granted the title of Anbu captain. Danzo had been slightly disappointed that he couldn't rope the man into joining Root, but having him under his thumb as the Hokaye's personal soldier was good enough. Inu, you'll be leading an assault team on the two targets Nara here is going to describe. He will also be a part of the team. Kakashi nodded, which Shikamaru took as his cue to speak. The shorter one is a man named Hidan. He wields a large triple-bladed scythe attached to a long metal coil, and has at least one retractable pike. His main ability seems to be some form of immortality that makes him immune to what I can only assume is all forms of physical trauma. Danzo raised an eyebrow. You assume? He took a lethal blow to the heart and was able to talk during and recover from a decapitation, though his body retains no autonomous movement during that time. While other forms of trauma were not attempted, surviving those extremes seems to suggest that any other method would also be moot. Hidan uses his immortality and a curse ritual to link the wounds his body takes to that of an adversary whose blood he has taken. However, the ritual is limited by a symbol he draws on the ground to complete it. Removing him from the symbol nullifies the link between him and the target, provided he remains away from it. You said he can survive decapitation, Donzo prompted, but your phrasing would indicate that he is incapable of recovering from such a debilitating injury on his own. Yes. His partner is tall man he called Kakuzu. He was able to reattach Hidan's head to his body through black threads that also grant him the ability to extend his limbs to great lengths. In addition, he displayed an affinity for both Katan and Futan Chakra natures, though the extent of his mastery of those elements is indeterminable based solely upon my observations. Akatsuki is an organization comprised of S-class criminals, Donzo revealed. I would expect his mastery of the elements to be as complete as yours, Inu, potentially greater. You said you had a plan? He asked returning his attention to Shikamaru. From my observations, I believe I can neutralize Hidan, provided his partner is kept occupied. Very well. Inu, you will lead a team to find and intercept these Akatsuki members. When you find them, eliminate them. Yes, Hokage-sama. LLL. Kakuzu stood up slowly and cracked his spine. Sitting around for long periods of time didn't agree well with his advanced age, no matter how fit he was. Replacing organs was one thing. Bones were an entirely different matter. Beside him, Hidan rose and rubbed a hand across the back of his neck, rolling it around to stretch the muscles. Man, sitting around for three days doing nothing sucks, complained the silver-haired man. Why is that ritual take so damn long? The taller shinobi tossed him a flat look. You have no room to talk, Hidan, he deadpanned. Only five seconds to start bitching, it must be a new record. A, hey, fuck off, Kakuzu. If I don't offer my respect to Jashin Sama, I might become a damn atheist like you. There are worse fates. I believe it would be an improvement over your current personality. Hey, that really hurts, you know? Besides, you, hey, where are you going? As we are within the land of fire, we might as well begin exploring it for the Rakubi Jinchuriki. What about those bastards at the Bounty Exchange Station? They were ripe and prepared to become sacrifices to Jashin Sama. Kakuzu craned his neck to stare at Hidan. You really are an idiot. Why would they stay around there for three days? No, we have our assignment. If we come across any Konoha Nin, you can deal with them. Ha ha. I knew you'd come to see things my way. Now, if you'd give up your blasphemous habit of killing for money, you might have a chance at getting within Jashin Sama's good graces. As Hidan continued to ramble about his god, Kakuzu rolled his eyes. Truly, the cost for appeasing the stupid was a mighty sacrifice. LLL. Joro Senbone. Futan, Repushu. The violent wind palm blasted away the rain of needles descending from several airborne umbrellas. Naruto spat out the wind pellets of a vacuum sphere, riddling the instruments with holes and making them unusable. Anything else? He asked, returning his gaze to the man across from him. His opponent, a somewhat feminine-looking man with teal-colored hair and purple eyes, scowled at him. You think you've got me beat? Ha! Huh. I still haven't used my greatest weapon. He reached behind his back and brought forth what looked to be the hilt of a weapon. Behold! The Raijin no Ken, Naruto finished, bored, the Naidaim Hokaye's great sword. H how do you? Know what it is? Naruto finished, enjoying the panic his prey was experiencing. I wonder if this is how Kakuzu feels whenever he sets his sights on a target. Well, I know everything about you, 
Rokus Ho Aoi. Defected from Konoha after you had your pupil steal the Raijin no Ken, then joined Ame and eventually became a Jonin. Kinda pathetic, all things considered, having a Jinan steal a precious artifact in your place. The rest of your past is rather mundane. It doesn't matter, Aoi professed. You're still going to die here. Naruto cocked his head to the side curiously. Oh? That's interesting. I admit that I was a bit surprised to find you in the land of fire, but since you're here, I think this'll be a good test of my abilities against a former Konoha shinobi. He paused, eyeing the sword, then continued, surprisingly, Konoha is willing to pay more for the return of that sword than your body. I'm not one to really help it, but I am rather interested in money. Aoi brought the sword to life, creating a long blade of electricity. Naruto sighed. I guess we do this the hard way, then. Jiung, Soto Fomu, he said, holding out his right hand and letting the threads twine together into a blade. He dove forward as Aoi did the same, the two swords clashing against each other. There was a brief stalemate before the lightning of Aoi's sword pierced the black threads and severed the end of Naruto's makeshift blade. The blonde leapt back and stared at the stub of his weapon. Well, that's problematic. Take this, Aoi shouted, waving his sword and creating an arc of lightning that swept towards Naruto. The blonde held up a palm and blasted away the shockwave with another violent wind palm. I'll kill you. Aha, yawned Naruto, so you said. He ran through a quick string of seals and then held his hands parallel at chest level, palms facing each other, leaving a small space between them. Futan, Kaze Jogo. A strong suction built up, with the space between Naruto's hands serving as the focal point. Aoi could do nothing as his body was pulled into the vortex of the technique, the electricity from the mad swipes of his sword overpowered by wind's elemental superiority to lightning. When the rain jonin was near enough, threads erupted from the sutures on Naruto's forearms and speared into the man's body, the pull of the wind release, wind funnel proving too much for Aoi to escape from. Naruto released the technique, allowing the jonin's body to drop to the ground. Fu jumped down from her perch on a tree bough high above the battlefield. That was impressive, she commended, moving to pick up the hilt of the deactivated Raijin no Ken. She examined it, running a finger over the relic. Are we really going to return this to Konoha? When no response was forthcoming, the Jinchuriki looked over at her companion. Hey, are you okay? Naruto tried to settle the uncomfortable knot of tension thrumming throughout his body, his gaze locked into the distance. Yeah, he responded, almost mechanically, we need the money more than the sword, and it's too precious an antiquity for Konoha to ever use it against us. He turned an unusually serious gaze upon the Nanabi Jinchuriki, the same foreboding feeling from three days ago haunting him. Let's seal the body and get a move on. Something's not right. Fu raised an eyebrow, but did as she was bade. Then they took off, silent as wraiths, destination unknown. LLL. Kakuzu was the very definition of pissed off. He and Hidan had been, well, the closest to being ambushed that Kakuzu could recount in decades. The Nara had led the charge, 19 Anbu agents flanking him. Dodging the boy's cage main no jutsu had been impossible with all of the other people distracting him, but by releasing his hearts to run interference and keeping the earth one for Doden, Domu, Kakuzu had been safe from most offensives. Until hidden Anbu number 20 had shoved Hitake Kakashi's trademark Reikiri through his defense. That had destroyed his earth heart. Somehow, and Kakuzu honestly found he couldn't be overly surprised, given Hidan's stupidity, the Nara had separated the two Akatsuki members, leaving Kakuzu to take on 20 Anbu agents. Given how badly he had been outnumbered, 5 to 1, counting as three thread creatures, the former Taki Nin had kept up quite nicely against Konoha's vaunted elite, though the fact that they could cover each other's weaknesses and blind spots meant that killing them had proven more difficult than he would have expected. He found it a bit unusual that about half of them were garbed in cream cloaks and the others wore standard Anbu outfits, and that the latter ones were more defensive of their comrades than the former ones, but in a battle to the death, such trivialities hardly mattered. They all needed to die, regardless of what they wore or how they acted. Then, a stabbing pain had exploded in his chest. Somehow, somehow, he'd figured, Hedon had cursed him. That had destroyed his water heart. After that, he had recalled all of his hearts in order to protect them. Unfortunately, his opponents had taken advantage of his thread creature's single-mindedness and captured one in a giant earthen construct. It had then been turned into an oven, roasting the autonomous threads to cinders. That had destroyed his wind heart. Now, Kakuzu stood with only his lightning and fire hearts left, both settled within his body. His ultimate form was locked to him, inaccessible since he had last used it to seal Orochimaru. 
The bounty hunter remained motionless, glaring at the overwhelming number of Konoha nin still before him. Cowardly, spineless shinobi of Kanahagakur. To even stand a chance against me, they must amass seemingly insurmountable odds, but I will not fall here. I survived against the most feared shinobi of the ages, Senju Hashirama, these no names will not succeed. It was embarrassing enough that so many had survived as long as they had and were giving him what could only be described as trouble, he was, after all, S rank, and more than worthy of the title. You will all rue the day you came to confront me. Black tendrils ruptured from his back, spreading out and forming thick tentacles twice Kakuzu's height and length. Seven of the thread limbs surrounded him, tendrils connecting them together to create a spider's weave at his back. More thread spilled forth from his mouth, knocking off his head covering and mask, and forming an eighth limb disconnected from the rest. A bushel of tendrils converged to create a stubby tail of sorts at his back. Die, he hissed, and the limbs went forth, giving the bounty hunter the appearance of a twisted octopus grappling for prey. Five limbs dove for targets, two struck the closest two shinobi and skewered them before they could react, one Anbu dodged the third limb, and another cast a kawarimi to escape the fourth, the fifth used a massive tree trunk as a shield, but the thread split and caught him in a pincer attack. Unable to escape, he set his body aflame as Anbu operatives were instructed to do. Kakuzu scowled. In his rage, he'd had a slight oversight regarding the ability to restock his hearts with the ones from the shinobi. Jiang's long-range form sacrificed the extending abilities of his arms and other useful grappling options for brute power and destruction. It was a bit more difficult to control the Kinjutsu's organ-stealing ability with such huge masses of tendrils. The two tentacles that hadn't attacked wound around him protectively, shielding his body from an incoming burst of flames. The bull mask that housed his lightning heart appeared in the center of the web of threads, firing a raton, John straight up. The Konoha Nin trying to attack from above was speared through the side, a clean hit through his liver, he burst into flames a moment later. That was the seventh, thirteen left. He glanced up to find a portal of mud about to dump on him. Jumping, he recalled his limbs and, using them as wings, sailed away from his previous position. Kakuzu landed, the tentacle emerging from his mouth digging into the earth and revealing a shinobi underneath. The threads wrapped around him, burrowing underneath his skin and reaching for his heart. The earth closed with a resounding boom, crushing the ninja before Kakuzu could capitalize on his capture. Green eyes glanced around, irate. Most of the remaining Konoha nin seemed to be garbed in the cream cloaks. You would rather sacrifice your comrade than see him fall into enemy hands. Callous, brutal, intelligent. Three tentacles of his threads lanced back at a shinobi coming in from Kakuzu's blind spot. The Anbu was rent limb from limb, but an invisible force slammed into Kakuzu's back, shattering the bull mask. A skilled enough futon user that his attacks are undetectable, and a complete disregard for his own life. These Anbu are truly dangerous opponents. But I will not be defeated here. Seven tentacles lashed out, seeking the remaining eleven shinobi. I will kill you all and restock my hearts, and then your village will burn, he seethed, completely enraged. One of the tentacles angled at a stockier ninja, but the man's hands grew to large proportions and caught the threads within his grasp. Kakuzu sent a second tentacle at him, but he caught it with his other hand. The tendrils wriggled in his grip, driving into his hands and drawing blood, but the Anbu held on. A third tentacle rushed to spear him through the stomach, but another Anbu stepped forward and spun, creating a dome of chakra Kakuzu recognized as the Hugus Kaiden. Kakuzu glanced around to find more of his thread limbs being restrained. A fourth had a loop of shadow wrapped around it, restraining it. Another was being held at bay by two Anbu shooting bursts of fire and wind in tandem, and a sixth was being boxed in by continuously thicker walls of earth. The Nuknin growled, but was momentarily caught off guard by a shinobi appearing directly in front of him, hands flashing through seals. His last mass of threads, the one from his mouth, lashed out and wound around the ninja, reaching for his heart. He disappeared, an illusion in the wind. A distraction. Kakuzu realized, craning around to find the dog-masked Anbu he suspected was Hitake Kakashi a mere foot away, hand crackling with lightning. The bushel of tendrils comprising his tail speared into the man. Then, there was pain as the Anbu took on a blue sheen and discharged electricity throughout Kakuzu's entire body, Jiang's tendrils acting as a conduit. A raten cage bunshine. Paralyzed, the bounty hunter could only watch as the real Kakashi popped up from the ground, hand alight in the lightning cutter. So this is how it ends, he thought as the Reikiri pierced his chest, beaten by mere children. Kakuzu felt surprisingly at peace as his body jerked, the fire heart failing him. As his awareness of what was happening around him dimmed, his green eyes scanned the area, landing on a head of blonde hair on the outskirts of the dead forest. Perhaps, 
my legacy, will finish, what I have started. Naruto. Kakuzu's body hit the ground, and he thought no more. LLL. Naruto led Fu through the land of fire's forest at a fast clip, the leaves present on the trees thinning out significantly as they kept moving forward. He couldn't explain it, but there was an ominous pull in his heart, as if something was about to go horribly wrong. Fu had tried asking what was going on, but the blonde had ignored her, focused instead on pumping chakra to his feet just to get there faster. It was only when the greenery disappeared entirely, to be replaced by the barren skeletons of trees in their decline that he began to actually feel the trouble. Stop, he commanded, taking his own advice and halting on a bow. Fu stopped beside him, her face a mixture of concern, confusion, and patience. Something's going on over there. Circle around and see if you can get a better vantage point. Don't interfere unless it looks like I'm in trouble. Fu looked ready to protest, but she closed her mouth and just nodded. Without a word, she disappeared. Naruto took off right after, the ominous feeling settled firmly in his belly, making everything seem cold despite the sweat beating on his brow from racing through the land of fire. Naruto burst into a clearing full of activity, surprised blue eyes immediately focusing on his teacher. Kakuzu was surrounded by close to a dozen Anbu members, Jiang's threads compacted into eight long limbs which fanned out from his body. With his mask off and one of the thread masses sprouting from his mouth, the blonde became aware of just how terrifying his mentor could be. Just as he began to prepare a jutsu to help the man, an Anbu in a dog mask appeared and shoved his lightning-covered hand into Kakuzu's chest. The Jinchuriki's eyes widened as all the threads surrounding Kakuzu shuddered violently and withdrew into the former Taki Nin's body with a series of sickening slurps. When the mercenary's form could be seen, his green eyes were wide with disbelief, the shock clear on his naked face. He pitched forward suddenly, and then he began to fall. To Naruto, time seemed to slow down to individual microseconds as gravity took hold of his mentor's body. Could Kakuzu be, had he just, been killed? There is no such thing as immortality, Kakuzu informed him one day when he had gotten curious about his teacher's prolonged lifespan, merely methods to inhibit the decline of the human body into death. But Kakuzu couldn't die. He was old, sure, but he was strong and wise in the ways of the world. The most important rule you will ever learn is this, money is everything. The world revolves around money, even hell runs on money. Knew how to survive, knew the tricks of the trade for staying alive in a dangerous environment. My village believed that I did not try hard enough, and punished me for failing in my objective. This blasé disrespect for all of my servitude infuriated and offended me, so I left. I stole Takigakura's most precious treasures, the Kinjutsu Jiang, and the hearts of the village elders, who did not appreciate my service to their precious village. Apparently not well enough. Had taken Naruto in when everyone else had hated and scorned him. I have never done this before, but your ability to heal and withstand my attack is an intriguing one. If you would like, you can come with me, and I will teach you to properly harness this power. Raised him, trained him. You will learn one of my most useful ninjutsu, a move which may come in handy against the Hyuga you are supposed to fight. Given him purpose. I am going to teach you how to engage in the world's oldest profession, killing. You would be nothing without his tutelage. Spurred Naruto to become greater, despite his unsympathetic, detached ways. There is a reason why you are the only other individual to become imbued with Jiang. Endured his very existence. I have tolerated your foolishness far longer than I should have, and this childish wordplay and immaturity will cease immediately. I expect you to act like the ninja I have trained you to be. Clearly he is endowed with far more patience than you thought, considering the effort he put into suffering through your continued presence. And had inspired him to become a great shinobi. And that, Kakuzu stated wickedly, driving the water-cutting sword through his target's heart, is how you overcome an elemental disadvantage. He turned to face Naruto. Do not let the potential fear of a handicap hinder your decision to kill those who are beneath you. You clearly still have a ways to go. Kakuzu had watched over him when he had always thought the man couldn't care less. Did your feeble mind ever consider how we stayed in one location, under the noses of the foolish Konoha Nin you escaped from, without ever running into a single one of them? No one else would want such a task. He was honestly the closest thing Naruto had to a father. And now he is dead, by the hands of Kanahagakur, no less. No. Yes. Embrace your anger. How could Kakuzu die? Naruto. Kakuzu threw his bingo book at the blonde, who caught it with both hands, and then offered the duo a slight incline of his head. Humans are weak creatures, highly susceptible to death. Why? 
Konoha has now taken everything from you. It is time for your vengeance. Vengeance. Kill them all. Kill. Kakuzu's body hit the ground with a muffled thud. The sound seemed to echo ominously in Naruto's ears. From his throat ripped an ear-splitting howl of anguish. Kakuzu uu uu. The last thing Naruto was aware of before blacking out was the dark laughter of a voice inside his head as malevolent chakra violently exploded from his body. Chapter 16, Understanding. Fu bounded through the forest, only partially aware of the increasing density and tree foliage. Per Naruto's instruction, she'd gone around the battle, but had come across a disturbed trail that merited investigation. Hesitantly leaving the blonde to his own devices, as he'd requested, she was still in the process of following the trail when a burst of foul chakra rippled across her skin, causing her to shiver. The Jinchuriki stopped abruptly and whirled around, eyes wide. What, was that? She gasped. Her only response was the Nanabi's grating laughter in her mind. Shaking her head, she returned to her path, trying to focus on the assignment she'd set for herself. She took a deep breath to calm down, thoughts unwillingly roving back to her fellow Jinchuriki and, considering their recent run-in with him, their wayward mentor. It was hard, she realized, to not worry about either of them, even despite the confidence she had in their abilities. Kakuzu was the epitome of a veteran shinobi, having seen almost a century of how the world worked, and gained an equivalent amount of experience. He was well versed in the existence of most, if not all, major clans in Keke Genkai, and his mastery of the five main elemental affinities made him a force to be reckoned with. That wasn't even including the power he was granted by Jiang or the extra lives he possessed. On the other side of the coin, Naruto easily had the most potential of any ninja in their generation. He possessed the same capacity for nature chakra manipulation and resilience that Kakuzu had because of the same kinjutsu running through their bodies. Even beyond that, he was the container of the Kyubi, the strongest of the bijou. His resolve to continue forward in the path Kakuzu had set him on and his growing desire to prove himself capable of following his mentor were impressive and admirable personality traits. Both were the only people who had ever really accepted Fu. If something ever happened to either of them, well, she really wasn't sure what she would do. ZZT ZZT ZZT, chuckled the Nanabi, something already has happened. What do you mean? Fu asked aloud, ignoring the wince of pain that always came with speaking to the Bijou. That chakra burst was the Kyubi breaking free. The Kyubi? Naruto. Fu whirled again, torn by indecision, but then shook her head. No, I need to trust that he'll be okay. Sentimental Cretan. Fu pushed forward, ignoring the words of her prisoner and the apprehension that gripped her heart like an icy claw. Eventually, she entered a small clearing surrounded by lush foliage, in the center was a pit of broken rocks. She moved to stand at its rim, staring down at the rubble. Wonder what's down here. You have company. Fu glanced around to find a herd of deer surrounding her, staring her down. Okay, she drawled, that's new. One of the deer charged her, and Fu immediately ran through hand seals and crouched. Doton, Doriuaki. The stag ran into an earthen wall which rose from the ground to defend the green-haired girl. Three more animals charged her, forcing her to push more chakra into the earth to erect three more barriers, forming a box around the hole in the ground. Now safe from the deer, Fu settled into a more comfortable position and cracked her knuckles. All right, time to get to work. Doton, Doriua. Rocks and earth rose from the pit in a wave and were deposited as far from the hole as possible. Fu continued to excavate the pit with the earth flow wave, digging deeper and deeper, all the while wondering if Naruto was okay. Then an arm emerged with a pile of rubble. Fu blinked. Well, you don't see that every day. She stood up and leaned over the pit, peering into its depths. Far below, buried amidst the rocks and soil, she could spy a head of silver hair, a leg, and copious bloodstains. He done? She hazarded. Who's up there? A pause, then, hey. You're that bitch that was with the blonde and Kakuzu. Get me out of here. What the? She created a number of earth clones and then jumped into the hole, being careful to avoid the body parts strewn about. You look like you've seen better days. Hey, that bastard from Konoha thought his dogma could trump mine, but Jashin Sama always finds a way to reward his faithful followers. You should consider converting too, ow ow ow, be careful. Lifting his head by his silver hair, Fu brought Hidan's purple eyes level with her own and stared at him. You know, I can see why Kakuzu would want to get rid of you. That old bastard doesn't understand the tenets of my faith. Fu yanked on Hidan's hair, causing the Jashinus to emit a yelp of pain. I'd be careful with what you say about Kakuzu in my presence, she stated coldly, 
especially since he's the one who has to sew you back together. Hedon muttered something under his breath, but the green-haired girl merely threw his head out of the pit, Hedon screamed epithets at her the whole while. Hey! She called up, gaining the attention of one of her clones. Finish up here. Bring Hedon to where I am when you're done. Her duplicate nodded in understanding and then Fu was off, traveling underground to avoid the line of sight of the deer. Feeling that she was a safe distance away, she surfaced from the ground and took to the trees, heading towards where she could sense the foul chakra from earlier. All right, start talking, she demanded. Willingly initiating communication with me? Buzzed the Nanabi idly. What an amusing turn of events. Talk, beetle, she growled. Your sense of humor disappears rather quickly when IT comes to the fox's cage. When Fu didn't react, the seven tails hummed disappointedly. As I said, that explosion of chakra was the QB's. Given that the boy has never drawn on that damnable Kitsune's chakra previously, something must have occurred to make him so enraged that he is drawing upon IT subconsciously. It is possible that the fox has some control of the boy's body. So what do we do? The Nanabi's strange laughter echoed in her mind again. We? It is none of my business if the QB influences your infatuation. Intent on trying to come up with a game plan, Fu opted to ignore the Bijou's mocking remark. Don't you hate the QB? Wouldn't you just love the opportunity to rub it in the QB's face that you, the so-called great bringer of dust storms, defeated it? ZZT ZZT ZZT. Clever girl, manipulating my pride in such a manner. You truly are an interesting container. Fu took that as the Nanabi's agreement to help. As the greenery thinned to nothing and the powerful chakra signature that the beetle had marked as the QBs grew stronger, Fu grew more and more apprehensive of what she would find. What had happened? Why had Naruto drawn on the QB's power? Was he okay? And with heat on around, where was Kakuzu? The former Taki Nin stopped at the edge of a forest of dead trees, the trunks splintered and broken. Most of them had collapsed under the explosion of some force, a great majority sustaining scorch marks upon their wooden surfaces. Fu stared at the scene, wide-eyed. What happened here? Err I or. Fu tried to maintain her balance as the roar's shockwave blew past her. She moved forward cautiously despite her fear of what awaited her, concern for Naruto and Kakuzu overwhelming her sense of self-preservation. The sight that greeted her kept her momentarily paralyzed. Whole and partial bodies were strewn about a shallow, circular crater that was devoid of any sort of obstacles, trees, rocks, anything. Several of the corpses were garbed in outfits reminiscent of Konoha's Anbu, and blood was splattered liberally everywhere. One of the bodies, Fu realized, a hand coming up to cover her mouth, was the tall, distinctive form of Kakuzu, his usual head and facial coverings absent. She had little time to consider the old Nuknin's apparent death, however, as there was a larger problem before her. Standing on all fours was what Fu presumed to be her fellow Jinchuriki, his skin a mixture of red and black. Vulpine ears stood atop his head, his eyes a blank, unseeing white. Red-orange chakra poured off of him in waves, accenting the demonic appearance granted by his skin and sharpened claws. Four tails waved behind him. So, the fox did take control, mused the Nanabi. How interesting. Fu watched as clawed hands of pure chakra erupted from the ground and crushed a cloaked Anbu in their grasp before he could escape. Only a couple shinobi remained in the clearing, and while Fu wasn't interested in their safety, she couldn't say for sure what would happen after Naruto had killed them. What's your plan? The only way we can neutralize a bijou is with another bijou. Unfortunately for you, your seal was not designed to allow access to large amounts of my chakra at any one moment, and we are unpracticed at working cohesively. So, what? You can't do anything? I didn't say that. But you should be prepared to experience a pain unlike anything you've felt before. Pushing vast quantities of chakra past the seal to exert control will not be easy, or pleasant. Fu grimaced but nodded. You'll go back when this is all over. I will not have a choice. We will not be able to maintain this form for long. You're enjoying this, aren't you? Immensely. The Kunoichi couldn't even respond as agonizing pain racked her body. She screamed as the Nanabi's chakra flooded her system, forming a cloak of bubbling orange chakra around her body. It took on the vague form of the Nanabi, with six wings sprouting from Fu's back and a long, whip-like tail extended from the base of her spine. Excellent, buzzed the Nanabi as he took control of Fu's body, flapping the chakra wings and rising into the air, IT has been far too long since I've experienced flight. Hey! Don't waste any time! Fu shouted in her mind. Nag! The wings vibrated even faster, creating a whirlwind of dust that swept into the clearing and engulfed an unsuspecting Anbu. 
When the twister faded away, there was nothing left of the shinobi. Ah, the joy of atomizing your foolish race. Fu watched from behind her bijou's eyes as Naruto sent out his chakra arms at the remaining two Anbu, and despite their initial resistance, both were eventually torn apart by the Jinchuriki's makeshift claws. ZZT ZZT, I suppose it's time to step in and put the QB in his place. A gust of wind blew out towards Naruto, intended to catch the attention of the transformed Jinchuriki. Hello, QB, buzzed the seven tails mockingly as Naruto turned his attention towards him. The boy roared in response, creating a shockwave which came close to blowing the other Jinchuriki out of the air. Come, my sibling, rasp the Nanabi, we shall see who is more powerful. Chakra arms extended towards the cloaked Jinchuriki, but the Nanabi used his flying prowess to maneuver around the limbs and dive at Naruto. Fu's body slammed into Naruto's, sending the transformed Jinchuriki sliding back several feet. Naruto swiped at the airborne Jinchuriki, but the Nanabi blocked the blow with his chakra wings. The claw tips of the chakra appendage disintegrated, atomized by the contact with the seven tails chakra cloak. Even the strength of your current form is not enough to protect you from my abilities, boasted the bijou. He called upon Fu's control over Doden, raising a series of earthen spires that angled at Naruto. One swipe of his four tails fractured the stones, leaving rocky stumps behind. Flapping his wings hard, the Nanabi sent a tornado of wind at the transformed Jinchuriki, disorienting him. Flying close to the earth, he stuck his chakra tail underground as Naruto broke through the whirlwind and roared, dividing his chakra into multiple appendages to attack the cloaked Jinchuriki. The Nanabi wrapped more chakra around Fu's body to protect against the limbs. Using his jailer's body as a distraction, his tail emerged behind the transformed Jinchuriki and whipped forward, the tip driving into Naruto's spine. He roared as the seven tails channeled chakra into his body, disintegrating muscle and tissue that the Kyubi was forced to regenerate. The bijou laughed as Naruto's body convulsed. Where is your boasting now, fox? He gloated. Said the pot to the kettle. You should be more grateful for my services. I could have simply left your infatuation to the Kyubi's clutches. Dot. If you desire to bring the boy back, you need to reach out to him and help him suppress the QB. You can't do it? Neither our relationship nor theirs is at the point where we can reach out to one another with any effectiveness. We are close enough to make a tentative mental connection, and I can keep the jailer contained, however, I would recommend you hurry, this form will not last much longer. Will do. And, thanks. That gratitude will not last long. Fu was too busy focusing on a method to reach Naruto to pay attention to her bijou. Due to the Nanabi taking control of her body, she had essentially been relegated to sitting in her mindscape and watching what was happening. Now, eyes closed, she focused on the implicit connection between Jinchuriki and Bijou, trying to extend it to Naruto like they had back in Konoha after meeting Gara. She strained to feel some sort of bond between her and her fellow Jinchuriki, her partner in crime and savior. Naruto. She called, praying for a response from the darkness. Where are you? You need to get control. Naruto. LLL. Naruto felt like he was asleep. There was no real awareness of where he was or what he was doing, only the vague knowledge that his body was moving without his say-so. Coursing through his veins was a strange bloodlust, one that he wasn't used to feeling. Naruto. The blonde tried to open his eyes, tried to look around, but the unusual lethargy that had seeped into his bones made the actions impossible. Somewhere in the recesses of his mind, he recognized the voice as familiar, feminine in pitch with a distinctly urgent undertone. He struggled to move, fought to gain some semblance of control over his body, but only the darkness of his eyelids greeted him. Where are you? You need to get control. I'm trying. He wanted to shout back, but his mouth wouldn't open, vocal cords struck dumb. Every aspect of his body felt restrained, shackled by chains or glued shut. The lack of control over his own body frustrated him, making him feel even more helpless than when. When what? There was a block on his memory, as if everything that had happened recently and was happening currently was covered by a film. Vague images and shapes danced in his mind's eye, practically mocking him with their nearness and his inability to distinguish them. The knowledge that he should know these things and yet didn't was even more galling than the fact that he was unable to move. He struggled against the invisible bonds keeping him restrained, wanting to know what was going on, who and what he couldn't remember. Naruto. The blonde's eyes snapped open. Fu. He sat up like a shot, wide blue's eyes taking in his surroundings. Water dripped off his body and from his blonde locks, creating ripples in the shallow liquid he was already seated in. Pleasant, he muttered, lifting an arm and watching the water flow to his fingertips and then off them. This is, my mindscape. 
His gaze drifted to the wall where the web of Jung hung, eyes narrowing at the lack of masks that represented his Doden and Sutton hearts. What happened? He wondered. Damn that girl and that accursed insect. Naruto winced at the volume of the voice, his head throbbing. He got up and turned slowly to meet the bloodshot gaze of the QB. What did you do? He demanded. I don't answer to you, snarled the beast. Throwing caution to the wind, Naruto stepped forward and wrapped his knuckles against the iron bars of the cage. I think you do. The QB growled at him, a low reverberation that echoed around the mindscape. Then the fox's deep chuckling rang out, confusing the blonde slightly. You're so quick to place the blame elsewhere. I only took advantage of your own emotional turmoil. Naruto rubbed the bridge of his nose, dealing with the fox was a taxing effort. Will you stop speaking in riddles and just tell me what's going on? I'm a living mass of malevolence and other negative emotions. When you became enraged, you subconsciously drew upon a copious amount of my chakra. The fox paused, allowing another amused chuckle to escape. This is just further proof that you are incapable of controlling my power. If that damned butterfly hadn't interfered, I would be on my way to Konoha by now. The QB rumbled in such a delighted way that Naruto was tempted to call it a purr. The feel of flesh and blood between my paws, the futility of the ANTS as they tried to fight back, ah, how I missed IT all. It's truly a shame there weren't more victims to crush. How dare that insect interfere with my fun. Tragic, Naruto muttered. You won't get another chance to take over my body again, he warned his tenant. I don't need your power. I'll rely on my own strength and the abilities Kakuzu gave me. He turned and walked away from the cage. You'll return for my power one day, brat, called the bijou. Your mentor was unable to win with his own strength, and you would be dead without mine. Remember that. The fox's words echoed in his mind as Naruto's consciousness returned to the real world. Blue eyes blinked open slowly, adjusting to the vision of the open sky. A loud and obnoxious voice immediately made itself known. Him up. I want my body back so I can sacrifice that heathen to Jashin Sama. I'm not a medical expert, Hidan, I can't just control when he's going to wake up. If that bastard Kakuzu had just prayed for Jashin Sama's forgiveness, maybe he'd still be alive to do this. Now I have to wait for this blonde weenie to wake his ass up. Kaku, ugh. Naruto, cried Fu, leaning over him. The blonde was convulsing on the ground, his body racked with spasms from sitting up too quickly because of Hidan's announcement. Every nerve in his body screamed at him simultaneously, feeling like they'd been set on fire. You might want to take it easy, Fu cautioned, wincing herself. Accessing the bijou's chakra apparently has some negative repercussions for anyone who uses it. I did say that you would regret, thanking me. ZZT ZZT ZZT. Naruto watched Fu's movements with a careful eye. His companion seemed to be going through controlled motions, unwilling to move more than absolutely necessary. He slowly reached out a hand to her, but stopped when his own appendage came within his range of vision. Instead of the tan flesh the teenager was used to, his skin was a bright red, almost as if he'd stayed in a hot spring for far too long. What, happened to me? He managed. Fu looked distinctly downcast as she thought about how to respond. You, were like some sort miniature QB. Four tails, claws, ears. I, had to use the Nanabi's chakra to restrain you. She rubbed a hand over an arm self-consciously. It, came with a price. Looking closer at the girl, Naruto could make out the barest hint of a scale pattern on her arms. He clenched his fist tightly, gritting his teeth against the pain shooting through his arm. NNNGGH, damn it all. Everything screwed up. What would Kakuzu do? Kakuzu. Where's Kakuzu? Fu gestured to the side. I'm not sure how, but he managed to escape all the fighting. His body's over there. Yeah, shouted Hidan, boo freaking who and all that shit. Now put my body back together. Shut up, snapped both Jinchuriki. They exchanged wan smiles. Must have been channeling Kakuzu, Naruto wisecracked. Yeah, Fu agreed. She glanced at the body of their mentor. What do we do? She whispered. Get over your fucking self, Hidan yelled. Put me. He was cut off abruptly as Naruto's arm extended and grabbed his head around his mouth. The blonde reeled the immortal's head in, bringing their eyes even. You talk too much, he commented, commanding a thread to weave Hidan's lips together. Much better, he sighed, tossing the head away amidst the man's muffled threats. Naruto pushed himself to a sitting position, ignoring the feeling of raw skin being stretched and the pain that came with movement. Pieces of his flesh were already starting to reappear, slowly, spurred forward by the QB's regenerative powers. 
We move forward, he resolved. I think, that's what he would want. You know, he smiled wryly, if he wasn't such a tremendous prick. Both Jinchuriki grew momentarily pensive, honoring the memory of their fallen instructor. At length, Naruto managed to get to his feet, the after effects of the Kyuubi's chakra a dull ache. Well, guess I should help Hidan. Maybe Pain will appreciate the favor. Wanna help? Fu offered him a smile that was partially contorted by a grimace. As much fun as that sounds, it hurts if I move too much. My body wasn't meant to use so much of the Nanabi's chakra at once. Naruto offered her an apologetic gesture. Thanks though. He looked around at the clearing they were in, noting the lack of trees, various holes, and puddles of blood. Bodies were spread throughout the area, some halved at the torso, others missing arms or legs or heads. So, this is what happens when the QB takes over, huh? The blonde moved to kneel beside the nearest corpse, missing an arm and possessing a fist-shaped hole through his chest. Pretty gruesome. His eyes hardened. They deserve to suffer. Staring at the corpse filled Naruto with a sense of vindication, knowing that he had properly avenged Kakuzu despite not being fully in control of his actions. His hand reached out of its own accord and gripped the porcelain white mask decorating the body's face. He removed it to see the insignia of the hidden leaf etched into the man's forehead protector. Konoha. Again, the hidden leaf haunted him, perpetually spurring his hatred and desire for vengeance. The blonde was filled with a sudden compulsion to take the item, so he ripped the hidey eight from its place and pocketed it. There would be time later to digest all that had happened, right now, he was needed. He turned away from the scene and walked over to where Hidan's body parts were stacked in a pile. You've certainly seen better days, he commented, unknowingly echoing Fu's earlier words and picking up an arm. That was stitched back into the shoulder, the opposite one following with a suture just below the elbow. He worked his way through the rest of the pile until all that was left was the head. Watching Jiang reattach Hidan's head to his neck, Naruto was struck by inspiration. I wonder. Can Kakuzu's body accept a heart? The idea was a bit radical. Corpses certainly weren't meant to function by arbitrarily shoving new hearts into them and hoping they would just come back to life. Heart transplants were lengthy and in-depth operations that required careful planning and understanding of the cardiovascular system. But that applied to normal humans. Jiang, by its very nature, had altered Kakuzu's body to become adept at switching out organs with startling ease, even replacing hearts autonomously after the previous one had failed. Based on that, it wasn't so outlandish to believe that an implanted heart from another Jiang user could theoretically bring Kakuzu back to life. There was nothing to be lost from at least trying. He limped over to Kakuzu's body and kneeled beside it. Reaching for the Doden heart stored on his back, the blonde was surprised to discover that he couldn't feel the power of the earth release chakra nature flowing through his body, a second feel revealed the lack of his suit and affinity as well. Interesting, he mused, thinking back to the empty web in his mindscape, did the Kyuubi's chakra destroy the hearts? Naruto shook his head. There was time for speculation later. Right now, he needed an extra heart. Not wanting to move, he called, Hidan, I need you to bring me someone. Alive, he clarified. When his only response was the purple-eyed man glowering hatefully at him, the blonde sighed. His arm shot out and touched the man, mentally commanding the thread binding Hidan's lips together to unweave. Body, if you would be so kind. Chop chop. TCH, you and Kakuzu are exactly the same. Perish the thought, Naruto muttered. Forcing me to become blasphemous traitors like you. It's a sin to leave a sacrifice alive. Naruto stared at him. Let me make this simple, he said, a tinge of frost entering his tone. Find me a damn body, bring it to me alive, or I'll undo all my work and have Fu put you back in whatever hellhole she found you in, in pieces. Got it? Hidan laughed. Like you could. Just look at the sorry shape your ass is in. If you do this, Naruto began after a moment of thought, deciding that threats wouldn't work, Kakuzu will end up being in your debt. The former Yunin paused to consider the implications of that statement. Ha ha. Then he'll have to allow me to give my respect to Jashin Sama without complaining. He walked past Naruto to pick up his scythe, which the blonde was surprised to find undamaged from the turmoil of his assault. My lord will be most pleased with my renewed dedication. Sure. Right, agreed the blonde. Hidan's yammering didn't make much sense to him, but agreeing with the man seemed to be the best option in getting him to do as Naruto wanted. Hidan immediately went on some tangent that Naruto instinctively tuned out. How Kakuzu had managed to travel around the continent with Hidan for over a year baffled the blonde. Five minutes with the Jashinist was enough to drive him crazy. Do you ever shut, crap? Wooden beams erupted from the earth around Naruto and Hidan. 
The Jin Churiki activated a hasty violent wind palm aimed at the ground and ended up blasting himself into the air and onto a tree bough as the prison finished erecting itself. If the yelling was any indication, Hidan had not been fortunate enough to escape. Kenzo stepped out of the shadows. Well done, Kyubi Jin Churiki. Are you kidding me? Naruto exclaimed, resisting the urge to scream in a mixture of pain and frustration. How did you even find me? I am highly attuned to the amount of chakra thrown off by the bijou. The output that I felt coming from this area made it easy to find you. Fucking fox. Naruto snarled in his mind. You have only yourself to blame. Come with me, Jinchuriki, and I will let your friend go free, offered Tenzo. Oi! That little pansy and I aren't friends. Couldn't have said it better myself, Naruto muttered. Still, regardless of the definition of his and Hidan's relationship, the former Yunin was the blonde's best chance to escape. Naruto was in no condition to fight, just activating the futon, Repushu had brought about a surge of agony. How do I free Hidan? Those wooden pillars are practically indestructible. He glanced to the side to find Fu gone from her original position. So I have to distract him, huh? This'll be, fun. If you want me, come get me, he taunted. I feel like I'm gonna regret that. Despite the cat mask that had Tenzo's face, Naruto had the distinct impression that the Anbu was scowling at him. The man performed seals, and Naruto jumped off the tree branch as a block of wood grew from the trunk. He looped several threads of Jiang around the limb and vaulted himself to the next tree, wincing slightly at the impact. Your help might be appreciated, he told the QB. You complain about the effects of my chakra, and then you beg for my assistance. What happened to not relying on my power? Don't need your power, just your healing ability. I prefer to watch you suffer. Bastard. He weaved through the tree trunks as a series of wooden blocks chased after him, all growing from Tenzo's arm. All he needed to do was stall the Anbu agent until Fu could free Hidan. Meanwhile, the green-haired girl was staring at the Akatsuki member through the wooden bars of the man's prison. Hidan, apparently, was unsatisfied with her lack of progress. Are you gonna just keep looking at me, or are you gonna do something, you stupid bitch? Yeah, yell at me, that'll help. Ideas? She prompted the Nanabi. 1. Tell the loudmouth to move to one side. Hidan, move. She was surprised when the Jashinist obeyed without protesting. Prepare yourself. Fu grimaced as the Nanabi pushed its chakra through the seal, creating a pair of wings that sprouted from her spine. She vibrated them quickly at the bijou's behest, sending out a burst of his chakra before the wings dissipated. That should do. The cage keeping Hidan contained was now half the size, a concave shape carved out of one end. Hidan walked out of the opening, twirling his scythe expertly with one hand. Where's the masked fucker? Not far, Fu gasped, bent over on hands and knees. He'll become a sacrifice to Jashin Sama. Then he was gone, cackling madly. Fu struggled to her feet, breath coming in labored pants. Allowing the Nanabi to squeeze out that last bit of chakra had told her exhausted body to its limit. She limped over to the wooden prison and leaned against it, trying to control the sharp throb pounding in her head and resonating throughout her body. How do we get out of here? Naruto stumbled into the clearing then, tumbling head over feet and ending up on his rear. He shook his head and got up slowly. We need to go, he said. Hidan's keeping Tenzo busy. You trust Hidan? Not particularly, no, admitted the blonde. But every trait that makes him a nuisance also makes him a good distraction. Besides, he continued, walking over to Kakuzu's body, all else aside, Hidan is still an S-class Nuknin. He can handle himself. We need to worry about us. Let's go. LLL. Carrying Kakuzu was hard, Naruto realized. Granted, the man was over a head taller than him and weighed at least 40 pounds more, so the awkwardness of trying to travel with him was understandable, but still, Naruto was not cut out to be a pack mule. Especially not in the condition the Kyubi's chakra had left his body in. Damn the fox. He cursed mentally, adjusting the placement of Kakuzu's body on his back. Without either of his other hearts, his ability to produce solid clones was non-existent, unlike Kakuzu, he couldn't yet use chakra natures other than wind without the hearts, which was unfortunate given how useful they would be in the current situation. Struggling forward with his mentor weighing him down, Naruto glanced behind to check Fu's progress. His fellow Jinchuriki trudged in his footsteps, pain flinches accompanying every step. We'll never make it like this, he realized sourly. Otto is too far, and neither of us are in peak health. Working his mind furiously for a solution, Naruto almost slapped himself as he landed upon one. 
dropping Kakuzu's body to the ground and ignoring Fu's half-formed question of what he was doing, the blonde ran through a set of familiar hand signs. Kushios no jutsu, he uttered wearily, feeding what chakra he had recovered into the technique. Kamegenso appeared in a cloud of smoke. One black eye rotated so it could stare at the blonde. Hello, Naruto, greeted the reptile. Hey Genso, returned his summoner. Sorry to ask this of you, but we kinda need a ride. The chameleon's other eye roved from Fu, clutching her shoulder in pain, to the prone form of Kakuzu. No problem. His tongue shot out and stuck to Kakuzu, bringing the corpse into his mouth with no questions. Naruto and Fu were quick to follow. Where to? He questioned, Ma still open. North, Naruto replied, to Odo Gakur. He gazed cautiously at the surrounding area, paranoia gripping him. Hidan was nigh indestructible, and Naruto supposed his skill was decent, but Anbu were tenacious, and the Jinchuriki didn't fully trust the silver-haired man to keep Tenzo at bay for long. And if you could be camouflaged, that'd be great. Kamegenso rumbled unintelligibly and closed his mouth, activating the ability of the chameleons to turn invisible. From inside the reptile, Naruto and Fu tried to find stability with each step Kamegenso took. The chameleon's gait was slow, and the blonde was sure that the trip to Otto would take some time, but it was better than trekking even more slowly by foot. He leaned against the wall of the summon's mouth and closed his eyes, allowing the monotonous movement of the chameleon's walk to lull him to sleep. Naruto wasn't sure how much time had passed, but the chameleon's rumbling stirred him from his slumber and into groggy wakefulness. Wah? There are men out here threatening me if I don't stop. Ah. Troublesome gatekeepers. I suppose it's good that they're doing their job. You can go now, Genso, he said. And thanks for the help. It was my pleasure, Naruto. He disappeared, leaving the blonde to drop ten feet to the ground. Naruto landed gracefully between the thud of Kakuzu's body hitting the ground and Fu's muted groan of pain. Apparently she had still been asleep. He waved to the guards. Tell your angel that Uzumaki Naruto has come to call on her god. The guards held a whispered conference before one of them disappeared. Naruto sat down in the dirt and waited patiently for a response. Konan arrived in a flurry of paper almost twenty minutes later, an emotionless expression plastered upon her face. Come, she beckoned. Naruto hefted Kakuzu's body over his shoulder again and followed the blue-haired woman, Fu beside him. Konan was apparently not one for small talk, for the journey was made in relative silence. The blonde wondered if she actually knew what had happened through some method privy to the full-fledged Akatsuki members, but was shaken from that musing by her divergence away from the path he remembered Payne's tower being. Where are we going? He asked. Hospital, was the curt reply. Naruto's eyes narrowed. Did he know about this? That Kakuzu and Hidan were in trouble? Pain is aware of everything. Anger boiled slowly in the pit of Naruto's stomach, but he restrained himself from saying anything else, instead focusing on moving forward with the burden of his mentor's weight. They reached the hospital soon enough, and Conan directed them towards a secluded room with grey walls and surgical equipment. Wait here, she commanded before disappearing. Naruto laid Kakuzu down on one of two beds while Fu sat on the other, body slumping in relief. Was it really wise to come back here? She asked. Do you have a better idea? Fu looked down. I suppose not. I just. She trailed off as a powerful presence became noticeable in the room. Both Jinchuriki looked up to see Pain standing in the doorway, face expressionless. The orange-haired man stared at them, like they were specimens under a microscope. Finally, he said, I believe it is prudent that we speak. Naruto fought down the surge of anger directed at Pain, instead raising his head slowly to look the older man in his ringed, grey eyes. Get me a heart, a shinobi's, a civilian's, a prisoner's for all I care, he stated in a dangerously calm voice, and then we can talk. Payne bore the boy's flat expression without any change in his own. After a minute of intense staring, he nodded, mentally contacting Conan and telling her to bring in a prisoner from the cells. The blue-haired woman appeared several minutes later with a man bound and gagged, he was forced to kneel before Naruto hatred burning in his eyes. The blonde's own blue eyes were cold, glittering like ice in the light of the hospital room. There was no mercy present in those orbs as black threads wriggled out from his forearm and dug into the man's skin. Moments later, his heart was torn from his body in a spray of blood, the organ pumping solidly in Naruto's hand. He turned to the bed and placed the heart on his mentor's chest, directly over the long suture running from his clavicle to his pectoral. Jiang pried open the stitch and deposited the organ inside before withdrawing back into its wielder. Naruto waited with bated breath to see if his long-shot idea would work. 
Each second that passed felt like a lifetime, but finally, Kakuzu's body convulsed once, a rattling gasp escaping his mouth. The Nukunin's thread stitch shut the opening on his chest, and Naruto bowed his head in silent relief that his teacher was alive. Konan walked over and felt the man's pulse before hooking him up to a variety of machines. Heartbeat is slow but steady, she reported, although brain function is minimal. She turned to pain. I believe the trauma of dying may have placed him in some sort of vegetative state. What? Pain placed a hand upon Naruto's shoulder and gripped it tightly. Come with me, he ordered. It is time for us to have a conversation. But Kakuzu. You have done what you could, Pain interjected, unless you have extensive knowledge of the medical field. He exchanged glances with Konan, who immediately swept out of room. The grey-eyed man turned to lead Naruto down the hall, but paused in the doorway. I found this in Orochimaru's library, he mentioned, reaching into his sleeve and pulling out a tightly rolled scroll. He tossed it behind him towards Fu, who had remained quiet throughout the entire ordeal. I think you might find it interesting. Then he walked out, and Naruto had no choice but to follow. The blonde trotted to catch up to the taller man. What did you give her? Information, Payne replied, which I can only assume Orochimaru managed to obtain from the office of the Tsuchikage many years ago. Naruto opened his mouth to ask for specifics, but Fu's piercing shriek of what do you mean Jintan uses Katan? Interrupted him. Payne turned to find Naruto glancing back down the way they had come. Tell me, he began, causing the younger shinobi to whip his head towards him, what it was like to lose your mentor. The blonde's face morphed into an expression of rage. You knew, he accused, you knew that Kakuzu was gonna die. I did not. Don't lie. Snarled the Jinchuriki, marching up to Pain and getting in his face as best as he could. I trust my subordinates to be able to fend for themselves, stated the orange-haired man. They are shinobi of repute who are not easily overwhelmed. You let him die because you thought he could handle himself? Akatsuki's leader stared the Jinchuriki in his blue eyes. Tell me, do you think Kakuzu would have been pleased to be rescued? Naruto took a moment to consider that idea, some of the anger leaving his system at the thought of his mentor's reaction to being saved by another. I thought not. He turned away from the blonde and continued walking. By the time I had become aware of the situation, it was too late to do anything. His death would have been an unfortunate event if you hadn't returned him to the world of the living. Zetsu can pop out from trees. Naruto retorted. He could have gotten there in a flash. Don't tell me it was too late to do anything. Zetsu is not a frontline shinobi. I prefer to minimize casualties. They turned a corner. Now you understand the true definition of pain. Naruto was confused by the abrupt subject change. I, what? There are many variations of pain. Physical pain, such as the loss of a limb or the breaking of bones, emotional pain, experienced through the loss of those we are close to, spiritual pain, often felt through empathy. Humans are, on the whole, a pathetic and fragile race of creatures. Yet, despite all these different types of pain, there is only one true pain. Ringed, grey eyes turned to the blonde. You have felt it. Naruto thought back to the forest of dead trees, of watching the one person who had given him a chance fall to the ground and lay there, unmoving. The knowledge that Kakuzu, the closest thing he had to a father figure, sad as that was, had died had given rise to such feelings of hatred and agony that he had called upon droves of the Kyuubi's chakra and morphed into a miniature version of the bijou. The blonde turned blue eyes filled with comprehension towards Akatsuki's leader. You have realized it, pain intoned. People, by nature, cling to others and create communities based on these connections. They experience sadness when people they know die, but there are others to help them move on, to fill the void. But for those who don't have such a network, the loss of a parent or a friend is keenly felt. As a Jinchuriki, you have a good grasp of what this is like. The death of the only person you are close to, that is true pain. And this foolish world and its wars know nothing of that. There was a lull as pain allowed Naruto to consider his words before he continued, you are fortunate. There are not many people who can claim to have experienced such pain and then get a chance to talk to the person who passed. You should take advantage of such an opportunity. Pain began to walk away, but Naruto's quiet call of wait, stopped him. What, when did you know the true meaning of pain? Konoha Nin invaded my home during the Second Shinobi World War and killed my parents, who were civilians. That was the first time. He paused. Years later, my motivation to fight for peace died doing what he thought was right. He saved my life and inspired Akatsuki's goals. It's hard, not being able to tell someone how hugely they've impacted your life, isn't it? 
Nagato thought of how Yahiko only lived on as a puppet, serving as the deva path of the bodies known collectively as pain. He could only hope that wherever he was, Yahiko would be satisfied with the ultimate plan he had put together to bring peace to the world. Yes, he said at last, it is. Hey! Naruto called as pain started walking again. You know that Hidan's lost somewhere, right? Of course. I know everything. Left alone in the hallway, Naruto found himself ruminating on Payne's dialogue. He reached into his pocket and withdrew the Konoha Hidi 8, gazing at the metal thoughtfully. After a moment, a tendril of Jeong slipped out from underneath his skin and, with a tiny application of wind chakra, scored the headband. It would be his permanent reminder that the hidden leaf would pay for all the pain it had caused him. LLL. Fu was as close to seething as she had ever been. I've been using it wrong the entire time? She screeched. Obnoxious girl, the nanabi buzzed irritably, shouldn't you be in too much pain to bother me? She had cracked open the scroll as Naruto and Pain had left the hospital room and started perusing its contents. It was apparently written by the second host of the nanabi, the brother of the man who would become the Naidaim Suchikich. And it had labeled Jintan as a combination of Doden, Futan, and Katan affinities. Outraged at this new revelation, Fu had immediately entered her mindscape to confront the Seven Tails. Why didn't you tell me? Don't you have better things to complain about? Your scales, for instance. I knew there would be consequences to using your power when I agreed to let you take over, she snapped. What I didn't think was that you would keep information from me that would risk my life, your life. Arms crossed, she tapped her foot impatiently, glaring through the honeyed bars of the bijou's cage. Now, are you going to start talking, or am I just going to have to read this scroll? She asked, waving a conjured image of said object in front of the demon's sight. What an interesting container you are, rasped the beetle. Fu rolled her eyes, that seemed to be the Nanabi's go-to phrase whenever she managed to surprise him. Fine. Many years ago, I was captured by the shinobi of Iwagakur. They sealed me into a human, but sealing methods for the bijou were not well conceived at that time, and I broke free within two and a half years. Of course, in that time frame, they came up with new ones, and I was immediately sealed within my second host. He was, adept. He came to understand my powers and found a way to channel them into an advanced chakra nature that he called Jintan. During that time, his brother Mew spied on him and managed to recreate the Jintan chakra nature for his own uses. He became the Naidaim Suchikij, and his brother, my Jinchuriki, was traded to Takigakur as part of a universal peace treaty for my sibling, the Gobi. They apparently believed they could keep the status quo by controlling a bijou with more tails, especially since Iwa already possessed the Nbi. Regardless, the Taki Shinobi immediately extracted me and sealed me into my third container. You are my fifth. Quite a colorful history, Fu commented. So, you said that this second Jinchuriki created Jintan by channeling your powers. What's that mean? I am renowned as the Great Demolisher. Every beat of my wings has the ability to atomize people, to molecularize objects, to disintegrate the very mountains into heaps of dust. More boasting, what a shock, muttered the Jinchuriki. Didn't stop you from getting captured in the first place, now did it? The Nanabi buzzed angrily, the vibrations of his wings slamming against the bars of his cage. So that's what happened when I fought that guy from Otto during the invasion, she realized, recalling how the teenager had exited her body without an arm. Why did you never tell me this? I've been wasting all my time with this half-assed version when the real Jintan sounds incredibly powerful. You made an assumption. You were wrong. I found your new method to be, intriguing. IT possessed potential, and you made impressive strides in adapting IT to your whims. For a human, anyway. Your arrogance isn't very becoming. Regardless, the bastardized version of Jintan you created became useful. The real version is highly chakra-intensive and requires a great deal of time to prepare. In addition, it is not extraordinarily conducive to your chosen profession of bounty hunting. No body means no payment. Did you just make a joke? You have proven to be an intriguing Jinchuriki, noted the seven tails somewhat reluctantly. This time, it almost sounded like a compliment rather than idle musing. I look forward to seeing where you go with this new knowledge. Thanks for being helpful this time, Fu said before returning to the real world. LLL. Hello, Hidan san You. You look like you've seen better days. Aw, shut up, plant bastard. Aren't you gonna tell us what happened? Some Konoha asshole resisted being sacrificed for Jashin Sama's great will. Cowardly bastard ran off after attacking with a bunch of trees. So you weren't able to kill him? How embarrassing. Shut up. What are you here for, anyway? 
Follow us. We're here to take you back to meet your partner. So the bastard survived, huh? Maybe now he'll have a greater appreciation for Jashin Sama. No wonder Kakuzu doesn't like him. He's obnoxious. Hey, I'm right here, asshole. LLL. Kakuzu woke up on the third day of their stay in the Hidden Sound. He was a bit disoriented and extremely grouchy, but Naruto was too happy to see him alive to care about his personality. Then the mercenary went and commented on how pathetic it was for him to be so emotional, and Naruto remembered exactly why the man was such a pain to deal with. In a way, it was almost nostalgic. That was when Hidan entered the room and proceeded to mock the former Taki Nin, resulting in an insult match between the two. Naruto sighed somewhat exasperatedly. Some things never truly changed. Very little had occurred during Kakuzu's bout of unconsciousness. Fu had remained hospitalized for a solid day, alternating between sleeping and reading the scroll pain had given her. Even after recovering from her overuse of the Nanabi's chakra, she had poured over the parchment with a fire in her orange eyes, trying to absorb the knowledge like a sponge. Sometimes she had disappeared for stretches of time, though she had always returned muttering incredulously about ratios and three elements. Naruto found he didn't quite possess the brevity to ask if she had finally succumbed to insanity, and so left his companion to brood in peace. Hidan, surprisingly, had shown up not long before the end of the first day, talking loudly and complaining about woodfuckers and plant assholes. The blonde had guesses about the Jashinist irate mood, but decided that not engaging Hidan in conversation was a better idea than any of the alternatives. Konan had appeared each day to check on Kakuzu's condition, and Payne had returned once to drag Hidan away, offering to explain Akatsuki's plans in full to the silver-haired man. Naruto had been grateful for the reprieve from the immortal's voice. Despite the strange urge to maintain a bedside vigil on Kakuzu the entire time, the mercenary hardly needed protection, he thought sarcastically, Naruto had opted to roam the village hidden in sound and explore what it had to offer. The feeling of tranquility the village exuded had calmed the tumultuous mixture of emotions the blonde had experienced over the past several days. Otogakur possessed a homey feel that Naruto, a wanderer with no permanent abode, found oddly relaxing. That hadn't prevented him from popping in to check on Kakuzu's condition every so often, but otherwise the rest of his time had been spent planning his next steps. Frustratingly, wait for Kakuzu to wake up had remained the constant priority, his only anchor to not leaving Otto at a moment's notice. Now that the man was awake, though, Naruto felt a weight lift off his chest. He sort of missed his teacher's sarcastic reposts and snarky commentary. Kakuzu's green eyes settled their stoic gaze on his blonde disciple, sliding wordlessly over the scored forehead protector he now wore and settling into an intense gaze into his pupil's blue orbs. You revived me, he stated questioningly, using Jiang. Naruto nodded. Yeah. Intriguing. Then his gaze hardened into something akin to scorn. Your sentiment will be the death of you someday. Naruto spluttered, outraged. My sentiment will be my death? You died from your arrogance. And I saved you. Out of attachment, Kakuzu snorted, not necessity. Resurrecting the dead is a fool's errand. You could at least, thank me. Hardly. Hey, Kakuzu, Hidan interrupted, what was hell like? A blaspheming bastard like you definitely went there. I bet your wrinkled old ass got roasted. I would like a word with Kakuzu, interjected a different voice before Kakuzu could retort. All eyes turned to the doorway to find Pain standing there, face expressionless. The former Taki Nin rose in bed so that he was upright, back leaning against the pillows. Hidan snorted. TCH, fine. He pushed past the orange-haired man, his grumblings echoing down the corridor. Naruto glanced between the two men. Go, brat, Kakuzu dismissed. We shall talk later. The blonde hesitated, but then bobbed his head and left. Kakuzu waited until he was sure they were alone before saying, what business would you like to discuss? Payne shut the door and then moved to stand at the foot of Kakuzu's bed. Your student was rather worried about your condition, he began conversationally. He demanded that I get him a heart to revive you. He paused, turning his gaze to the closed door. Such dedication is, impressive. Foolish would be a more apt term. Immortality is a falsehood. The dead should remain such. Hmm. Payne returned his attention to the bedridden man. How dedicated are you to Akatsuki? I am a member, am I not? Yes, but men of your caliber, of Akatsuki's caliber, all have personal agendas. At first glimpse, one would believe that yours follows whichever path proves most profitable. However, I don't believe this to be the case. At least, not in its entirety. So I ask again, how dedicated are you to Akatsuki? 
Kakuzu stared at his superior, considering his options. In his current condition, there was certainly nothing he could do to stop pain from killing him, though he sincerely doubted that was the man's intention. That meant that he had to engage the orange-haired man's word game and hope to give the appropriate answers. Finally, he settled on saying, I have actively pursued our targets and have not hindered Akatsuki's progress. And yet you would prefer that the two Jinchuriki remain alive rather than see Akatsuki's plans come to fruition. I dislike wasting valuable resources, replied the former Taki Nin slowly, but if their deaths are a necessity for our plans, then I will not stand in the way. Hmm. Payne's grey eyes flickered towards the door once again. They have proven themselves quite useful, he commented tonelessly. Far more useful than I would have originally anticipated. Kakuzu managed to reel in his surprise at what he thought was the shorter man praising the two Jinchuriki. They have become interesting assets to this organization. Kakuzu's eyes narrowed. That is, positive. Once more, Payne's gaze turned back to the former Taki Nin. You should be commended for how well you trained them. I would refrain from phrasing it in such a manner. My students would argue that my teaching input was minimal at best. How would you like a second opportunity? This time, Kakuzu couldn't contain the shocked widening of his eyes, though they quickly settled into a suspicious gaze. What exactly are you implying? I'm curious to see how far their loyalty extends. They have shown a strong attachment to you despite your current affiliations, and have been working for Akatsuki as long as you have despite knowing what our intentions are. Perhaps we can continue to capitalize on their usefulness, but that is only possible as long as they continue to live. Your plans have changed? Payne shook his head. No. But there may be a way to enact Akatsuki's ultimate goal without killing either of the Jinchuriki. It would require research, but the benefit of having two fully trained Jinchuriki on Akatsuki's side outweighs the risk. This is why I would like you to continue training them. And if they become stronger than you? The likelihood of that occurring is minuscule. Payne paused, then continued, this is not a guarantee that they will live. He walked to the door and opened it. You should leave when you've recovered. And take heat on with you, his voice has become irritating to hear. Preaching to the choir, Kakuzu deadpanned. Wait, he continued as the grey-eyed man made to leave the room, what made you change your mind? This is a rather abrupt shift in attitude. Some qualities people possess are rare and invaluable, Payne replied at length, lingering in the doorframe without turning around. To deprive the world of such a person before he's had the chance to fully understand himself, would be a travesty, don't you agree? Then, without waiting for a response, he was gone. Kakuzu was left to ponder the cryptic words of Akatsuki's leader in silence, analytical mind working to decode just what exactly Payne had seen in Naruto that had caused him to reconsider killing both Jinchuriki. Two days later found the mercenary healed, though in dire need of restocking his supply of hearts. With a moderately confused Naruto and Fu in tow, and a whining heat on bringing up the rear, Kakuzu and his troop departed the safety of Odogakur heading west. Ringed, grey eyes watched them leave, communicating a silent bit of fortitude for their journey ahead. Chapter 17, Progression Sasori, encapsulated in the puppet body known as Hiruko stared at the massive thing before him and momentarily lamented specializing in kugutsu no jutsu. Puppets could vary in sizes, but few were bigger than a human, and given that Sasori's collection was comprised entirely of human puppets, their sizes were already spoken for. If his laughter was any indication, Datara apparently found the situation hilarious. Hey, Sasori no Dana, he called from atop a clay owl hovering high above the former Suna Nin, better hurry up and capture the Sanbi. I know that you don't like to make people wait, Hmm. Sasori scowled at his partner's mocking. He had expected to fight a Jinchuriki, not the monstrous turtle-like creature before him. Jinchuriki were humans, after all, and that made them susceptible to things like poison and kunai and other booby traps that inhabited his puppets. When he and his partner had ventured into the land of the sea two years ago, they had discovered that the sea monster torturing the townsfolk had been some girl who had escaped the clutches of one of Orochimaru's lackeys. She had, disappointingly, not been the container to the three-tailed giant turtle, but she had at least been physiologically human. Despite the fact that Orochimaru was gone, and so throwing a monkey wrench into the Sanin's plans no longer held the same sense of vindication, Sasori had taken great delight in killing the girl with his puppets, especially since the trip had been a huge waste of time. The former Sunan inside. There was little option available but to rely upon his partner for assistance, Datara explosions were far better suited to toppling large targets than his precision-oriented puppets. This would go faster if you would help, he intoned blandly. It was as close as the puppeteer would get to asking for help without letting his pride suffer by being so blatant about it. Hmm? 
The former Iwa Nin cocked his head to one side at a senior statement. Then he laughed. Ha! This is the ultimate proof that my art is better than yours, Dana. He crowed. As Datara wheeled forward on his owl, hands chewing on clay, and making it out of earshot before the older artist could growl a comeback, Sasori ejected himself from Hiruko and sealed the construct within a scroll. He pulled out another scroll, unraveled it, and unsealed its contents, revealing the form of the Sandaime Kazekage. Black granules immediately began to spew out of the puppet's mouth. Let us begin. Katsu. Satetsu Keshu. The Sanbi roared. LLL. Deep in the mountains of the land of earth, another Akatsuki member struggled with his own battle. The terrain possessed impressive divots and crags shorn from its surface, trenches dug into the rocky face by streams of water and lava. Hoshigaki Kisame's cheeks puffed out as a torrent of molten lava came flowing towards him. Sutan, Daibakus Wishoha. Water spewed forth from the former Kiri Nin's mouth, solidifying the lava and swirling into a huge dome of liquid. The renegade swordsman merged with Seimata and entered the hemisphere with a chuckle, his shark-like appearance exemplified even further. You won't be able to escape my Suro Samiodori no Jutsu. Five minutes later, the entire construct collapsed with a huge splash, water falling everywhere. Kisame stretched as Seimata unmerged with him. Well, that was certainly challenging. Kehi, though I suppose it's my fault for wanting to capture this Jinchuriki by myself. He slung the unconscious form of the Iwa Nin over his sword's tip and began walking, allowing the blade's chakra-absorbing properties to keep his victim unconscious. Time to find Itachi. Hope he didn't get too bored waiting for me. LLL. Naruto dove behind a tree and pulled his legs to his chest, breath coming in rough bursts of air. No matter how many times it happened, the blonde was always surprised at the extremes his so-called sparring partners went to in order to train him. Come here you pansy. Fortunately, Hidan had never really grasped the concept of subtlety, something Naruto knew frustrated Kakuzu to no end. The Jinchuriki dropped flat to his belly as the Jashinus large scythe tore clean through the base of the tree. Timber. Cackled the silver-haired man as the greenery toppled to the side. Naruto rolled onto his back to find Hidan standing over him weapon raised to slash across the blonde's body. Katan, Gokaku no Jutsu. He exhaled the great fireball at the former Yunin's face, temporarily blinding his opponent and giving the teen a chance to get up and move away. Suck it. He taunted. Hidan charged at him, eyes bloodshot and face streaked with scorch marks. Bring it, fucker. We can relish in the pain together. Naruto ducked the sideways slash of the weapon and attempted to sweep Hidan's legs out from under him. Predictably, the former Yunin jumped, and the blonde immediately ran through seals for a wind jutsu. The strength behind the technique blasted Hidan out of the clearing, but Naruto watched the Akatsuki member throw his scythe into the canopy of a cluster of trees, allowing the coil of metal attached to the end to wrap around a bow, he hung there like an oversized fruit. Naruto sighed in relief, grateful for the momentary reprieve. Hidan wasn't exactly the most difficult shinobi to fend off, especially taking into account his predictability, preference for close-range combat, and easily exploitable personality, but his sheer resilience made him a rather tiresome threat. Attacks that would normally down other opponents from either pain or fatal blows affected the Jashinist but didn't stop him. In fact, Hidan often grew more dangerous upon suffering such inflictions. He was dragged from his thoughts as Fu went flying, literally, two wings sprouted from her back, past his vision. She turned to look behind her, released a short shriek, then took off even faster as a mass of black zipped through the air in her wake, firing condensed balls of air. A foreboding feeling of unease settled in the pit of Naruto's stomach. That, can't be good. Hello, brat. Naruto whirled at the voice, hands already flying through seals. Doten, Doriuki. Raiten, John. Son of A. Lightning burst through his hastily erected earthen wall forcing the blonde to shield his face as shards of hardened dirt exploded towards him. Kakuzu grunted disapprovingly. You chose the wrong counter. Naruto glowered at his teacher. Earth was the best bet. The only thing it wouldn't stop was lightning. True. Yet because I knew what you were going to do, I attacked appropriately. Predictability kills. The blonde didn't respond, instead spreading his awareness to his surroundings. Couldn't you have kept him busy? He shouted as Fu flew back into his line of sight. Tried that. She returned, twisting in midair with her hands held at her sternum. A small pyramid was forming in her hands, the square base facing her with the tip pointing towards the thread creature zooming in on her position. She released the shape, but the mass that was Kakuzu's wind heart zipped around the assault, forcing Fu to release her wings and drop to the ground to avoid it barreling into her. 
didn't work out too well. Clearly. He stared at Kakuzu, who returned the gaze evenly, arms held behind his back. Why hasn't he done anything yet? And why are his arms, shit? He jumped aside to avoid his teacher's hand as it burst forth from the ground, threads pulsing with one of the man's hearts. Despite the belated awareness of what Kakuzu was doing, Naruto managed to completely evade the black tendrils of Jeong. He had an instant to be proud of this accomplishment before the man's fingers clasped around Fu's ankle. The realization that he hadn't even been the thread user's main target was further proven when the Nuknin stated, you should enjoy Hidan's company, and flung her away. Fu managed to right herself in midair by sprouting the Nanabi's wings again, but Hidan came plunging out of the sky with a mad cackle, scythe's tips angled to impale her. The green-haired girl dodged, but she was blown away by a blast of air from Kakuzu's returning thread creature. Naruto almost called out to his companion, but then decided he had more pressing issues to deal with and turned to face his teacher. A wise decision, commented the mercenary. Now come. That was a familiar statement. Naruto had honestly lost track of how many times Kakuzu had uttered those words, the taunting beckon, not the half praise regarding his decision, over the past two years. And what a time it had been. Two years ago, Naruto honestly would never have expected any sort of assistance from his wayward teacher, they had, for all intents and purposes, gone different ways following Hidan's recruitment to Akatsuki. Kakuzu was Naruto's past, and while he would always have a role in the younger male's life, the black and white of it was that the two were on different sides of the fence, ignoring the fact that Naruto was working for Akatsuki, of course. Even disregarding that, Kakuzu's rather indirect teaching methodology and his words about Naruto learning to control Jeong on his own had pretty much guaranteed that Naruto would be forced to teach himself to get stronger. Yet here they were, traversing the area far west of the lands of earth and wind, currently in the land of demons, with Kakuzu, and a rather reluctant Hidan, training him to be as strong as he could be. Naruto wasn't sure what brought about the sudden about-face in Kakuzu's attitude towards his training, and the one time he'd mentioned it, not long after their departure from the hidden sound, the older man had remained tight-lipped. Knowing his mentor's personality, Naruto hadn't asked again, if the former Taki-nin didn't want to reveal anything, there was nothing the blonde could do to make him spill. So he had taken everything in stride, trusting in the fact that Kakuzu wouldn't steer them wrong. It was apt to say that Kakuzu definitely knew what he was doing. Unfortunately, the man's hands-on approach to training was brutal. There was time to rest and eat, because the necessities kept all shinobi aware and in peak condition, but most of the other remaining time was spent practicing. The things that the two Jinchuriki learned, though, Naruto almost couldn't believe how much information Kakuzu had at his disposal. Fu's reservoir of Doden techniques had increased to include every earth-related jutsu Kakuzu had learned in his 92 years of life. While her aptitude for pure wind manipulation had remained a bit lackluster, her collection of personal dust release techniques had expanded to compensate. Even more impressive was the self-taught manner in which she had learned the true version of Jintan, and had proceeded to begin integrating the atomizing power of the Nanabi into her dust jutsu. It was a taxing effort, given the amount of shape manipulation required for the actual Jintan, and removing that aspect while keeping the same overall effect and incorporating it into her modified dust techniques was apparently beyond difficult. Beyond that, Kakuzu had pushed her into drawing on the Bijou's chakra, little by little, until she could utilize the Nanabi's chakra cloak up to five tails, without asking for the beetle's assistance, or materialize two solid tails as wings to fly. According to Fu, the seven tails had been surprisingly helpful during the training, answering any questions she had about his chakra and what her limits were. Naruto wished the Kyubi was as amicable, but he had undergone his own intense training regimen even without the Bijou's assistance. Kakuzu had rescinded his idea to let Naruto learn the intricacies of Jeong on his own, instead tutoring the boy in how to bring out the Kinjutsu's full strength. His body had paid the price for such power, obtaining long sutures across his chest, back, and at intervals along his arms, but the benefits far outweighed the costs. Naruto could now access the long-armed form that Kakuzu admitted to defaulting to after losing two hearts, as well as the long-range form his mentor had died in, albeit on a smaller scale. On top of that, Kakuzu had told him how to extrude his hearts into masked creatures capable of autonomous destruction. That, Naruto thought, was perhaps the best part, especially since he'd finally claimed all five affinities at Kakuzu's behest. He'd grasped Raiden relatively easily, finding the element as easy to call upon as his Sutan in Jutsu, which was strange, he considered, given his body's natural inclination towards Futon, but learning Katan had been as big a struggle as Doden. Despite the difficulties, he'd become well-rounded in each of the nature manipulations with Kakuzu's guidance, and his Kinjutsu's autonomy meant that he could, 
say, call upon his fire heart to attack for him without worrying about collecting the chakra in his chest perfectly for exhalation into actual fire attacks. The bounty hunter had even given him some taijutsu lessons to complement the unique body structure granted to him by Jiang, but had made sure to emphasize that with his chakra capacity, ninjutsu was his ace in the hole to a fight, Naruto's interpretation, not Kakuzu's exact words. Of course, all of that had been the comparatively easy part. The true challenge had been using the new skills in practice. And Kakuzu was apparently under the belief that dangerous situations bred more impulse and creativity, as Naruto and Fu were forced to repeatedly spar against him and Hidan. Naruto wasn't exactly sure where his and Fu's skill levels were with respect to the worldwide listing of shinobi classes, but he did know that Kakuzu and Hidan fully deserved their labels of S-class. Hidan, rather surprisingly, had more moves than just swinging his scythe around in seemingly aimless patterns and screaming like a banshee, though using them didn't give him as much pleasure as the close combat method of fighting did. As for Kakuzu, well, his teacher was, quite simply, a beast. The revelation wasn't exactly a new one. Certainly, Naruto had been aware of Kakuzu's skills for years, the knowledge of what the mercenary was capable of always in the back of his mind. But knowing of it and living it every day for two years was a huge difference. Fighting with his teacher day in and day out, the blonde wasn't even sure how he had been killed by the Konoha Anbu, outnumbered or not, the man was just that ridiculously powerful. And he liked to prove it. Both thread users ran through seals, masks popping up on their shoulders with elemental techniques prepared. Katen, Zukoku. Sutan, Suijinheki. Kakuzu hummed thoughtfully as the attacks clashed and cancelled each other out. Your intuitiveness has improved. That almost sounded like a compliment, Naruto jested. Did I earn the right to learn it yet? Kakuzu's deadpan stare was his only response. The blonde gave an internal sigh of resigned acceptance. There were only two things Kakuzu had absolutely refused to teach him. One was the secret to creating and manipulating hardened water, which Naruto was okay with not learning given his original affinity for attacking with air. The other was the collection of ultimate techniques the former Taki Nin had created for each of the elemental chakra natures, Raten, John, Katen, Zukoku, Futan, Atsugai, and some water one that Naruto had never seen, but had been assured was equally as powerful. Doten, Domu, apparently, was a technique that had been recreated from an existing earth jutsu, and not something that Kakuzu kept closely guarded. When the blonde had originally asked about learning wind release, pressure damage, wind was still his go-to element of choice, Kakuzu had merely replied in the negative and stated that he would have to come up with his own ultimate techniques. He had been disappointed, but then excited at the prospect. Inspiration so far had been slim, but Naruto retained hope for the future. I admit that you have come a fair way, Kakuzu intoned, but considering where you started, such a feat is not as impressive as it sounds. Naruto stopped the scowl from spreading over his features. As Kakuzu had dedicated his time to teaching him, and as Naruto had grown both physically and mentally, the blonde had learned to choose his battles with the taller man with greater care. They still bantered back and forth, trading flat insults and deadpan reposts, the verbal sparring was practically a given with their relationship, but much of the anger and antagonism Naruto had heard in their past exchanges had dissipated. Kakuzu's put-downs, he noticed, carried far less venom than he had thought when he was younger. Ah, so you admit I've made improvements, quipped the teenager. He could practically imagine Kakuzu rolling his eyes in muted aggravation. If you consider yourself so improved, Kakuzu stated, then perhaps you should show me your skill with Jiang. The blonde couldn't repress the shudder that ran down his spine of its own accord. Every time he had tried utilizing the Kinjutsu's power against his teacher, whether by summoning the thread creatures or by using one of its forms, Kakuzu had proceeded to beat him down even more viciously than usual normally by using his control over the threads to do so. Naruto thought that it was perhaps the former Taki Nin's non-verbal method of communicating that even if the blonde had a new trick up his sleeve, Kakuzu was still the superior shinobi. Yeah, I think I'll pass, he commented, forming seals. Raten, Jaibashi. Kakuzu watched the incoming wave of electricity with his usual disinterest. Before he could decide how to counter the attack, Payne's voice sounded in his head. Kakuzu, Hidan, it is time to perform the sealing of the Sanbi and Yinbi. It will take six days total to do both. After the ceremony is over, you will return to your usual assignments. Understood, Kakuzu replied, relishing in Naruto's look of surprise as his wind heart returned from behind him and negated the lightning release, electromagnetic murder. Your beatdown will have to wait, brat, he directed towards his pupil. It seems that Hidan and I have been recalled to our duties. 
Naruto schooled his features and nodded, following Kakuzu as the old Nuknin went to track down his partner. As they trudged through the greenery of the Land of Demons, Naruto thought back to everything that he owed his mentor. Hey, he mentioned quietly, watching as the former Taki Nin's shoulders shifted to indicate he was listening, thanks, for doing all this. I know it's not really your style, but I really appreciate it. Kakuzu remained silent, not that Naruto had expected anything else. The man had never really been one for gratitude or other emotional platitudes, what he deemed to be sentimentality. So when they reached an open area where Hidan and Fu were dodging one another's attacks, Naruto was surprised to hear Kakuzu start talking. The world is a dangerous place. Most shinobi do not get to experience the hardships of old age, as they are often cut down either in or shortly past their prime. Jinchuriki are statistically less likely to reach such an age, given the apparent propensity for nations to use them as weapons in war. He paused, considered his words, then continued, it has been decided that you deserve the opportunity to break from that cycle, and as I am likely one of the oldest active shinobi in existence, if not to have ever existed, it would be remiss of me to not grant you every possible advantage. All you can do now, is endure. Endure until the time when you lack the fortitude to continue on. He glanced at the blonde boy. At that point, I would come kill you myself. I would expect you to have quite the bounty on your head. His piece said, Kakuzu turned his green eyes to settle on Hidan. Hidan, you heard leader, he addressed the Jashinist. It is time for us to depart from the children. TCH, and just when it was getting interesting, too. As Kakuzu and Hidan began to walk into a more sheltered area of the land of demons, the bounty hunter tossed one last tidbit of advice at his disciple. Naruto, always remain aware of your surroundings. And then the duo was gone. Fu walked up to him as Naruto mentally interpreted Kakuzu's parting words. Akatsuki is on the move again. Be prepared for any eventuality. You are still a target. Message received, Kakuzu, he thought. So, he said, turning to Fu, where do we go now? The green-haired girl didn't respond, instead keeping her gaze focused on the ground, a pensive expression decorating her features. Naruto quirked an eyebrow. Fu? She looked up at him, orange eyes filled with resolve. I think it's time we split up, she announced. Naruto blinked. What? We should go our own ways, she reiterated, voice growing more determined. Naruto got the distinct impression that she had given this idea much thought. Akatsuki's going to eventually come after us. It's better if we're separate so that capturing both of us is more difficult, and they won't be able to find out where the other is if they do get one of us. Naruto opened his mouth to object, to say that sticking together gave them a better chance for survival but then closed it when he realized nothing he could say was going to make a difference. Fu clearly wasn't going to back down. Fine, he agreed, we split up from here. A sudden idea springing forth, he reached into his pocket and grabbed the scroll used to contain corpses. Here, he said, tossing the object to his companion. Fu caught it with a questioning look. Don't you want this? The blonde's mouth broke into a wide grin. Oh, I'm not going to need that for what I'm going to do. You take it and continue to collect money, I have a different goal in mind. All right. When Fu continued to stare at him unsurely, Naruto raised an eyebrow again. Something else? I, she started, taking a measured step forward. The space between them was minimal, and Naruto found his bubble of personal space distinctly encroached upon. You saved me from a horrible life a long time ago. This isn't exactly the lap of luxury, you know. And I really appreciate that. I don't know what my life would be like if you hadn't come to Taki and rescued me, hell, I might have been killed by Akatsuki by now, and I just… She broke off, and Naruto opened his mouth to prompt her to continue, but she didn't give him the chance, closing the gap between them and kissing him soundly. Blue eyes widened in surprise at the unexpected contact. Before he could even really comprehend the situation, Fu disconnected their lips and took a step backwards. Naruto met her orange eyes wordlessly as the female Jinchuriki whispered, Thank you and then disappeared in a swirl of dust. LLL. Naruto would admit to being unbelievably confused. His best friend had kissed him not two days ago and then left to go off on her own adventure. For all he knew, he might never see Fu again. Given that he had never before encountered such a convoluted situation, his perturbation was rather unsurprising, even understandable. Now he at least had an explanation for some of the stranger expressions and actions that Fu had often graced him with. Not that he knew what to do with this new information. He was 16 now, and far more aware of the opposite gender than he had been two years ago. Given, 
that wasn't saying much since his lifestyle left little room for personal interaction with anyone, let alone females, but Fu had always remained a constant in his life. It would be a lie to say that he hadn't considered his fellow Jinchuriki attractive, but with the main focus of his attention on Kakuzu's training regimen, the blonde had merely written off such thoughts as fleeting fancies. That, apparently, had been a mistake. Fu possessed a certain appeal that Naruto found in treating. She was lithe and slender for her almost 17 years of age, with only an inch of height over Naruto's growing 5 feet 5 inches frame. Despite Kakuzu's comments on how she looked like a 12-year-old boy, Fu still retained an unknown quality that Naruto discerned as alluring. Perhaps it was the fact that there wasn't really room for romance on the road, and puberty had caused him to latch on to the nearest female form. Or maybe it was that Fu was a Jinchuriki who had experienced much of the life Naruto had while working with Kakuzu, and thus knew of the dangers associated with the road ahead of them. Plus, it was unlikely that many people would want to be romantically involved with a demon container when, Naruto refused to think if, he could finally settle down somewhere. There were too many similarities between his and Fu's personalities and past to not make them an ideal pairing. Of course, none of that actually meant that the blonde knew how to react to Fu kissing him. Especially since she hadn't really given him time to try discussing with her what the hell she was thinking. Women, he muttered, abandoning the slog-ridden marshes of the land of demons for the craggy wasteland of the land of earth. Why did they have to be so damn confusing? You will not be having progeny with her. Wonderful, Naruto thought irately. The QB was deciding to make his opinion known, like he needed a bigger headache. And why not? He asked, not even considering the implications of arguing against such a statement. I refuse to allow any vessel of mine to procreate with anyone tainted by that infernal butterfly. But if I was interested in a Jinchuriki tainted by any of the other bijou, you'd be okay with it? I will find a way to destroy you. Naruto smirked to himself. And the point goes to me. Besides, he mentioned, I'm 16. This is hardly the time to be considering, reproduction. The fox snorted. You humans are all the same. You partake in pleasures of the flesh and lose sight of everything else. One bat of her eyes and you'll have no other thoughts but of ravishing her. The teenager opened and closed his mouth wordlessly, trying to banish the images the QB's words had conjured in his mind. Just, shut up. Laughter echoed in his mind, the fox clearly finding amusement in one-upping his jailer. Your inadequacy regarding a concept such as intercourse is highly amusing. Naruto shook his head in an effort to ignore the bijou. There was no point dwelling on something that he couldn't do anything about right now anyway. Fu was off on a solo bounty hunting adventure, leaving him with a jumble of confused thoughts and emotions regarding her. And his own goal. Now that he was well trained in the ways of Jiang and capable of utilizing all the different elements, the blonde felt confident enough to start exacting his vengeance upon the hidden leaf. It was going to be fun. Naruto jumped behind a rocky outcropping as several figures became apparent in the distance. Soon enough, a group of eight Iwan Nin came to a stop not too far from his position. Which way? Asked one of them. Another one took a moment to close his eyes and focus on his surroundings. Naruto melded into the ground, as if such a method would help him from being sensed. Luckily, it seemed as if the group had a specific target in mind and the blonde found himself going unnoticed. Over there, the ninja stated after a moment. Let's move. Akatsuki already has a head start on us, and we can't let them take Roshi like they took Han. Iwagakur needs a Jinchuriki to match the might of the other hidden villages. Naruto rose from the earth, ears pricked as the squad of hidden rock shinobi moved out. Someone's gonna have some company real soon. A giant grin stretched across his face as a thought occurred to him. Oh, pain is so gonna owe me for this, he snickered. He bounded after the octet, extruding his earth heart and commanding the creature to go on ahead of him. The mass of threads immediately burrowed underground to cut off the shinobi per Naruto's instructions. Several minutes later, the blonde heard his quarry shouting in surprise as a massive stone wall rose in their path. Gentlemen, he announced, drawing their attention as he alit on a crag and used chakra to glue himself to the slanted surface, I'm sorry to inform you that your journey is for naught. He paused, cupping his chin thoughtfully. Actually, I stand corrected. A wicked gleam shone in his blue eyes. I'm not really all that sorry. It's just a kid, observed one of the shinobi. Hey, kid, if you don't leave now we'll be forced to take you out, another one informed him. Naruto stared at them blankly. Man, death threats just roll right off you idiots. He massaged his forehead with the fingers on one hand and shook his head sadly, muted chuckles escaping his lips. Great, now I sound like Kakuzu. Arrogance and insults all in one. Don't say we didn't warn you, kid. 
The man Naruto assumed to be captain addressed the rest of his squadron. Finish this quickly. Oh, I will, Naruto assured them. Jaws of earth erupted from the ground and clamped down on one of the shinobi while all attention remained on the teenager, Naruto's earth heart directing the soil from underneath the surface. When the remaining men turned at their comrade's scream, the Jinchuriki propelled himself forward in a burst of wind, the futon, senpukin swirling around his right arm. He slammed his fist into the leftmost ninja's abdomen, shredding organs and sending blood flying outward in a spray of red. You were saying? He mocked as the corpse of the second Iwa Nin hit the ground. Slabs of rock rose from the ground and attempted to crush him, but a quick kawarimi with some loose stone allowed him to avoid the assault. Naruto tutted disapprovingly at the remaining Iwa Nin. Well now, that won't do at all, he said. In moments, he was in Jiang's long-armed form, his lightning and fire mask situated in the spread of threads at his back. Much better, he hissed sadistically through the tongue of threads sprouting from his mouth. Soon, there was nothing left in the area but a bunch of corpses. Well, that was fun, he commented, allowing his body to come back together and the earth heart to return to its place on his back. He turned his head to face southeast. Time for the real trials to begin. With that, he took off in the direction of the land of fire. LLL. Hey Naruto. Gah. Surprised by the appearance of a small green chameleon on his shoulder, the teen was caught off guard as a massive purple projectile flew at him. Instinctively, he leaned backwards to avoid the object, but, combined with the shock of the reptile's sudden arrival, lost his footing in the liquid his feet were entrenched in and fell on his back. The reptile moved a bit higher on Naruto's shoulder to avoid getting ensnared by the fluid. You don't seem to be very good at this. Kameseta, spluttered the blonde, what are you, how are you? Ojisan wants to speak with you, the chameleon informed him. What, now? I'm a little busy here. Kameseta's eyes roved around the forested area. So I see. Then his right eye focused on Naruto's face. Hurry it up. Naruto resisted the urge to snatch the diminutive creature up and strangle him. He had been living in the forests of the Land of Fire for about a month, picking off any team of leaf shinobi that crossed his path. The bounties on their heads were irrelevant, though Kakuzu probably would have had a series of heart attacks if he knew that. Naruto was more focused on depleting the village's forces and punishing it for its citizens' scorn in the early years of his life. And the taste of vengeance was like honey. Unfortunately, his most recent targets were proving to be more, annoying, than the others he'd come across up to that point. Two of the four Chunin had gone down easily enough, but the remaining two worked well in tandem and had manipulated the terrain to their advantage. One of them, a brunette with long bangs covering his right eye, had spat some weird sutin in jutsu over Naruto's feet which possessed the viscosity of syrup and made moving highly inconvenient. His partner, a dark-haired male with a weird scar on his chin and a strip of bandage crossing from ear to ear over the bridge of his nose, had summoned a giant purple mace with the vague appearance of a conch shell. He had proven to be surprisingly adept at wielding the monstrosity, though it hadn't proven overly effective given Naruto's use of doden, domu. While he could have unleashed his full power from the get-go and just wasted everyone, he had developed the rather sadistic habit of toying with his victims and enjoyed watching them die one at a time. The idea that he was acquiring more and more of Kakuzu's quirks was something he accepted with much chagrin. Naruto lifted an arm out of the viscous fluid, grimacing in disgust as it thickened and held the limb in place. He suddenly regretted never getting a shirt to replace the one that had been ruined shortly after the training trip with Kakuzu and Hidan had begun. It had become pointless to wear one after learning how to extrude the hearts from his body, since the process would rend the garment to shreds, which explained Kakuzu's weird, backless top, but he felt highly exposed wearing only the standard ninja pants. The dark-haired shinobi leapt at him, mace in hand to smash it down on his unmoving body. Okay, no more screwing around. The long suture stretching from clavicle to side, a permanent reminder of his fight against the Autonin years ago, opened up, allowing a stream of black threads to burst forth and spear towards the Chunin. He brought his massive weapon forward to absorb the brunt of the attack, allowing the threads to crash harmlessly into the conch's reinforced shell. That was fine, though, all Naruto needed was a way to stop the man from getting too close so he could have a few seconds to work. A pulsing mass of threads appeared in the opening in his chest, forming a rough approximation of a mouth. Lightning surged forward as his relocated Raten heart unleashed a massive pillar of electricity. The attack rose high above the tree canopy, a brilliant flash of blue light. That's gonna attract attention. Kotetsu, shouted the other man as his comrade was consumed by the attack. When the technique faded away, a blackened corpse fell to into the viscous liquid at Naruto's feet. You, I'll kill you. Yeah yeah, 
thought the blonde, rolling his eyes, like I haven't heard that before. It was slightly unfortunate that he couldn't actually see what was happening as he was stuck, but he supposed it didn't really matter. In a matter of seconds, the lightning heart had replaced his wind heart as his body's primary one, allowing the latter to emerge from the hole in his chest as a roughly bird-shaped amalgamation of threads. The thread creature opened its approximation of a beak and expelled a rush of slicing wind that carved into the charging Konoha Nin. He collapsed to the ground, bloody gashes covering his entire body. As the threads returned to his body and his hearts resituated themselves, Naruto let out a brief huff. Well, that was tedious. He shifted his attention to Kameseta, who had remained silent throughout the battle. Now, what do you want? The chameleon released a noise of annoyance. I told you already, Ojisan wants to talk to you. Naruto raised an eyebrow. Why? Does it matter? retorted the reptile. He glared at his summon, releasing an annoyed sigh when it didn't seem to affect him. Yeah, well, I'm a bit stuck at the moment. Can you give me a minute to get out of here? Before the Anbu show up? He added mentally. Don't worry about it. Naruto was about to ask what the reptile meant when Kameseta stood on his hind legs and began forming what the blonde could only assume was hand signs. Before he could comment on the absurdity of the chameleon performing the signs, let alone trying to pull off a jutsu, he disappeared. When the Anbu showed up 20 minutes later, all they found was a pool of viscous liquid and the bodies of four of their chunin. Meanwhile, Naruto found himself in the midst of a myriad of trees, all varieties of types known to grow in the rainforest. However, instead of a dense canopy of green, the Jinchuriki was surprised to see that the foliage was a plethora of hues. In fact, the leaves seemed to be shifting colors, changing from red to orange to green to purple, and every shade in between. So mesmerized by the unusual sight, he almost missed Kameseta saying, this is the Bangkoku forest. Come on, Ojisan is this way. Yeah, right, he replied automatically. He was still too busy admiring his surroundings to pay more than a cursory glance to where the chameleon was directing him. Eventually, they arrived at a gigantic stone temple, shaded by equally large trees. Kameseta led Naruto inside as the blonde looked around the building, awestruck. A grating voice brought him from his thoughts. Welcome to our abode, Uzumaki Naruto. Hmm you seem to have come from some sort of bath. Naruto looked down at himself, grimacing at the goopy liquid stuck to and dripping off his body, as well as his half-naked appearance. Ah, my apologies, Shiramari-sama. I was, preoccupied when Kameseta found me. The chameleon boss chuckled. No apologies are necessary. The fault of the timing lies with me. Naruto inclined his head in a sign of humble acceptance. It was one thing to be rude to Kakuzu, who deserved Naruto's snide remarks and often seemed to thrive on the blonde's feistiness. It was quite another to be ungracious to a creature who could literally squash him like a bug, especially after how helpful his tribe had been on Naruto's journeys. If you say so, Shiramari sama May I ask why I've been summoned to your home? Yes, to business. Many decades ago, the Kubasaki clan ruled the land of Nek by way of its contract with my family. Because of the closeness between the Kubasaki clan and the chameleons, every new leader was summoned to the Bangkoku forest to learn some of the secrets of our tribe. I have decided that it is time to extend you, our new summoner, the same opportunity. Are you interested in learning the techniques of the chameleons, Uzumaki Naruto? The blonde merely grinned in response. LLL. Donzo slammed his fist on his desk in frustration. He had lost count of how many reports had been delivered to him with the same general message. Another team of Konoha Nin had been found within the borders of the Land of Fire, dead. The deaths of Shinobi were not exactly uncommon occurrences, but it was strange to have so many of them occur while in friendly territory and not during wartime. Most of the teams were squadrons of Chunin or the occasional Jonin led teams of Jinan, but one or two times he had lost a well trained group of Tokubutsu Jonin or higher level ninja sent out on solo missions. Danzo didn't really mourn the loss of those people, Shinobi were tools to serve their leader after all, but it was getting rather aggravating to have to act more cautious with his mission assignments. As there was no real pattern to the attacks with regards to direction, he couldn't determine if the situation was caused by one of the other nations trying to create a weak point in Konoha's defenses, or someone else's personal vendetta. Lack of follow-up attacks on Konoha directly and reports from Tenzo suggested the latter. The loss of the score of Anbu he had dispatched two and a half years ago had been documented in a letter by Tenzo, who had stumbled upon the scene after getting a fix on the Kyubi's chakra. Though he couldn't say for certain whether or not the Jinchuriki had been responsible for the carnage, the wood user had claimed that many of the corpses littered about the area bore signs of being torn asunder by animalistic claws. 
the fact that the blonde boy could eliminate an entire platoon of Anbu, one containing Hitake Kakashi, who was a well-known and feared figure throughout the shinobi world, was worrisome, and seemed unlikely unless one took into account his tapping into the Kyuubi's power, something Tenzo could confirm. If Tenzo was a regular Anbu, Danzo would have been concerned about the likelihood of him capturing the Kyuubi Jinchuriki. However, Danzo was counting on the wood user's ability to nullify the Bijou's chakra once activated, which would exhaust the Jinchuriki in the process and make him susceptible to acquisition. Of course, that required Tenzo to actually find the boy, and while he had traced multiple uprisings of demonic chakra over the time succeeding the Anbu massacre, every clue ended in a dead end. It spoke of quite a high skill in the prey's tracking and evading abilities to so continuously elude the Anbu member. Assuming the Jinchuriki's involvement in the killings of the Leaf Shinobi, it also offered an explanation as to why so many of the more recent attacks seemed to occur without any of the Konoha Nin aware of being assaulted until it was too late. It was almost as if the attacker was using an impressive cloaking technique, like Meisai Gakur no Jutsu, only close to a level that hadn't been seen since the days of the second Tsuchikage. Danzo scowled at that thought. If the Kyuubi Jinchuriki was truly behind these recent attacks, then his skills were beyond what even Tenzo had informed him of from their limited confrontations. That was problematic, and left the Hokage with very little options. He could either wait for the boy to screw up in some measure, or... Ome, Danzo uttered, and an adolescent male with long, dark hair and a bird's mask appeared before him, one fist to the ground and head bowed in respect. There is a shinobi or group of shinobi targeting Konoha Nin. Find them, and if possible, bring them here. Otherwise, dispose of them. As you command, Danzo-sama, said the shinobi, and then he was gone. Danzo smirked slightly. It probably wasn't advisable to send a single shinobi out on a mission to incapacitate someone who was likely to target him, but that was the genius of sending Ome. Whatever evasive abilities the shinobi killing his tools was using wouldn't work against his root member. Jinchuriki or not, Ome would disable the leaf's enemy before said person knew what had happened to him. LLL. Naruto couldn't resist the excited grin that spread across his face at the sound of somebody rushing through the woods. He was crouched at the juncture between a tree's low-hanging bough and trunk, cloaked in Meisai Gakur no Jutsu. Things were just way too easy now. His training with the chameleons had gone well enough. Most of their techniques held a basis in their ability to change forms at will, such as Shiromari's long-term tenure as the Kubasaki Castle. They were also very adept with Genjutsu and other illusion-related tricks, such as their infamous ability to camouflage seamlessly into their surroundings. As a less-than-proficient Genjutsu caster, Naruto held very little interest in any of the techniques related to that field his summons were willing to teach him. He had informed them of such in as polite a manner as possible, which had elicited a rumbling laugh from the chameleon boss. They had bypassed any of the illusionary and transformation jutsu and gone straight to the other traits the chameleons were well known for, elongating the tongue, focusing the eyes on two separate points. But the trick to learning camouflage had definitely been the most useful, and despite its partial basis in Genjutsu, Naruto had insisted on learning it. Meisai Gakur no Jutsu normally involved using chakra to alter how light was reflected around the body, simultaneously erasing the user's scent and shadow to further make him even harder to detect. However, the chameleon's version of the hiding with camouflage technique was rather different. It required the user to shroud himself in natural energy, something Naruto had never even heard of before, in order to blend seamlessly with his environment. The technique retained all the positives of the original jutsu with the added benefit of being even more difficult to detect because the chakra being used to cloak the individual didn't actually belong to the user and match the environment the user was hiding in. The ease with which it had allowed him to sneak up on unsuspecting Konoha Nin and kill them without them being any the wiser was absolutely ridiculous. A Konoha Nin wearing an Anbu mask and a cream-colored cloak landed on the ground almost directly beneath Naruto. By the way the shinobi moved, the Jinchuriki guessed his adversary to be male. The blonde flexed his fingers in anticipation as the man beneath him twisted his head to observe his surroundings. Jiung squirmed beneath his skin, itching for the opportunity to wriggle into a body and pierce, strangle, rip, until there was nothing left but a corpse. Naruto leapt from the tree, silent as a wraith, and descended upon the unknowing man. Ten feet away, the Anbu whipped around, palm thrusting out. Something invisible slammed into Naruto with deadly precision, immediately stopping his heart and causing him to fall to the ground in a boneless heap, the hiding with camouflage technique fading. As Naruto's body assimilated his earth heart, his mind whirled with disbelief at how he had been found out. Haki Kusho, intoned a voice, and Naruto instinctively hardened his skin to protect himself as another invisible force blew his body backwards. 
You might as well get up, continued the Anbu, I can see that your chakra system is still active. Naruto rose to his feet, brushing a hand through his blonde locks to dislodge any dirt. Can you now? Quite an interesting trick. Considering that and your hacky technique, you must be a Hyuga. He flexed his hands. Haven't gotten into a fight with one of your kind for some time. I'm not sure how you survived that strike to your heart, but rest assured it won't happen again. He raced forward, palm extended in a gentle fist strike for Naruto's heart. The renegade twisted around the blow, unleashing a flurry of threads to bind the Konoha Nin and reap his heart. Just as the tendrils wound about the Anbu's body, he became aglow in a shroud of chakra. Jukenpo Ishigekishin, he stated, and the Kinjutsu was forcibly repelled from its target. The Anbu member jumped away from Naruto, and for a moment there was silence until he hissed, it is you. Naruto raised an eyebrow. Me? I suspected. Whatever had caused the Anbu's break in control was lost in the next instant, his voice returned to its flat tone. Donzo Sama desires you captured alive, but if you resist, your body will be enough compensation. I feel like I'm missing something, Naruto pondered, tapping a finger to his chin thoughtfully. You seem to know me, why don't you reciprocate by removing the mask? The Anbu dove forward with another series of gentle fist maneuvers, though he seemed a bit more hostile with his attacks this time, forcing the blonde to practically dance to avoid the strikes. I'll take that as a no. Performing a quick kawarimi, he watched from a tree branch as the Hyuga's palm thrust demolished the replacement log into splinters. You seem angry, he observed. The Anbu tilted his head up and sent two more chakra-laced, compressed air bullets at him. Most unbefitting of an Anbu, he noted, swinging down to dodge the attacks. Curiosity killed the cat, he thought, hands moving through seals, but I've really gotta know. Sutan, Haran Banshu, he announced, water falling from the sky in a torrential downpour. The Hyuga immediately spun himself into a chitin to repel the deluge, and Naruto used the excess liquid to form several water clones to surround his enemy. They lunged for the Anbu as he came out of his rotation, and Naruto snaked his arms into the battle as the Hyuga dealt with the doppelgangers. Despite the Byakugan's near 360-degree vision, the Hyuga couldn't do anything about the hands reaching for his mask without letting his guard down to the clones. Several palm strikes dispersed the water clones, leaving Naruto to face the full brunt of the Anbu's glowering white eyes settling on him. Hyuga Neji, he realized, recognizing the features of his long-ago Chunin exam opponent. Then he laughed. You're an Anbu now? I guess you became worth something after all. I suspected it was you. Your chakra system is still clouded with those threads, Shinobu of Amiga Kur, or not, Neji noted, eyes flickering to the slashed hidden leaf hideate on Naruto's forehead. Mock me as you will, he informed the blonde before settling into an advanced gentle fist stance, but you're within my field of divination. Naruto didn't even have time to curse before Neji was upon him. Haki Hayaku Nayuhachi SHO. The first several blows landed before Naruto regained some semblance of awareness and had the capacity to order Jung to counterattack. When Neji's fingers lanced forward for the next series of strikes, threads burst forth from the suture on Naruto's chest and wrapped around the Hyuga's wrists before they could connect. I'm sure you remember these, he smirked. With a quick motion, the tendrils snapped the Konoha Nin's joints, rendering his prized taijutsu style useless. Neji showed remarkable restraint for having his wrists broken, merely hissing in pain. His body began to glow with chakra again for another gentle fist art one blow body, but the mask containing Naruto's lightning heart appeared on his shoulder and fired a burst of electricity which paralyzed the other male. I believe that's two times you've lost to me now, Naruto mentioned blithely. The Hyuga didn't respond. Naruto hummed thoughtfully. Your emotional control has gone up since we last met. Not that it matters all that much. Now, I believe you owe me a heart. Whatever you hope to gain by continuing this crusade against Konoha will not come to fruition, Neji stated, venom lacing his tone. The blonde merely laughed in response. You're a fool. My goals stretch no further than killing the people of your village, which is exactly what I've been doing. There is no deeper purpose. Now, go meet the rest of your comrades. More threads squirmed forth from his chest and dug into Neji's, causing the Hyuga's pale eyes to widen. Moments later, the tendrils withdrew, their pumping prize clutched in their grasp. Much better, he sighed, depositing the heart in his chest, though I probably enjoyed that far more than I should have. Kakuzu has definitely rubbed off on me. His attention was drawn to the Konoha Nin's corpse as the seal on his forehead glowed green and his eyes were burned from their sockets. Ah, so that's how the seal activates, interesting. He lugged the body upon his shoulder and began walking to the nearest bounty exchange station. Well, Hyuga Neji, 
let's see how much you're really worth. LLL. Name? Uzumaki Naruto. Hair color? Bright yellow. Eye color? Blue. Other distinguishing features? Three whisker-like markings on either cheek. Former village affiliation? Kanahagakur. Age? 16. Bounty? 70 million. The man looked up at the large amount and raised an eyebrow, but didn't comment on the price. Does the shinobi have a keke genkai or known kinjutsu? No. Another raised eyebrow, but the man scribbled down the response. He will be listed as an A-rank nukenin. Is there any other information you can add? He is adept at futon ninjutsu. And? Prompted the man when the other person didn't continue. That is all the information I have. Do you have a picture? The person shook his head. Very well, nodded the man. We will list Uzumaki Naruto in the next edition of the bingo book. Thank you for your report. The Konoha Nin nodded and left. When he was far enough away from the building, the hinge around him dropped. Kakuzu smirked behind his mask. Naruto would raise hell the minute he discovered what the older shinobi had done, but he would eventually come to appreciate the favor Kakuzu had done him. By being listed in the bingo book with such a high bounty and such rudimentary skills, he would quickly become the target of both other mercenaries and the hidden villages alike. Given that the former Taki Nin had neglected to give the editors information about Jeong, Naruto's Jinchuriki status, or the fact that he could freely control all of the elements, Naruto would quickly start accumulating the bounties of people chasing him instead of the other way around. Really, it was quite a time-saving and profitable deed he had just done his pupil. And if Kakuzu got some twisted satisfaction out of pissing the blonde off, well, that was just a bonus. LLL. Naruto narrowly dodged a burst of fire and then activated the earth spear technique, bringing his arm up to block a sideways swipe of a Kumo Nin sword. Something was wrong. Naruto couldn't decide exactly what that something was, but some sixth sense was telling him that the natural order of the world had been violated. Granted, the fact that he was being attacked by a group of shinobi wasn't all that unusual, considering his profession. But it was strange that the group of cloud shinobi had initiated the assault. Especially since he was in the land of grass. This has Kakuzu's fingerprints all over it. I don't know how, but every time something bad happens to me, it's normally because of Kakuzu. He hardened his body again as the first Kumo Nin exhaled another burst of fire at him. The blonde almost smirked as the flames died out, but a gasp escaped his lips instead as a katana crackling with lightning was shoved from behind into his heart. The dossier said that you were only proficient in futon, but that hardening technique of yours definitely has its roots in Doden, whispered a voice in his ear. When he fell face down to the ground, the sword came free with a shick, and its wielder stated aloud, We've disposed of the nuke in Uzumaki Naruto. Our mission is complete. Not quite, Naruto thought, burrowing his hands underground via Jeong. He had been killed enough times over the past several months to know that falling with his hands under his body allowed him to take his enemies by surprise. When the swordsman knelt to pick him up, Naruto acted. Both hands erupted from the ground in different spots, catching two of the Kumo Nin with uppercuts to the chin. As they were sent flying, the fists opened to grab them each by an ankle. The threads connected to each appendage immediately retracted, bringing both shinobi hurtling towards the earth at an impressive speed. Their heads struck the ground, and then they were motionless. Man, that never gets old, the blonde snickered. The swordsman, who had turned to his men at the sound of Naruto's fists coming out of the earth, immediately whirled back to the younger male. Too late. The Jinchuriki crowed mentally. His wind heart burst forth from beneath the traveler's cloak he wore to conceal the masks on his back and fired a bullet of air that punched a hole in the Kumo Nin's chest before he could react. And now for number four, he thought, rising to his feet and recalling the threads. Just as he finished standing, a series of bluish-white beams slammed into his chest. He was pushed back a fair distance, the cloak he'd taken to wearing gaining several holes as the beam scorched through it and burned his skin. That's, new, he remarked. Naruto looked up at the remaining Kumo Nin, finding both of the man's hands clasped together, a halo of the same bluish-white light surrounding them. An attack that retains some of the piercing abilities of Raiden, but flows like the water of a Sutan technique. I wonder. Kakuzu had lectured him on the different Keke Genkai in the ninja world. The lessons had also included a rundown of some of the advanced chakra natures the bounty hunter had come across in his travels. The rarity of such abilities was one of the reasons Tenzo's possession of the should-be-extinct Makutan techniques had taken Naruto completely by surprise. Barring Tenzo, and potentially Fu, the blue-eyed boy had never really come across any of the other advanced chakra natures. 
but that strange beam attack definitely seemed to fit Kakuzu's vague description of Kumagakura's rare storm release. Another armada of beams began homing in on his position, forcing the renegade to manipulate the air before him into a dense shield. His blue eyes widened as the attack simply bent around the barrier and converged on his location. Naruto took the attack and came out with a severely tattered cloak and several more burns for his trouble. Fortunately, while the attack seemed to be quite versatile, it lacked a lot of the raw destructive power of the lightning release element that composed it. He raced forward, forcing the cloud shinobi to release the seal for his technique and bring forth a katana crackling with lightning. That was fine with Naruto, who immediately held out his right hand and allowed Jung to twine itself into its sword form, glowing blue with wind chakra. Steel met the makeshift black blade, causing the Kumo Nin to grimace as the wind chakra began to bite into his weapon, negating the electricity running along the blade. He reached out with his other hand to shock the blonde into submission, but Naruto met that with a modified whirlwind fist. Ah ah ah, Naruto tutted mockingly, I'm a wind specialist, remember? Now, would you like to tell me why you attacked me? When the man didn't respond, Naruto sighed theatrically. Well, how about that strange ninjutsu you used, what's your secret to that one? Again, the blonde was greeted with silence. Ah well, he continued, guess I'll just have to find out for myself. Threads tore through the front of his cloak and dove into his opponent's body, wriggling under the skin and aiming for his heart. Naruto relished in the brief moment of shock on the man's face before the tendrils resurfaced with his heart in their grasp. They returned to the blonde's body, displacing his wind heart to his back and depositing the new one within his ribcage. The spasm of pain that accompanied acquiring a new element shuddered throughout his body, causing Naruto to simultaneously grimace and grin. He felt for the elements the organ was aligned with, feeling the soothing calm of Sutan and the fierce prickle of Raiden. My thanks to you, he addressed the body of the Kumo Nin, releasing it and letting it fall to the ground. He flexed his hands, trying to summon some modicum of Kumagakura's rant and bloodline, with no effect. Ha, huh, this might be trickier than I thought. Then he shrugged. Oh well, plenty of time to learn. Now let's see. He knelt down next to the Kumo Nin's corpse and rooted through his belongings, but found nothing of interest. Hmm, maybe your leader then? He mused. Naruto dragged the body over to the one who had stabbed him, the wielder of the storm release ability might be worth something at a bounty station, even if Naruto had his heart, and searched his person. He discovered a mission scroll and immediately unraveled it, a frown etching his features as he read it. Find and kill Uzumaki Naruto and claim the bounty on his head. Bounty? Then he growled. Kakuzu. I know it's him. Damn him. What did he do, put me in the bingo book? He took a deep breath. Calm down, he probably knew I'd react like this, which is exactly why he did it. I just need to stay on my guard, figure out a plan, he looked down at his cloak, get some new clothes, yeah, let's start there, Naruto sighed, hefted the body of the Rantan user on his back, and began walking. Ten seconds later. Kakuzu, you stupid bastard. I'll kill you for this. Alright guys, that's it for the video. If you enjoyed it, please feel free to leave a like and subscribe. As always, the rest of the story is already out over on Patreon, link to that will be in the description. Anyways, until next time, peace.